Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Lyric Jorgensen. I'm the Deputy Director in the Office of Science Policy here at NIH. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to mention a few logistics for the day. One, as a reminder, this workshop is being um, webcast to the public and will be available for archive at a later date. So please use your microphones when you're speaking so that everyone um, in the broader public can hear your comments. For the general flow of the day, we'll ask each panelist to present at the microphone, and after everyone is done presenting for that session, we will ask all of you to go up to the front panel for the panel discussion. For the panel discussion, everyone at the table is welcome to participate and encouraged to contribute their perspective. That being said, I will turn it over to um, Francis Collins, a.k.a. Kathy Hudson, the Deputy Director for Science Outreach and Policy here at NIH. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for coming. I am not Frances Collins. I am um, Kathy Hudson. Frances, unfortunately, has a herniated disc and uh, is at home in uh, considerable pain looking for somebody to uh, uh, help him out. Uh, so if you have if any surgeons in the room, we might need you to go over to his house. Um, so I'm uh, pitch hitting for him this morning. I want to welcome you all for coming here today and sharing your expertise and uh, experience and perspectives on these important issues. Today, uh, the purpose of today's meeting is to explore the science in two areas of research involving um, introducing human cells into animals early in development. And we're going to talk about uh, the scientific possibilities there and also how to move forward in this area responsibly. Research using human models has been unbelievably productive in uh, basic research and understanding early development. I was a Drosophila developmental geneticist um, back in the day. Um, we have used animal models in more applied research to develop and test new interventions, and certainly uh, research in the area that we're talking about today uh, may also be more directly relevant to humans in uh, directly benefiting people and ameliorating uh, disease. So today we're going to explore the state of the science uh, in which researchers are inter in interested in introducing uh, human cells early in embryonic development. Um, these experimental designs do raise important questions about where those cells will go and what they will do, and uh, we will have an extensive time today to talk about those possibilities. Um, the areas that we're talking about today have been examined by other groups. I was reminded in um, getting ready for today that I was on a uh, group that George chaired back, I think, in 2006 of the International Society for Stem Cell Research and their task force that put forth uh, important guidelines for the conduct of research with stem cells. Certainly the national academies have uh, put forward important policies. And then here at the NIH, we have had policies governing uh, uh, our funding for research involving uh, human embry embryonic and uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. So uh, what we have today are a group of people who have thought very deeply about these issues. And I know that some of you are impatient to move forward in this important area of science, uh, and I share your impatience. Um, but we also have to appreciate that we are the stewards of public resources and that the public really looks to us to move forward in science in ways that have been carefully considered in terms of maximizing the benefit and minimizing uh, the, the risks of uh, potentially uh, un unexpected and unhelpful outcomes. So we have a long history, actually, of, of very carefully considering new areas of science and moving forward in careful ways. We've done that in the early days with recombinant DNA. And in fact, it's our responsibility not only to put in place policies to govern new areas of emerging science, but also to revisit those areas from time to time. So uh, under Dr. Jorgensen's and Dr. Wollinett's leadership, we're now seriously reevaluating how we consider recombinant DNA uh, research and whether or not the policies that were put place now decades ago are still appropriate. Similarly, in human subjects research, policies were put in place in the 1970s, and it's time for us to reconsider those, and a draft policy has been published, and, and people are now providing comments on that. So in a whole array of areas, we have um, developed, I think, what are appropriate and thoughtful <laughs> approaches for being able to both advance the science, but do so in a way that uh, represents our good stewardship of public resources and allows us to be responsible uh, to the Congress and to the American public. And so I think what we want to be able to do today is, is uh, really be a model of that kind of 
um, of uh, uh, circumstance in which we can come out of today with some really good input that will help us in making decisions about this area of science. So um, with that, I think I'm going to introduce uh, George Daly, who really needs no introduction. Uh, George is the Samuel E. Lux Professor of Hematology and the Director of the Stem Cell Transplantation Program at Boston Children's Hospital, uh, and he has been a leader in uh, the area of stem cell research and stem cell biology, and we're really great, uh, grateful that he's here today to kick us off and provide an overview uh, of this area. So welcome, George, and thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, it's great to work with Ellen and her group to uh, help design the speakers and the, the agenda for today. It's obviously really essential, I think, uh, to echo Kathy's comments. Um, I think that Dr. Collins has tried to approach this new area with caution and prudence, given his responsibility for stewardship of federal funds. and. There is the prospect of significant public misconception about the nature of the work that will be described today. And the best support and the best defense uh, against those concerns is really to emphasize the remarkable science uh, in order to justify the nature of the work. And I think that's what we're really going to see today. And I'm here to sort of start by presenting some of that context. Much of what we'll be discussing will focus on the notion of chimeras. And I'll be describing what chimeras are and how they're used, but it's been a particular focus in the area of stem cell biology, in part because new types of stem cells require new experimental approaches for their characterization, and stem cells offer the prospects for new therapies, and yet we're limited in our ability to model those therapies unless we can create mixtures of human cells in various animal models. So I'll be describing what are chimeras and why they're important. I'll talk very briefly about what distinguishes chimerism of a, of a general sense from interspecies transplantation, which may raise uh, less thorny issues. I'm going to speak about what aspects of chimerism studies warrant special ethical review and oversight, which will be the focus of this afternoon's session. And I'll leave with some general comments about how we plan to address these issues today. Now, the notion of a chimera goes back to Greek mythology, this fire-breathing creature that was composed of parts of, a, of more than one animal, a lion, a, a goat, and a snake. It was originally described in Homer's Iliad. And uh, this is a bit of a, uh, a, a call out to our British colleagues. Uh, but essentially, a chimera is a single organism composed of genetically distinct cells. Now, genetic distinctions come in many flavors, but in the context of mammals, typically we're talking about the admixture of cells that derive from two independent zygotes, two or more, which means the cells have a different set of chromosomes and typically reflect an organism that derives from tetragametic parentage, parentage from four sets of gametes, and I'll speak more about that. Now, I won't speak to the more refined aspects of chimerism that can arrive in part through parthenogenetic contributions or androgenetic contributions, but the expertise is here in the room if we want to delve deeper into those issues. Now, I want to contrast chimeras with mosaics. Mosaics typically represent organisms that involve genetically distinct cells, but typically from a single zygote where the genetic diversity evolves from the zygotic stage, perhaps through subsequent mutation or through differential chromosome silencing, as in X inactivation. And I want to contrast this with hybrid organisms, where these are composed of genetically identical cells, but which arise from the crossing of two distinct species. Think of a, monkey, a, a donkey and a horse making a mule. Now, there, we also talk about chimerism in the context of transplantation, either human to human or, in the experimental setting, human into various animals. I direct our bone marrow transplant service. We create chimeras on a daily basis where we're taking marrow from one individual and we're transplanting it into another such that in grafts and can provide a curative treatment for things like leukemia and genetic disease but it can also change the blood type of an individual. 
So we have some of our patients, male patients, running around with female blood and vice versa. Organ transplants are another kind of chimera, but not the same type of chimera with a direct a complex admixture of cells, but rather a mixture that remains in, 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 encased in an organ. Then there are examples of microchimerism, fetal maternal microchimerism. Indeed, in the circulation of, of every pregnant woman is some small contribution of cells from the fetus, which can be uh, harvested and, and used in some instances uh, to analyze uh, fetal genetic states. Uh, there is blood transfusion, a common source of, of chimerism, which typically is transient but can sometimes be fairly long-lived. And we are appreciating more and more with the increasing use of genetic analysis the notion of twin-twin chimerism, twin-twin transfusion, dizygotic twins coexisting in the uterus, and the anastomoses of the vessels can lead to the sharing and admixture of hematopoietic stem cells first described in the British Medical Journal in the 1950s, but now coming to light as we do more and more uh, tissue analysis for transplantation. This is a fascinating story that happened a little over a decade ago uh, at one of the Boston hospitals. A woman was being typed, or family members were being typed, to find an optimal kidney donor. And they came back to this patient and they said, we have bad news. There's no one in your family who's a good match, but in addition, those two sons that you have are not your own, which created this question of disputed maternity. Now, in transplant testing, we detect disputed paternity fairly frequently, but disputed maternity is distinctly unusual. Usually, the mother remembers the nine months and the labor and, and all of that. So obviously, it, it uh, it compelled further genetic analysis. And it turned out the, the HLA types in her blood were distinct from the HLA types in her skin. And in fact, she was one individual who was the embryonic admixture of two different conceptive events. Two different sperm fertilizing two different eggs creating a fused zygote, an individual who was a chimer of two cell types the blood deriving from one HLA type and her eggs from another, leading to the notion that her children were actually derived from her, her, um, her sibling. Now, this creates much confusion, and, it, and it, it raises really fundamental and curious questions about the nature of an individual. And we're starting to get more and more information of this sort, and there are some estimates that this phenomenon may happen at a low level in as many as one in eight individuals. So the notion of chimerism is something that is part of the human species. Now, experimental chimerism has a very time-honored tradition, and I would go back to the early 60s with the work of Tarkowski and Mintz who created some of the first chimeras between different mice by fusing early embryos, creating a, a juxtaposition of two uh, eight-cell embryos, which would admix into a single blastocyst. Then there was chimerism introduced uh, experimentally by Brinster and Gardner and, and Janet Rawson, who's here, where one could mix specific cells taken from specific stages of the mouse embryo and inject them into a developing mouse embryo. And as long as there were distinctions between the donor and the host, one could actually follow the fates of these cells. And these became extremely important in the experimental biology of, of embryo. So just to show how this is used to trace the fates of the cells in the early blastocyst, the, the early blastocyst where one can derive both embryonic stem cells, which are taken from the inner cell mass and faded become the embryo proper, and the trophectodermal stem cells. One can label these with markers like GFP, here pseudo-colored, and inject it into a recipient non-GFP positive embryo. And what one can see is that the embryonic stem cells 
commingle with the inner cell mass and chimerize there, but not the surrounding trophectodermal rind. The opposite is seen if one injects the trophectodermal stem cells. They're excluded from the inner cell mass, and here they're chimerizing the polar trophectoderm. If these chimerized mouse embryos are allowed to develop further, and I'm sorry that this isn't projecting very well, but um, this is the chimerism that is unique to the embryo and exclusive of the placenta, which is the characteristic of embryonic stem cells, whereas just the opposite is seen with trophectodermal stem cells, which chimerize the placenta but not the embryo proper. Now, if one then leaves these to come to term, one has these classic experimental chimeras where we see the contribution of donor cells in the coat color of the recipient mouse, and we make the presumption that this admixture of cells is happening in all of the organisms, including the germline. And these types of experiments have been essential, as we'll hear in a, in a growing number of ways, to assess the effects of specific gene modifications on the fates of particular cells. So we will hear about the fact that if you delete PDX1 from an embryo, you end up with an apancreatic organism. And one can then chimerize that deficient embryo with wild-type cells and generate in the recipient a pancreas, which is derived entirely from the donor cells. We'll hear how that's being considered for further use. The same can be done if one chimerizes with defects that might affect extraembryonic, trophectodermal, or placental development. So one can use this experimental tool to ask fundamental questions about the relationship between genes and tissues, uh, either of the embryo or of the extraembryonic fates. And then, of course, this is the standard assay for defining the nature of developmental potency from stem cells, with embryonic stem cells having this phenomenon of pluripotency, being able to generate and contribute to all of the tissues of the developing embryo. Now, as more and more analysis of distinct stages of human stem cells has come to the fore in science, we're challenged with assays for defining the potency of human cells. And that has created some interest in creating some of these admixtures of human stem cells and animal embryos, which we'll hear about also further today. So if one allows these chimeric animals to breed, you can actually transfer the derivatives of these embryonic or pluripotent stem cells through the germ lineage. Now, in other species, the admixture of uh, uh, distinct species allows one to trace cell fates, again, in a very productive way. The classical work of the French embryologist Nicole Ledouin, creating chimeras between the quail here in blue, cutting out parts of the developing neural tube and grafting them into the chick host. And these kinds of experiments can actually show a distinction between the input quail cells, which have a very distinct uh, nuclear structure, allowing for the tracing of the lineages in the developing uh, in the developing organism. And these have led to essential insights into the developmental origins of the neural crest and the blood. Another area which I think has been essential for advancing biomedicine uh, is the creation of humanized mice. More recently, there's been the, uh, the, the use of fetal material, fetal human material, fragments of liver, fragments of thymus, and the developing hematopoietic system grown within an immune deficient mouse such that you create a humanized immune system and a very, very important model for HIV vaccine studies, blood development, and leukemia. I would argue that humanized mice have been absolutely essential for cancer research. The ability to take primary <coughs> cancer material from a patient and graft it and propagate it in a mouse, allowing for, in a sense, experimental therapeutic trials of new chemotherapeutic agents, now in the animal host, establishing efficacy 
uh, giving reassurance of safety before going back into patient populations. You'll hear further about this strategy of complementing particular organ developmental defects by chimerism, such that inputting certain types of pluripotent stem cells from the human in a defective animal host could lead to the substitution of entire organs in the animal with a humanized context that could then potentially be used for transplantation. Now this, of course, has raised some of the more concerning issues, but we have been mixing animal and human parts for many decades, and indeed, there are many thousands of patients who have benefited from porcine heart valves. But of course, the problem is, if one simply Googles something like human pig chimera, which I did last night, you get very, very unflattering depictions of the nature of this science. So the only defense against this is to speak strongly for the scientific validity and justification of the work that is being done, to educate and distribute the sense of how impactful this work can be for human health. We will hear then this afternoon, we'll move away from studies of chimerism of, of early animal embryos to the notion of chimerizing the central nervous system in experimental uh, animals. Here I'm just going back to an effort in 1998 which produced very significant degrees of CNS chimerism. The abstract spelled out the scientific justification. There's limited experimental access to the central nervous system. And it's a key problem in the study of human neural development. And they've addressed this problem here by generating neural chimeras composed of human and rodent cells. Now, of course, what happens then in the press is some of these chimeras then are touted as having almost human-like potential, enhanced cognition. And these are concerns that must be addressed with scientific justification. So the issues for us to consider today are which of the experiments actually raise concerns. Now, incorporating human pluripotent cells into the earliest stages of mammalian embryos, these are the ones that tend to raise the most concerns because of the remarkable degree of integration that may be possible. And then the specific lineages that we pay particular attention to are chimerizing the germ lineage and the brain. The idea of bringing together human gametes in vitro or in the context of animals raises very considerable concerns. And then the notion of changing the cognition and behavior of the subject animals again. So chimerizing early embryos are more concerning than chimerizing adults. Chimerizing with highly plastic, versatile, pluripotent stem cells are more concerning than chimerizing with differentiated cells. Chimerizing closely related non-human primates yet again raise more concerns than chimerizing rodents. Now mitigating against this concern, and I hope will be a subject of active discussion today, is what is the biological plausibility with which a human cell would fundamentally change the nature of the animal host. What we'll hear is that there are many contexts where there isn't a significant degree of biological plausibility that would raise concern. But the problem with that is, if we're protected by the arguments of biological implausibility, then we're challenged to describe how informative those experiments will actually be. We need to figure out the right balance of an experiment which gives us important biological information. So just a quick uh, overview of, of where the International Society for Stem Cell Research has come down on this. You'll hear more about this from Jonathan Kimmelman. Indeed, this fundamental issue was recognized and there were uh, calls for oversight in the guidelines from 2006 in order to provide specific attention to this issue of human to animal chimeras the Ethics and Public Policy Committee wrote this article now in 2007, really calling for the fact that the work had to be justified for scientific merit and subject to independent peer review, and that chimera research should be subject to the general animal welfare principle. We'll hear more about that this afternoon. This coincides quite directly with recommendations from the National Academy of Sciences, which were updated with 2010 amendments 
although the National Academy of Sciences made quite clear that the specific experiments where, let's say, human pluripotent cells were mixed with non-human mammalian blastocysts, these really had to be considered as a resort of, uh, of, of last concern, if you will, uh, only in the cases where no other experiment can provide the information needed. This is the type of debate as to when those experiments become imperative that are, I think, the critical elements of this type of review. And certainly, these types of studies are presently excluded from NIH funding. And then we are now updating these. Jonathan is chairing this effort, and you'll hear from him more this afternoon. But fundamentally, I think it's fair to say the updated guidelines have continued to assert the fundamental principles that were put forth in 2006, that this research, when it raises sensitive issues, requires independent scientific review and oversight. So let me leave you with the notion that we've got several sessions. The morning session will focus primarily on the introduction of human pluripotent stem cells into animal embryos. The afternoon session will focus on neural cell chimerism. And the major questions that we'll be addressing is, what will we learn from these studies? What are the unique and essential scientific lessons that can only be taught by this type of experiment? And what are the limitations? What can we not learn? And what drives us to continue to look for better experimental systems? And then session three this afternoon will focus on the responsible conduct and the structures that are in place for the review and oversight of such research. And this will help us to define where are the boundaries and whether existing review and other oversight structures suffice. So with that, I leave those set of questions. And I will invite uh, the next session to start. And I look forward to the discussions for the day. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'm Janet Rottend, and I am from the University of Toronto in the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, as you heard, I've, I've been at this Chimera game for a long time. Uh, my role in this session is to act as moderator, and in the role of moderator, my main goal, I'm afraid, is to keep everybody on time. We have five speakers in this session. We are currently scheduled for one hour um, with five speakers, so we are time you to 12 and a half minutes. Uh, I would like to move forward through those presentations and save <coughs> questions probably until the discussion session uh, later on. I just don't think we're going to get through it otherwise. If there's a burning informational question that you need to ask, we can do that at the end of each one. But I don't want to start the discussion in this session. We do need to get through the presentations. Uh, we will be flashing cards. Um, where's Ellen? There, right, she's going to be flashing the cards uh, at you to try to move you forward. So our first speaker is Jakob Hanna from the Weizmann Institute. Jakob. Okay. Thank you very much. I will try to present to you today <coughs> our work uh, that we've been doing with injecting mostly human IPS cells into mouse embryos and based on results and also some of the uh, ethical and experimental platforms that we think we might use to bring this uh, field of research perhaps forward. So just a brief introduction, we're interested in two different states of pluripotency, whether we're talking about in the mouse, talking about earlier pre-implantation stages, what we call naive cells, and post-implantation stages are more advanced pluripotent cells, such as we call them prime cells. And knowledge through the years, we're really understanding that there are different flavors of pluripotency, and we're talking about continuum of functions. And one of the attributes of naive pluripotency is you typically enhance ability to generate chimerisms in the inner cell mass. We actually do not know exactly why, if it's technical and so on. And when it comes to human cells, we've been very much interested into why they are different from uh, mouse cells. They're not identical to these prime cells, but they're similar. And we've been asking for a long time, really, is there a novel naive pluripotent cell that have different functions and so on? And my group has, function, has published that there are conditions that make human cells different. Uh, they're much more sophisticated than the ones we used in the mouse. It's not really important whether the content now, but definitely we're making cells that grow, for example, independent of map kinase signaling, and these cells we turn the naive, and we're trying now to understand, because there are many other publications now describing different naive cells from humans, from primates, 
where do we fall in this landscape and what are they doing exactly? What are they important for? But we can do a lot of things in vitro with these naively reported cells and when we say who cares, uh, but they're very different cells. So we're trying to ask, do they function differently? Do they do things we couldn't succeed before with human prime cells? And um, other, can we study them for early developmental biology? And one example was we were able for the first time to recapitulate a differentiation protocol in vitro that was, not, that was successful with mouse naive cells, but not with human conventional cells. But when we tried this with the human naive cells, we were quickly reproduce this protocol. But we've also learned about lineage specifiers that are specific in the human. But when we move to thinking about chimerism, as I mentioned, the making ability of naive cells to make chimeras and broadens, omega-3 uh, think a lot of studies done on, for example, non-human primates. As you hear this work from Metalipov that tried to inject conventional human, uh, primate ES cells, as done in mouse, they actually could not yield any chimeric cells. And we thought perhaps this is really not possible, not only because of species differences, but since conventional uh, monkey cells are primed, and since mouse primes are not good at making chimeras, maybe we should start thinking, what if we inject naive cells, more naive cells, whether we're talking about human or non-human primates. And my motivation for the lab really to try to inject these cells is, is this another important way to make animals that are, have some contribution of human cells? George elegantly talked about fetal transplant of blood cord and so on to make such animals. They are great tools, but think about it. It's very hard to get these samples. Typically, they're from wild type cells. The vision, if we can do this with iPS cells, which we can obtain, we can genetically modify, we can label them, and if we inject them into the mouse, and that mouse will have some, even if low level, of blood cells or liver cells, can then we bring this platform forward to look at the function of human cells into a living animal? So with that, when we isolated these human naive to report them, and we decided to inject iPSCs, just I'm from Israel, as I mentioned, and Israeli law does not prohibit microinjection of human IPS into early embryos from other species or in vivo fostering into non-human homes. Of course, according to the ICCR guidelines, this is the same. And the ESCRO in our, in our institute decided to follow the ICCR guidelines and give us kind of a two-stop approach. First, go until E is 17 and a half, and based on those results, we will consider what to do next. And indeed, what we do, we choose to inject an E2.5 more or less, the human cells into the mouse more or less, let them recover for 24 hours in rock inhibitor, and implant them into the uterus and let them go up to E17 and a half. And we were able to obtain, and looking here, what we do, we get low contribution chimeras, and we need advanced microscopy to look at this. So you can look at your E10 and a half embryo labeled with red and look at the craniofacial tissues, and you can see here the GFP cells that are labeled, we can see integration in this embryo. We've described about 13 embryos, so obtained from typically 1,000 embryos we obtained. So it's fairly inefficient, and typically even per the embryo, it is low levels. And I should mention that is expected if you, you would hear from uh, Professor Nakauchi, even between mouse and rat that are very similar, the chimerism levels are very, very low. But definitely, and I hope you always looks poorer here, that you could see some integration in the forelimb bud, mid-body somites, and so on. And it was very important for us to exclude con contamination. So for example, you're looking here at E17 and a half mouse lung tissues. Here's the mouse. As you can see, this is the DAP, a lot of cell. The GFP is the human cells. There are GFP positive cells. This is control uninjected lungs from the same age, no GFP. And if we stain for human nuclear antigen, which is specifically for the human, you could see great co-localization between GFP and human nuclear antigen. So this is not a contamination, this is not autofluorescence. And this is what we're getting. Again, this is a blowout of this region. So after that, studies using our conditions with primate IPSCs, monkey IPSCs, by Ding group and Zhao groups, they were able to reproduce this, for example, to inject monkey naive IPS cells into mouse. They could get as well, you could see here the GFP advanced monkey with some contribution, and also suddenly monkey into monkey, they get fetuses with chimeras, which is very encouraging. Now since the publication, my lab has been following up on this and trying to ask really what, what is going on. And we can try this, this is not a cell line dependent thing. We can get these chimeras, again, inefficiently, but these are again one of the nicer examples that we can get and see human GFP integration in the tail or lower mid-body and so on. 
And if we look in, inside the lung, for example, we could see co-localization between the human GFP cell occasionally and differentiation marker like Clara cell 10, and this is not in the control. So the cells are showing some sign of differentiation. But now, as chimeras assays are very hard, even when you do it in mouse or when you do it in the human, we want to systematically look at this and enlarge our robustness. So really the question is, what is the integration pattern of these cells? What is their cell identity? How mature are they? And, um, and, um, and we do this by systematic immunohistology, as I showed some before, trying to advance novel live microscopy, and now cheap low uh, single cell RNA-seq to look at qualitatively with these cells when we get them. So what we're all looking at, how can we enhance the integration? Perhaps we can mutate the human cells to enhance their proliferation and survival and make them more competitive. That is one thing that we're looking at. Second, as mentioned, we could try to inject these um, human cells into mouse embryos that are knockouts for certain organs, and perhaps they will have more selective pressure to enter some of these lineages. And then we're trying also to have bigger numbers. Can we do some of the mouse embryo work ex vivo? And we're taking old work, and very nice by Patrick Tan, we were using roller culture to grow mouse embryos for about 24 hours in roller cultures, and we're trying to go now, we can go from E17 to E11 and a half, E7 to 11 and a half. Again, I'm talking about mouse embryos. So it's basically an incubator with roller tubes. We grow them, and this is the work of Rada Masarwa. And what we can now develop protocols, we go from E7 with different media to 11.5, or from E11 to E12.5. And this is what it typically looks like. It's just basically we dissect the embryos at E7. We clean up the members very clearly. We typically, it's based on a human umbilical cord serum and rat serum combination. We put the embryos in these bottles and they have to roll so that they don't stack. Every 24 hours, we change the media. And as I mentioned, we can go from very efficiently from E7. And this is the same embryo we take out every 24 hours. So you can see here A8, mouse embryo, A9, E10. And we can go up to E11 with about 70% efficiency, which is very interesting. And again, our idea, first, this is very good for developed myology, but if we can inject the human cell into mouse embryos and get them out at this stage, can we use these embryos and take them out of the sac and image them? So together with that, we're developing advanced technologies for imaging of tot in total confocal embryos, where we mount the embryos on regular confocal microscope or live sheet microscope, and there, we make special chambers of how to plate the embryo developing on the stage. And this was developed originally by the same postdoc who was with Lidis Wonder. And we can look, for example, now at mouse neural tube closure completely from these embryos, how they grow under the microscope. And again, this is all mouse embryo, and we're just trying to make these platforms to look at this currently inefficient, but we think is important phenomenon. And just as a final slide, um, now we are filing in my institute for going post-term, and we think in, when it comes to mice, uh, the inefficiency is way too low that, uh, to justify what I'm going to tell you about. But however, one thing that we are considering, particularly when going into human um, cells, is basically to make what we call altered human naive iPSCs for integration. That take the iPSCs, and if we are worried about germ cells and brain, we could perhaps knock out genes that are specifically required for these genes for these lineages like nanos or soft one. And if we knock them out in theory, and we know in, in my studies, the cells can never make any neurons, can never make any germ cells. And the question, do we need to make such a manipulation, particularly if we choose to go into larger animals? Of course, it has limitings for those who are interested in neural cells, but I'm just one thing that we are discussing. So I'll just summarize, thank Rada Masarwa, Imaging, and Ohad Gafri and Lee Weinberger, and different funding agency for supporting this work. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. You're in under time. <laughs> so uh, if there's a couple of quick questions, we can take those uh, right now. I, I have one. Um, the, the culture, roller culture system looks lovely, and it's very nice. Uh, I wonder, and certainly you could use that to take your blastocysts, but it's, you're still dealing with very low contributions. Have you also thought about introducing the cells directly into the seven and a half day embryo, which other people have done where they, to see how they behave. Exactly, so that, that's something we're doing now, but we somehow we're a bit greedy, but we are trying to do 
is the work from Magdalena Zernika gets, she gets from three and a half to five and a half. <laughs> and we're trying to bridge that and then go all the way. But perhaps that, it's very tough, but we have encouraging results. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. And our next speaker uh, is Juan, Juan Carlos Espizua Belonte from the Salk Institute. Good morning. These represent the, an hourglass, and at the top of this hourglass, we see an embryo that in almost every occasion develops perfectly and generate all the tissues and organs we, an organism is formed. And at the bottom of this hourglass is what, say for the last two decades, us scientists have tried to imitate from an in vitro point of view, the advances have been made, great advances, generating different cell types in the petri dish, even more lately, these small organoids, and raising the hope that these structures, these cells, could be used for transplantation in humans. The problem is whether these cells are functional or not. There are problems of efficiency in generating these cells, problems of safety to scale up the cell number to be, to be in a clinical setting is difficult and even much more difficult to generate organs. And perhaps the problem it is here, that in vitro we cannot entirely uh, imitate what is happening in vivo. The needs, the three-dimensional structures cannot be generated in an in vitro dish. It's not to say that this research is not giving us hope, but we need to think of alternatives, of different approaches. And this is perhaps the reason why we are all here together, the idea of chimerism and how this field could help this other one in vitro. Chimerism. So, in addition to the pioneering studies of, for instance, Janet Rosan, I think that two key studies that demonstrate the potential of this, um, of this research are highlighted here. The first one by Fred Al and the second one from Hiro Nakahuchi, which indicate that you can mix cells at the early stage of embryogenesis. In this case, we're mixing cells from a rat and a mouse with different genetic background that in the end results in an animal that in this case of the PDX um, gene generate a pancreas coming from the rat and a mouse. Now, in the last couple of years, we have had a great advances in gene editing tools, and this experiment that probably Hiro took you several years can now be done in a matter of weeks, if not just months. And this can be extended to many other organs and tissues. This is what we have been doing in the last couple of years, trying to generate rat tissues and organs inside a mouse trying to understand the key pathways to allow us to do this. But while this is helping us to understand mouse and rat organ and tissue formation, the question is how this can help the general idea of transplantation. So we have a need for organs and in this graphic here to the right, you can see that this need increases exponentially. How this field can help towards that? 
the way I see it is something like this. We have a highway, the highway of development cells running around, and on the right, on the left, you want to introduce one cell into this highway. For that to be successful, you need to introduce that cell at a specific speed, cell proliferation speed. You need to have a timing, a perfect timing to do this. You need to have some topological coordinates to make that experiment successful. And not only that, there are different highways. The conditions of the highway are different. And even though early on there are similarities in how embryos develop, later on they are very different. So what do we know? And in these five minutes that are remaining, I'm going to tell you basically what I think the status of the field is. So what we have is that throughout the last few years, scientists have tried, have tried to capture the different cell types that one can find in the early embryo. At the bottom of the slide, you see the different cell types that have been captured in vitro. And then, in theory, these cells could be introduced in an in vivo setting at the different stages, at the blastomere, blastocyst, epiblast, and see how these cells integrate and develop in the host animal. Where are we? One of the first experiments is almost 10 years ago, and as you can see here, the efficiency of putting human cells inside a mouse embryo was very, very low. You see these tiny green dots on the right side, and the embryos were not normal. The contribution was limited, and the embryos were retarded. More recently, we have developed a, a cell type that can engraft in the posterior epiblast at the perigastrula stages, as you can see in this green dot at the tip of the tail of a mouse. These cells can differentiate in the three germ layers, and these can also be extended, these conditions, to monkeys. Jacob has explained, just let me first, and the problem that Jacob has explained clearly some of the technical issues of working with at these early stages of mouse development. So in this particular case, we had to do the experiment outside of the mother, and it is technically challenging to put this embryo inside the mouse again and see how it develops. But there are other animals, other situations where you can do this. So in chick embryos, all you have to do to perform the same experiment is make a hole in the shell, and then you can, oh, it's not there. But the idea is that in the, in the cheek embryo, you can do the same experiment, and we can see contribution of these cells. In fact, it is here, sorry, it's just that the brightness is not there, but you see some tiny dots of green that indicate that with much higher contribution, these cells can go into the cheek embryo. So this is an alternative for the experiment that Jacob was saying, so a different freeway. Now, as he indicated, in the last couple of years, several studies have been developed in trying to improve the efficiency of uh, these chimerism. Regarding naive cells, I'd like to introduce you with another um, example that we have recently developed, where you can see that uh, these new conditions allow for integration of human cells into a mouse embryo. This is a mid-station mouse embryo, and you see in red to the right some of the tissues that can be colonized by these new conditions. Now, I mentioned the different highways and the different animals in where this experiment can be tried, and one of them is the pig. For different reasons, the pig could be an animal where the organs, because of their similar size to human, could be used as a host to further enhance the idea of human transplantation. Using these cells, I just 
introduced to you, you can see that they can go into the blastocyst, and when this blastocyst is implanted into a, a mother, you see at mid-gestation peak embryo that there are a contribution in different organs. You see here to the right the human antibody colocalizing with the GFP stain. So these couple of examples indicate that in principle, cells, human cells can contribute to mouse, sheep, pig, developing embryos. But if you look at uh, this slide, and in general what is happening is at this moment the contribution is very low, and even the reproducibility in different hands, in different labs, is a, is a question, both in mouse, chick, and pig, the three animals that I have introduced. So not only that, it's not only a problem of the cell. There are many other issues that we first need to resolve if we want really to accomplish that dream. And this is the message I would like to leave you with. We're still very early in the game. We have cells that contribute in a very, very low efficiency. We have problems of reproducibility. These freeways really are complicated. So first is the cells. There is another major concept which all of you are aware is heterochrony and the timing of the developmental process. Just to illustrate an example, you have here two salamanders. One of them is a ground-dwelling salamander. The other one is a tree-dwelling salamander. And if you look at the limbs of these two very closely related species, timing at heterochrony in development, it will make a very different limb. So we need to study these processes in the lab before we can even go farther. Now, between the different animals that I just indicated, it is true that there are conserved uh, signaling pathways, but there are many others that are very divergent. But it's even more complicated. In, there are species-specific enhancers. I wanted to put this one on purpose for the brain. On the right, you see this particular enhancer of human, and you see on the left the chimp one. If you see the green staining in the brain, it's very, very different. So when we are going to do this type of experiment, we need to know first all these differences, specific, specific, specific enhancer differences. Immune responses, mixing cells from one animal into another. Interspecies cell competition. The field of uh, Drosophila embryology has been key to this. And the idea of putting one cell into a field of other cells is not something that is straightforward. Cells compete with one another. Cells don't like to be mixed. And we are right now learning a little bit of the pathways involved in these processes of cell-cell competition. Uh, Jacob mentioned the idea of having some ways to avoid certain contribution in the host animal, perhaps priming how to prime the donor cells so that they target a specific cell type. This idea of species-specific enhancers would be key for that. Saying one, this is a mistake, and safety. So with all these points and many others that I haven't considered here, my message is that even though the idea of generating cells, tissues, and organs in an animal host for transplantation is very appealing, we're far away from that. We still are in the basic laboratory. We need to solve problems like the one I mentioned in this slide. We are really at the basic science, and until we don't resolve this problem, that idea of utilizing this technique for generating human cells into a host different animal is, is far away. We still need to solve all these 
issues and there is room, time, and resources that should be developed into these first. And that's all what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we don't have time for questions there. So we will move right on. Thank you. To the next speaker, who is uh, Hiro Nakayuchi, uh, currently coming from the Stanford uh, University School of Medicine. morning. Uh, the aim of our research is uh, purely uh, translational. So uh, we, we want to make uh, uh, donor organs uh, for transplantation. Uh, you know, uh, transplantation is a established uh, therapy, but it has a lot of issues like this. For example, uh, the short, absolute shortage of uh, donor organs uh, there's even a black market to sell organs for transplantation. And also uh, immunological rejections, ethical issues, <coughs> high medical costs. But uh, all the, these issues uh, can be, uh, you know, resolved, resolved by, you know, uh, generating functional organs uh, from the patient's own stem cells. So we believe that this is one of the most urgent goals of regenerative medicine. So uh, now we have uh, iPS cells in, in addition to ES cells, but many of us are working on uh, generating functional cells uh, targeting uh, diseases that can be treated by cell therapy. But as I mentioned, there are many patients are waiting for donor organs, so we need to make uh, <clears throat> uh, organs from stem cells. But this is obviously not easy. So our approach is uh, to use blastist complementation and making chimeras uh, to generate uh, organs uh, in vivo. So uh, basically the idea is organ niche and blastist comp uh, developmental compensation. So we postulated uh, a developmental organ niche. In this case for kidneys, we used a kidney deficient mouse in this case and we thought that if uh, in, during the development of these embryos, there must be a sp space for kidneys, uh, putative space for uh, kidneys. So if we make chimeras by introducing uh, wild-type pluripotent stem cells into this blast cyst, then these uh, pluripotent stem cell-derived cells should uh, developmentally complement the defect, and we should see birth of a uh, chimeric uh, mouse, in this case, with with kidneys derived from pluripotent stem, cell, stem cells. So this was the idea, and indeed, this is the Sarawa knockout mouse, no kidneys, but when uh, the embryos were complemented with GFP-marked iPS cells, now we see generation of kidneys, and uh, they're connected to the ureters, and the bladder is inflated uh, by urine, uh, indicating that kidneys are functional, making urine. But under the fluorescent light, uh, as you can see, uh, on the kidneys are very brightly positive, indicating that most of the cells making these kidneys are derived from uh, injected GFP-marked iPS cells. So we applied the same idea to uh, PDX and knockout mouse, and uh, again, we were able to see generation of uh, pancreas. In, in, and uh, Actually, these mice, PDX and knockout, knockout mice, they usually die soon after birth, but they survived into adulthood when they are complement, complemented with iPS cells. And uh, as you can see, the entire pancreas is uh, made of uh, cells uh, from uh, iPS cells. So we could show a proof of concept in a mouse model first, and then uh, obviously we cannot use a pancreatic human as a host so we eventually need to use animals to do this type of uh, uh, approach. So we try to see if we can generate interspecific chimeras between mouse and rats. Uh, two ways we can inject rat into mouse embryos, or we can inject mouse iPS cells or ES cells into rat uh, brasses. And we did, did this experiment when we were able to generate interspecific chimeras in both approaches. And we could see contribution of 
donor iPS cells in various organs as expected. But you know, we found some several interesting you know, findings out of these interspecific uh, chimeras. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of them is the body size. We were expecting to see uh, medium size, 50%, 50% chimeras between mouse and rat. But in, in fact, uh, the rat uh, body size of the chimera seems to be determined by the uh, blood cyst host and surrogate mother. So this is the uh, probably its most you know, uh, evident in this picture. These two uh, animals are chimeras. And this one was from the blast, mouse blood cyst injected with rat iPS cell. This one is uh, rat uh, blood cyst derived chimera injected with mouse iPS cells. So uh, somehow the, we can learn a lot from, uh, by making these interspecific chimeras. So now we know that we can make interspecific chimeras, so we try to generate uh, uh, rat uh, pancreas in mouse. So we injected rat iPS cells into PDX and knockout mouse, and we were able to see growth of mouse size chimeras, but uh, with uh, rat pancreas. And interestingly, the size of this uh, pancreas uh, was mouse size. So uh, and more recently, this is an unpublished data, we generated PDX and knockout rat and injected mouse iPS cells. So this is a reverse experiment. And as you can imagine, we were able to uh, see the birth of a rat size chimera. But in this case, the pancreas was made of mouse cells. So this is a, a very large uh, mouse uh, pancreas generated in uh, xenogenic host rats. So again, you know, these experiments tell us that it's not the cells that, that determine the size of the organ, but probably the environment determines the size of uh, the organ. So this is uh, very uh, informative. This is a good way to understand uh, how, how the, the organ size is determined. So because now we have a large uh, uh, mouse uh, pancreas, but generated in rats, <coughs> we try to do this experiment. That is, we try to isolate islets from this uh, uh, mouse uh, pancreas generated in a xenogenic environment and transplanted it back to uh, the diabetic mouse or IPS donor. And uh, a bottom line is these 100 islets uh, generated in, in xenogenic environment could indeed uh, normalize the uh, blood glucose levels without any immunosuppression besides the first five days. So this is the uh, proof of principle for what we are trying to you know, uh, achieve uh, ultimately. So we can, we can use these uh, organs generated in xenogenic host uh, for the transplantation and this could essentially just should be a uh, autologous transplantation, doesn't require any immunosuppression. So now uh, these are the mouse or rodent studies. So we have to, they're too small for uh, making a human organ. So we are moving uh, toward larger animals and uh, we first generated a pancreatic pig by introducing PDX1, HES1 construct. This is a transgenic pig and we know from our previous mouse studies that uh, HES1 is an important uh, uh, inhibitory factor for the development of uh, a pancreas. So this construct uh, enabled uh, generation of a pancreatic uh, pig. And then we further went on to see if we can do blastist complementation as we did in rodents. And actually, we used uh, Xabula orange transgenic pig as uh, blastomere donors because we don't have uh, pluripotent stem cells that can contribute to uh, chimeras in pig. Uh, so uh, this also worked, and we were able to generate chimeric pig with uh, pancreas uh, from these exogenous uh, stem cells. And they, uh, as expected, they grew into adulthood and uh, as you, you can see, these are the chimeric, you know, from the coat color, this is the chimeric uh, pig. And because uh, they matured uh, into adulthood, 
now we are getting a lot of uh, semen uh, sperms. So simply by uh, mating with wild type pigs or by uh, doing IVF in vitro fertilization, we can uh, obtain a large number of uh, apancreatic embryos for, for this purpose so without doing any uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer uh, experiments. So we are now more or less ready to do the experiment we initially envisioned. Uh, we have a pancreatic embryos, so we should be able to uh, test our initial hypothesis whether we can make human organs in, uh, in pigs. The current issues, however, is as two previously speakers alluded, we need a, a human iPS cell that can contribute to uh, chimera formation. And the other issue, uh, of course, is the ethical concerns. Uh, people worry about seeing uh, pigs with human nerve cells, germ cells, skin cells, and so on. And because of this, uh, I was not able to, I'm still not able to do this type of experiment uh, in Japan uh, because of the guideline by the uh, Japanese government. And that's part of the reason why I'm moving to Stanford University. So uh, to avoid this, uh, there are several approaches. Uh, we can gen mo uh, genetically modify iPS cells. Alternatively, we can do a conceptus complementation. Instead of injecting iPS cells, we can inject committed progenitor cells into the uh, embryo, uh, probably by in utero injection of these committed progenitor cells. This is technically difficult, but we have shown previously that we can do this in at least in the hematopoietic system. So what about this genetically modified iPS cell? The idea is relatively simple in this case. We, inter we implemented inducible MIX-L1 gene into the iPS cells, hoping that forced expression of MIX-L1, which is the important uh, transcription factor for uh, development of endo uh, uh, cells, uh, organs. So we, instead of having these cells, we hoped that we should, uh, you know, direct the differentiation of iPS cells to our end organs. And actually it worked, and, uh, you know, it, it is evident even from the coat color. This is the uh, conventional chimera. But if we forcefully express mixed cell one, the, they look like uh, wild type uh, B6 mice, but inside uh, we are able to generate uh, pancreas from the injected iPS cells. As you can see, uh, the contribution of uh, injected iPS cells uh, uh, significantly reduced in non-endoderm uh, organs. So this system uh, is one example of uh, controlling con doing a targeted organ generation. So uh, the last uh, and most difficult uh, challenge, a real challenge for us is how we can overcome a uh, genogenic barrier or genetic distance between human and pig. Uh, human and mouse uh, is about 90 years, million years uh, ago, we, they've diverged. Uh, but human pig is at like 94 million years uh, of uh, genetic distance, evolutional distance. But recently, we uh, succeeded in making mouse Brady ball uh, chimeras. The, these two species diverged about 44 million years ago. But uh, the formation generation of these chimera was much uh, difficult, with less efficiency in terms of success rate and also the uh, contribution of, of uh, donor chimerism. So uh, clearly, uh, this genetic distance really counts to make uh, uh, interspecific chimeras. So we need to understand the mechanism of this xenogenic barrier and uh, uh, this is essentially to generate interspecific chimeras between human and pig or human and say, sheep, for example. So in summary, I think uh, generation of organs in vivo using genogenic uh, very potent stem cell complemented blastocysts provides a new strategy for understanding human development, organogenesis, and a novel approach for organ supply. Uh, the, these are the... Uh, potential uh, possibilities, you know, uh, we can learn from these, doing these experiments. So uh, these are the uh, contributors. So I stop here.
Thank you. And we'll move on to the next speaker, which is Walter Lowe from the University of Minnesota and Recombinetics, Inc. Uh, good morning. Uh, what I'd like to do today is share with you some of our work that we've been doing on characterizing uh, chimeric human porcine blastocysts and, and, and fetuses. And uh, like the others that are presented today, um, what we are concerned about is uh, our goal in terms of our genesis project group at the University of Minnesota is to create human organs uh, and cells in, in pigs using pigs as a, a biological incubator. And so this um, uh, this scheme has already been shown uh, uh, several times today, and again, our, our intent here is to take uh, pluripotent st stem cells from humans, uh, introduce them into uh, uh, the blastocyst of, of pigs uh, that have been knocked out with certain genes to create a niche, then introduce those stem cells, and then uh, transfer these uh, chimeric blastocysts into uh, surrogate sows and gilts to, to create these uh, animals with the organs that can then be transplanted. So the, I think the key approach is to understand the transcription factors that are involved in, in, in organ and cell development. So we've seen some of those uh, transcription factors uh, that are involved in uh, potentially making pancreas, uh, their liver, lung, uh, you know, heart, and I'll talk a bit more about uh, some of the transcription factors that we've looked at for complementation uh, to make brain uh, later in this presentation. So we've looked at three types of uh, donor stem cells uh, for complementation. Uh, we've looked at uh, human iPS cells uh, using the protocol developed by uh, Yamanaka and his group. We've looked at uh, the human uh, MAPCs that were developed by uh, Catherine Grafai's group. And then also we've looked at stem cells that, uh, from cord blood that we've developed in, in my lab. Uh, we've also looked at uh, injection of these stem cells at uh, two stages, either at the morula stage or the, the blastocyst stage, and uh, we found that, and we'll see data here that shows that uh, both of these uh, uh, stages of development seem to be amenable for incorporation of these uh, human stem cells. Uh, in our initial studies, uh, we used a parthenogenetic uh, uh, approach to, to generate these uh, blastocysts, and so, uh, rather than the uh, uh, conventional approach where you have uh, 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 sort of both paternal and maternal genomes through fertilization, uh, these uh, blastocysts are generated by the electrical activation of oocytes that give rise to two maternal genomes. And so these develop pretty well uh, in vitro for a period of time and then also in vivo, but they, they aren't capable of uh, developing beyond about 40 days in gestation. Oops. Uh, so the uh, first studies that we did was just to, to look at the contribution of these uh, human stem cells uh, into the uh, porcine uh, blastocysts using the, the parthenotes. So here this is a, uh, a, a parthenote, and you can see here the inner cell mass by uh, con differential contrast imaging. Uh, the uh, human stem cells were labeled with uh, a red dye, so you can see you know, uh, uh, where they end up. And you can see that these human cord blood stem cells uh, integrate very nicely in the, the inner cell mass. Uh, likewise, uh, in injecting human iPS cells, we can see that they do integrate uh, into the uh, areas of the, of the inner cell mass. We've also looked at the, the MAPCs, and so in these uh, studies, what we've done is that we've stained them after we fixed the, the blastocyst with, uh, we've stained them for uh, human nuclear antigen. Uh, these cells also express GFP. Uh, and you can see by the DAPI stain here where the inner cell mass is. So you can see that the, the MAPCs also uh, contribute to the, the ICM. So all three cell lines seem to be uh, uh, capable of doing that. Uh, we then wanted to see whether these cells can proliferate uh, after uh, injection into the ICM or into the blastocyst. Uh, so what we've done here is that we've taken these cord blood stem cells uh, and then uh, uh, label them for human nuclear antigen, and then uh, we wanted to look at the distribution within the, the blastocyst and also the, the number of cells. And so this graph here shows uh, the distribution of these uh, uh, cord blood stem cells uh, uh, one and two days after uh, injection. So 
We activate the, the uh, oocytes at day zero, at day six we inject, and then at day uh, seven and eight we begin to quantify. And we look for the cells in the inner cell mass for the trophectoderm or the, the blastoid cavity. And you can see at uh, the, the first and second days after the injection that by and large the vast majority of these uh, human core blood stem cells are contained within the inner cell mass, very few within the trophectoderm and the blastoid cavity. We've also quantified the number of cells over the, the next two days after injection. And at day six, we inject only 10 uh, human stem cells. And then we monitor the, the number of cells over the next two days. And you can see that by day eight, two days after the injection, we've doubled the number of cells from 10 to 20. So these cells are capable of proliferating within the, these uh, parthenogenetic blastocysts. We next wanted to determine uh, whether these chimeric human porcine blasters are then capable of uh, contributing to a, a developing fetus. And so they were then injected or transferred into a, a surrogate sow. Then after uh, 30 days of gestation, we harvested uh, these particular embryos. And so the, you can see here, these are uh, the, the, the parthenotes that we we've observe after 30 days. And you can see there's really a quite a, a distribution in, in uh, development here. And so I think that's, that's characteristic of these, these parthenos, that they really, some of them don't develop well. But we do have some that develop like this one here that looks like a, a, a normal uh, embryo at, at day 30 in gestation. So when we look at that particular uh, parthenos and then we uh, label it for human nuclear antigen, we can find that in the liver uh, there are HNA positive cells shown here in red. Uh, we don't see much of a distribution in other organs uh, and other areas of, uh, of uh, this, this particular fetus. So we next wanted to see whether these cells can contribute in the context of, of complementation. Uh, so we are, in my lab, are interested in generating uh, dopamine neurons from the substantia nigra uh, pars compactum. And one of the key transcription factors here is PIDX3. Uh, so we uh, we are focusing initially on PIDX3 uh, as a knockout uh, to interrogate the complementation uh, of these human stem cells. Uh, the other reason we chose PIDX3 is that it also contributes to the development of the eye and the lens. So it, gave, it would give us a, another phenotype to, to begin to uh, assess. So we generated uh, PIDX3 knockouts in, in porcine fibroblasts, and then we took the, uh, the, the nucleus of those and then injected them into uh, the, uh, the morula uh, uh, or in the enucleated um, uh, o, uh, oocyte to generate these uh, PIDX3 knockout uh, uh, morulas. Then we injected both uh, either uh, cord blood stem cells or the iPS cells into these. And then we transferred these chimeric uh, PIDX3 knockout morulas to surrogate gilts. And then we uh, allowed these uh, chimeric fetuses to develop to 62 days in this case. So uh, the PIDX3 mutation is all, it also occurs in nature. And so here's a, a sheep uh, that has a PIDX3 mutation. Here's a, a wild type of sheep, and you can see that the eyes uh, develop normally. In the PIDX3 knockout, you can see here that the, the eyelid really doesn't open. And so uh, this is a phenotype that we are. We, we've looked at in our, our uh, knockouts and our complemented uh, fetuses. So here is a uh, fetus at, uh, 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 at a wild type at 62 days. So you can see, if you look at the eyes, uh, you can see that the, the eyelid appears to be what we call uh, at both an open phenotype. In contrast, all of our knockout, PIDX3 knockouts had this phenotype here where the, the eyelid was not open, it was, was closed. Uh, and then uh, in and when we looked at our uh, fetuses that were complemented with human cord blood cells, we found that about half of them exhibit a, a wild type uh, phenotype, and the other half exhibited uh, a phenotype where the, the eyelids were closed. So not all of the uh, fetuses uh, were complemented uh, to the full extent. The other uh, phenotype that one sees is the, the development of the lens. So in the, the knockout, the PEDX3 uh, null mouse, you can see that there is uh, very poor or, or no lens development. So we wanted to look at that particular phenotype, and uh, here's the wild type uh, um, uh, fetus you can see here, the lens development, the cornea, and the retina. In the knockout, we have very poor development of the lens, and even the, the retina is really uh, disorganized. And you can see here that the lens still seems to be connected with, with the cornea. 
We saw no, in all of our uh, complemented animals, we saw no uh, normal development of the lens. You can see here that the lens are uh, uh, really disorganized along with the, with the retina for both iPS cells and uh, human uh, cord blood stem cells. Uh, we then uh, looked at the, the dopamine neuron development, and so in the, the um, PIDX3 knockout mouse, uh, what one finds is that there's a depletion of the dopamine neurons within the substantia nigra. Here's a wild-type mouse in, in the, uh, the area of the nigra. You can see the, the dopamine neurons here. Uh, in the PIDX3 null mouse, as shown by uh, Gerlich's group, that there is uh, an absence of these uh, dopamine neurons within the, the nigral area. So we examined then the, the knockout fetuses at day 62. Um, here's the, the wild-type fetus in the area of the nigra. You can see an abundance of these Th-positive uh, cells shown in red. In contrast, in the, the PIDX3 knockout uh, uh, pig fetuses, you can see there's a really dramatic decrease in the, the number of uh, Th-positive cells. So in looking at the um, uh, chimeras, we saw uh, um, about uh, many that had this sort of knockout phenotype, but in others we saw uh, uh, the presence of uh, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase cells within the substantia nigra. Uh, so these are uh, five fetuses here. Uh, and two, we showed that uh, we were able to observe human nuclear antigen um, in, 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 the, uh, in these cells, and so you can see that uh, the HNA positive cells also appear to co-coalize with Th and also appear to co-coalize with, with new N. Uh, interestingly, in, uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, animals or fetuses that, where there was very little uh, human nuclear antigen staining, and yet we were able to see uh, some evidence of uh, at TH. So we're, we're not quite sure, you know, how to explain this, possibly a, uh, some sort of uh, a potential trophic interaction or a non-cell autonomous interaction. Uh, we need, these are preliminary results, and we need to really uh, solidify this by doing uh, confocal microscopy uh, to see whether there is a, a, a true uh, uh, overlap of uh, human nuclear antigen with TH and uh, new N. And so in uh, addressing some of the, the questions that we were asked to consider, uh, what's the developmental window, window for introduction? Uh, we focused on PEDX3, which is fairly late in the developmental process of, of uh, TH uh, or dopamine neurons. Uh, we think that potentially if we look at either NER1 or uh, LMX1A knockouts, that, they, that may result in a greater contribution of, of human cells. Uh, what are the factors affecting proliferation? I think that uh, we've, we've been able to show that these cells can't proliferate within the, the context of the developing blastocysts. Uh, in terms of factors affecting incorporation and differentiation, I think that uh, the, the, the concept of using naive cells we've not, uh, might uh, allow us to have better incorporation of these human cells into the uh, porcine blastocysts. Uh, the other questions that uh, we were asked to consider, how long does the recipient embryo need to develop in order to uh, assess contribution to the relevant, relevant organ systems? For the brain, for the dopamine neurons, I think that we can, all we need are embryos that are about 30 to 60 days in gestation. Uh, for other organ systems, people who want to develop a heart or a kidney or a lung, uh, that may require a much longer period of time. Uh, what are the mechanisms that exist to enhance target specificity? I think that um, uh, the, the knockout using talons or uh, CRISPRs will allow us to, to target the uh, specificity, we're going in the process of looking at off-target effects. And then finally, what are the types of experiments that have the potential to alter animal characteristics in a manner that deviate from the species? I think that all of these experiments uh, will alter the, the phenotype to, to some extent. And I guess it just depends upon, you know, uh, whether you're interested in sort of the phenotype that one sees outwardly or, or within the, in the animals. And in closing, these are uh, the, the people in my lab, the, uh, the group of recombinetics and other PIs at the University of Minnesota that have been involved in, in these particular studies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and last in this session, uh, Chi Zhou from the Institute of Zoology of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So uh, I really want to introduce the progress in China about uh, interspecies uh, camera creation. So why we want to understand 
the, the, this topic, how to int introduce human stem cell or even non-human primate stem cell into another species. The advantage is uh, clear. It's, you, 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 it's really a very important technique, the tools, to evaluate the pluripotency. Another advantage is to create human tissue or organ by this technique. But we still concern about for the application such technique, such as if we can see the human stem cell differentiate in the garnet to guide human gametes in such chimeric. So for the future, is it possible for us to use non-human primates such as monkey to, to answer, answer such kind of question. Before it's uh, for mouse and mouse embryonic stem cell and iPS cell already confirmed, they can still keep the top developmental ability by even by tetrapod comprehension can guide a live animal. But uh, if we think about, is it possible to repeat the mouse experiment in human, the answer is no. It's impossible to make human turmeric by such technique, even just germline transmission test. So that's why we focus on monkey work for many years to test is it possible to harvest the monkey stem cell or API cell and try to test the developmental, developmental ability so the question here, if we think about how to use monkey stem cell, maybe three questions we have to answer. First is, is it possible to guide monkey chimeric from the monkey embryonic stem cell? So for the first topic, recently we published the first uh, part of the work. It's a monkey stem cell, and after we inject into the monkey blastosis stage embryo, we can really guide some chimeric monkey. It can see very clearly all the, in all the uh, tissue or organ, we can see the monkey cell, monkey stem cell inside. This stem cell, we call it uh, similar like uh, naive, but the work is still ongoing. We are trying to guide up to now, we got many different kind of monkey stem cell. It's uh, fortunately, maybe we can guide two different group of the stem cell. Can form the chimeric monkey, can't form. If we can really guide the two different, uh, different group of the monkey stem cell, maybe it's a good time to answer the question. Which is the useful or important markers to distinguish the good the, with very high pluripotency, the stem cell, and the lower Pluripotency. So, partially, we already under, understand and answer the question whether we can get chimeric monkey, and maybe fortunately, we can also answer the question: Is there any special marker to distinguish the germline transmission or not? But go back to the next question: Is it possible to guide or create some interspecies chimeric? from the monkey stem cell. The first part, in fact, we try a lot. Is it possible to introduce monkey stem cell into mouse or rat embryo? Because it's quite easier to, to test. The answer is, in fact, the answer is yes. It's possible to guide positive the chimeric, in, at least in the fetal stage. We haven't published because compared with the uh, monkey pig, monkey mouse, or monkey rat is uh, less interest in, in the laboratory. For the monkey in, in pig, we try a lot with the different stage of the monkey embryonic stem cell. We inject into the pig blastocyst stage embryo and try to wait for the development. But uh, to be honest, most of the features will be might be lost during the pregnant. From the abortion, the, the features, we can test, it's not very clear, but, uh, but in the 
in the abor abortion the, the features, we can see the monkey stem cell already distribute to different tissue. But uh, we, we still um, try to explore why most of the features lost during the pregnant. Maybe be because of immunorejection or some other reasons, because all the monkey stem cells with, with the label, with the red label or green label, maybe it's harmful for the development. But the work is still ongoing, especially when we try to use not a normal embryo, it's a use a knockout embryo from the pig. This is the, one of the projects still ongoing, the PDX1 knockout, knockout pig. It's, um, we are waiting to see, is it possible to use our new donor cell from the monkey already confirmed, well confirmed, can be formed the American monkey to test is it possible to get similar result in the PDX1 knockout pig. And how about human? Human and animal chimeric. When we try to, in fact, we try first is the human stem cell in the adult animal, such as monkey. This is ongoing work. We try to induce DOPA neural differentiate from human embryonic stem cell, and then inject into the Parkinson's disease monkey's brain. This monkey similar work already the maximum. The monkey received the cell trans transplantation already maximum three years. We are still trying to monitor the behavior. Is it possible to, to get some some change of the behavior. So we, we're talking about the modification. Is it, first, is it possible to overcome the Parkinson the disease? The answer is yes. And we are trying to keep the monkey as long as possible to see is there any other changing or modification of behavior. This work is still ongoing. But uh, for the monkey cell, uh, for the human cell into fetal, fetal embryo, this is one of the published paper from one of the Chinese group in Shanghai, Fan Yizhen's group. Many years ago, they tried to inject the, the human with a cold blood, with CD40, uh, 30, 34 positive the cell into the goat features. The goat features should be uh, uh, around 45 to 55 days, days old. After injection, they try to monitor and to see what's happened in different tissue and to, to do the screening for human to test for gene expression of human. So the answer, the conclusion is, in the chimeric goat, it's possible to, to test in the different uh, tissue to, to guide the positive gene expression confirmation of human, such as in heart, liver, and the lung, and even in the, in the brain, in the nervous system, we can still find human, human cell or human gene expression, except for the garnered, the gametes development. So such experiment at least gave us uh, some possibility it really can create human tissue in another species, such as uh, it's even it's not a whole organ, but at least some tissue. But for such kind of experiment, the concern here, what is the red line for the human cell in animal? We think maybe compared with, uh, based on the mouse knowledge, most important thing is germline transmission. Germline positive and germline negative should be the red line for such kind of experiment. That's why we did a lot of screening to try to find the, the markers can really distinguish germline positive or negative cell line. This is based on the mouse, but uh, such, such kind of uh, imprinting region, the cluster is quite concerned. Now we are trying to perform the similar experiment in monkey 
and hope we can confirm it and find some new markers in the human primate and maybe also useful for human. If, if we think about for the future, maybe when we try to make some such kind of camera and maybe possible, we can solve the problem such as the germline transmission from two different uh, direction. First is the donor cell itself. We can confirm the differentiability in, vi in, vi in vitro if we can really get some germline positive human stem cell line. We are still waiting and test the differentiate into gametes in vitro from the human stem cell line and the monkey stem cell line. But if we really want to inject the human stem cell in another species, blastocyst stage embryo, maybe we have to choose the cell lines without ability to form the gametes. And uh, today, yeah, we, I'm here. It's uh, really important because in China, we already published the regulation or guideline for stem cell therapy and the future, how to use human stem cell. During the past more than 10 years, we published three different guidelines. First one in 2003, second 2009, and more recently, we published the guideline to regulate clinical research for human stem cell. But within all these guidelines, the stem cell in another species embryo is still need update. So today I'm here, I really want to involve in such kind of discussion and to find some good suggestion for future Chinese guideline, the update. So thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and thank all the speakers. <coughs> I think we have covered a pretty broad spectrum of the issues and approaches and uh, I think we should take a break. We'll come back as a group on the stage, at which point we can ask questions, uh, and I'll also try to sort of guide the, uh, the, the discussion towards some uh, of the key points that I think come out of the different talks. Okay, quick break. Yes, Alan, quick break. <laughs> yes, I thought we'd try to be back here by 10.20. 10.20. I think at this stage we, we, we're going to have an open discussion. I want to lead it off by just trying to summarize what I heard in the last session and to sort of raise some of the issues that, that came about. Um, probably at that point we can have uh, either an, uh, questions from the audience or if somebody on the panel wants to challenge something I just said, they can challenge it as well. But I think it should be a fairly open discussion. We have some broad questions behind us to sort of bear in mind, um, uh, but I'm going to perhaps be a little bit more specific about the questions that I thought arose from the particular issues around pre-implantation chimerism. So what we heard was that the use of taking stem cells from hu particularly human stem cells and trying to introduce them into early embryos, pre-implantation embryos, fundamental question that was sort of behind uh, everybody's used this system to start with, was using the pre-implantation chimera to test pluripotency, because in the uh, uh, mouse system, that's the gold standard. So can we use that approach to test pluripotency? Number one question. But what we also heard, and really more focus, was the future of using this approach, not necessarily as a fundamental mechanism to test pluripotency, but to ask whether if we introduce those human stem cells into uh, other, other species, particularly perhaps the pig, could we generate human tissues and organs for transplant or generate better humanized models for research? So that's the goal. Let's ask ourselves then, what did we hear about the capacity today to take human pluripotent cells and generate interspecies chimeras? And the state of the art today from all the contributors we heard was that when you, you can do those experiments, if you make the cells perhaps a bit more naive, then they will con you can get cells into the blastocyst, but the contributions that you see in the post-implantation fetuses uh, are very low. They're not necessarily in all tissues, and the contributions are quite 
dispersed. So nobody showed us a, a very extensive contribution of human cells into an interspecies chimera. So that is probably a fundamental issue that we can talk about. If you cross species boundaries, how far can you go and really expect to get large contributions given timing and other differences? Perhaps you would have to go to the only way it's work would be in very closely related species. And that's also true in uh, rodents as well. So that's one of the issues. Is that a fundamental block that we're going to run into? It's also pretty clear that the starting cells that you would use for these experiments are still not well defined. We're still struggling with the different states of pluripotency and what's a prime cell, what's a naive cell. Is a naive cell really going to have the full potential to contribute? So we don't know the best starting cell. Uh, are there ways we could improve the contributions? Much of the uh, inability of cells to inc incorporate into the early embryo <coughs> may relate to fundamental d developmental differences, but also to technical issues like the fact that they don't express the right cell adhesion molecules to actually integrate into the early embryo. Can we improve contributions by playing around with those, those uh, uh, cell properties as well? But, uh, so underneath, I was hearing the, we, the state of the art today is we are not really at the point where we are uh, generating interspecies chimeras with very large contributions. And the question becomes, are there fundamental limitations? But what we also heard was this concept of, ge of generating an open niche. If you wanted to generate an organ, such as the, the pancreas, kidney, heart, if you generate a, a, uh, an animal that lacks that organ by a genetic uh, trick, then you're essentially leaving an open niche as the cells go through development. Maybe even the cell contributions that we're seeing with low level contribution from the pluripotent cells, if the uh, interspecies chimera, the host, has an open niche, perhaps those cells could still fill it. And will it work better then if we leave these kind of open niches? So, as we, so we, today, we are certainly not there, but if we start to see progress go going forward in this area, then the other issues that people raised was, okay, if we generated chimeras, even with an open niche, you make a pancreas, but if the cells contribute to other lineages, you are generating an interspecific chimera with human cells in other tissues. So do we need to consider the starting cells having limitations to particular germ layers, we heard about trying to push them towards endoderm by expression of mixolite 1, or delete their capacity to make tissues by perhaps knocking out genes like SOX1 so they wouldn't contribute to the brain. So I think that's an er another area to consider. And the last thing that I don't think was really well considered, <laughs> has not been considered, but I'd like to raise, is if we do succeed and generate whole organs in pigs or other species, what is the realistic prospect of using those in human therapy? The islet transplantation seems like a possibility because you can isolate uh, specifically the human islets, but whole organs, kidneys, hearts, etc., of course will have potentially human cells, but also pig cells because these are complex organs with many different tissues. So there's a lot of blocks along the way till we go to more complex <coughs> organs. So those are some of the things I heard, and I guess I'd like to hear first of all from the panel, uh, just to sort of any additional points they want to raise and then open it up to the audience for questions and comments. To the audience. Rodolph. So coming to, one of the issues looks to me is very important would be to match the state of differentiation of the cells when you introduce into the embryo. So that's why the big effort is to make naive cells, which could go into the, into the blastocyst versus prime cells. Would not be long there, would be maybe something later, and we heard some of the, I think this seems to me very important to give it a chance to incorporate. So I just want to get the logic of the experiment putting MAPC cells or umbilical cells into a blastocyst. To me, this is a total mismatch has been shown that the MAPC cells cannot really contribute to these things a long time ago. So I was trying to find out what the logic was here. So, so our rationale was just to, 
to begin to ex ex examine actually the, the broad spectrum of, of available you know, stem cells. And, and you're right, you know, we, you know, we didn't expect you know, some cells that were derived from adult to contribute as well. We did find that um, initially the, the MAPCs uh, didn't integrate well. They, you know, in fact, in, in uh, early experiments, they collapsed the, the, the blastocysts. Uh, we found that, uh, you know, uh, manipulation of these cells uh, uh, sort of where there was less damage resulted in um, better integration. I think the, in talking with Catherine Verfai about her, her MAPCs, that, uh, you know, the, the greater the, the degree of passaging uh, resulted in what she thought would be, uh, uh, you know, potentially more of a, a naive state, you know, reduced met methylation and so forth. Um, so that was some of the rationale behind why we tried these other sources of stem cells. So uh, I want to go back to your last point, Janet, which was um, perhaps the most compelling data um, in creating really what is more appropriately called a tissue chimera rather than an organ chimera, which is complementing the the PDX1 deficiency in a pig background. And um, the experiment that was done was to actually isolate the islets, which are, would be a, still heterogeneous, but all PDX derived. Uh, and so it's avoiding all of the stromal and vascular elements and all. So the question, though, is what's the current state of understanding of the degree of host contribution to these chimeric organs. Have you done, Hero, have you actually done the experiment? It would best be done in the pig, I'm sorry, in the, uh, the rat mouse chimera, where you could perform either a kidney transplant or a pan whole pancreas transplant. And what I might anticipate is that you would get hyperacute rejection against the stromal elements, the endothelial elements, and the like. And if that's the current state, that we can transfer tissues, but the whole organ has that limitation. How are you thinking about sort of bypassing that next challenge? Yes, uh, I consider this, uh, you know, uh, PDX and knockout system as a sort of prototype process complementation. And uh, now we have done uh, the vessels and hematopoietic system knockouts by like FLK1 gene. And we were able to complement by the same principle with the iPS derived cells. And now we have a pig, though not published yet, uh, double knockouts for the both uh, vessels and PDX1. So uh, we are now doing a you know, complementation study. So uh, if, it, if it works, it should work, I think. So all the hematopoietic cells and endothelial cells and you know pancreatic proper cells they're all ips derived so this should you know further reduce the chance of uh, you know uh, immunological rejection so the same principle so uh, if you want to further uh, change the say uh, intercellular cells then you can knock out some other gene so uh, the principle is the same uh, if you want to you know uh, get rid of all the cells from the host i think there's a way to do that You're pushing the issue then. I mean, there are stromal elements, there are neural elements. Uh, I mean, how far do you have to go before you're actually chimerizing the entire <laughs> or, uh, we, organism? We, and, we may, yeah. and, what's, and what's plausible? I mean, I, I, have you actually done the, 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 the transplants of the chimeric rat or mouse organ back into the, into the host? Because that might teach you something about what's the, the, the limit of rejection. Right, yeah. that's. Uh, one of the you know experiments we would actually do, but you know it's too small to do the whole organ transplant like pancreas. So it's difficult. So you know, that's why we are mo the kidney is yeah it's a little difficult though. <laughs> I, I have done that. So we are moving toward uh, uh, you know pig system, large animal system, rats and pigs to do that type of experiment. So eventually we will. Uh, get the results. But, you know, I think the major issue is still a, whether we can make interspecific chimeras between human and pigs. I have a sort of general question. Um, 
Have, have any of you transplanted human cells into the morula at a stage that you think it's a, essentially a morula, so a naive type cell, and then allowed it to grow enough cells survive that you've actually sorted out your green cells, so you have a GFP positive cell, sort those cells out and then plate them in cultures so that they, you can determine if the cells have advanced enough so that they can propagate, say, as a, at a progenitor stage, and that they clearly are different and done some sort of RNA-seq to show that they've progressed to that later. Have you ever gotten enough cells to be able to do that? Just w just one stage further from... I saw that. broaden out that question a little bit, uh, uh, because yeah. I think that is a general issue with, with these uh, chimeras yeah. that we've seen is, is really how well, how, how convinced are you that you have really got fully functional cells in those chimeras? Can I mean, Jakob's data, not Jakob's sure data on the Clara-1 positive cells was the first time I've actually seen really yes. compelling yes, I, I, I agree. Uh, tissue markers. Yeah. Uh, Jakob, you want to address uh, that? Exactly, that's, uh, you know, we've, we've moved into a stage where, like, okay, we know these are human cells and we think where they're going and definitely characterizing them. And uh, the staining of, of the lung is just, for some reason, we see a tendency for our experiments for lung integration. And that's why we're trying to, so we see some of them in histology and literally the single cell RNA-seq are running this week. Uh, and that's exactly because we just want to know and, and look at the mouse and the human, or even exclusion pheno phenomenon like cell fusion, right? Because you can tell the, uh, um, and, and that is one. Uh, regarding the, um, uh, the trying to explain uh, some of the cells, we've been trying to do that for um, the hematopoietic lineage because you can get amplification by coliformation with the human cell, but actually we fail. We don't see in our chimeras any any hematopoietic contribution. Uh, unlike where the lung we can expand, but that's that's where we are there. Maybe uh, uh, one comment from my experiment. Uh, I think uh, for for George's question, tissue or organ transplantation is a very important question for. Cameric, uh, the research. In my uh, opinion, maybe the only organ transplantation created for, by the Cameric it should be the tetrapolyte comprehension. It's, uh, we have a, a paper already accepted, I, I forgot which journal, but uh, <laughs> we create uh, different organ by the, not interspecies, just uh, mouse work by the tetraploid comprehension development, the heart transplantation to another, uh, another animal, at least the heart can be survived more than one week. But uh, for us, all the other chimeric uh, work, what we got, we, I think we can call it a uh, mixture. mixture. It uh, should be a tissue. We have to harvest, uh, we try harvest the, the cell and try to do the tissue or cell transplantation. Recently, we also, an, another paper already accepted by cell, we try to increase the efficiency of uh, create uh, chimeric, uh, the chimeric, the embryo. We, we call it a super or maybe double chimeric. First, we create a hybrid stem cell between the mouse and the, and the right you know we have uh, both the species uh, hyploid stem cell. We try to fuse the different uh, stem cell and then try to make a camera among uh, animal. Its uh, efficiency should be high, but uh, this paper is the only focus on the fundamental part. We're talking about uh, in inactive of X, X chromosome. It's not randomly uh, inactive, but another proposal when we haven't mentioned in this paper is increase the efficiency, create uh, the uh, uh, chimeric uh, embryo, embryo or animal. So maybe for your question, by this chimeric interspecies, maybe most of the what we got is a tissue. It's not uh, organ from another, totally from another, the donor species. I, it's my opinion. It's a problem for, for future. Yeah.
so can I ask, yeah, we're sort of in the sort of negative mode here, we're getting uh, low level contributions, uh, we're talking about real differences between the species. So let me ask my colleagues who are doing these experiments, I'm going to, I'm going to turn to Juan Carlos. So, so, so what do you see as the immediate uh, uh, scientific questions that can be and should be addressed using interspecies chimeras? That's a difficult question to answer. I am going to tell you my personal opinion of, of where I think we should focus our attention. I think this, this idea of generating organs, functional organs, is a dream that is far away. We have spent millions in trying to generate in vitro functional cells, and there is not a single product. And the main reason is the niche. The Petri dish doesn't produce the right niche. So we are thinking here, let's have a host animal that produces the niche. And the way we're doing this is trial and error. Let's put this cell that I got here lately and see how it works. And we could spend many years trying to see if that works or not. I think we should go back to fundamental biology. And besides the ability of the cells that we have, the human cells today, to colonize or not another species, there are basic problems that still we know very little. And I try to mention this at the end of my talk. How cells compete with one another. This is a very interesting field that has been out there for the last 30 years in the field of fly development. And we know very little about the molecular network that make one cell compete with the other. Um, the, the, origin, the architecture of our genome and the other species. We have very conserved elements, enhanced elements, but just the spacing of these elements is very different between the species. And that's what makes variation. And what works in the pig may be different in the human. Getting a, a human beta cell in the pig, and as, as you showed here, in the end is the blastocyst, the host that determines the size and probably will determine the function. And I wonder whether that beta cell will be functional in a human being and is not just a beta cell that is in the context of the mouse and is just specific for the mouse. And your experiment with the size indicate that that may be the case. We have problems like the immune problems that we still need to solve. We have this timing, heterochronicity, heterochrony of, of development that is out there. And, and the animal like the pig that developed in three months and a human in nine months, that's a huge difference to make a functional organ. So I feel there are many, many issues that we need to solve first before even thinking that we're going to get a functional tissue in another organ. So if we don't go back to basic biology and to this basic question, in my own opinion, we are cheating ourselves and we will not be really accomplishing any other thing than just trying and seeing what's happening but without knowledge. And Kathy at the beginning of the talk mentioned we need to minimize the bad and maximize the good in this approach but we cannot do this without knowledge. And we, at this stage, I think we need basic science knowledge before we can address the dream that we are trying to accomplish. And it's a very personal opinion. Response. I agree, Juan Carlos, with you entirely. I think we, we need to go back and, and, and we need to look at the, the basic mechanisms of, in which you know, these cells develop. And so Rusty pointed, you know, asked the question about, you know, has anybody done the experiment where, you know, you can introduce these cells and then uh, look at their transcripts afterwards? I, I think that's fundamental. That's things that we've been considering, too, to, to understand what the RNA transcript is at that very early age of development and to see what the differences are. Compare. A, a, a poor science, you know, uh, labeled stem cell in, into a, a pig blast, and then look at you know what's happening in terms of the competition, and then see if similar mechanisms are occurring 
you know, when you introduce a, a human stem cell? And if not, you know, what are the, what are the differences in the, the gene networks that are involved here, and what do we need to do in order to to change those those gene networks? So there are, I think, many many basic issues that that need to be you know addressed in order for this field to move forward. Um, I just wanted to say that. Uh, uh, Two things to keep in mind that we, there's a lot for us to know about what's happening in chimerism in larger animals and also working on, uh, as I said, making the cells more competitive and so on. So definitely, you know, the mouse for, you know, is very far, pig and monkey is going to get relevant. Uh, so that's always something to keep in mind. That's why we, we just want to know what are the limits and what each system is good for and not good for exactly. And the second part, uh, just going back to the, you know, let's say a scenario in pigs, you can make a pancreas. We may, you know, in theory, and we may not be able to transplant it to the mesenchyme, but def definitely for some testings or disease modeling, this is relevant. Uh, just to give an example, the nice work from uh, Doug Melton and Joe Zhao on uh, the change of lineages in, in the pancreas in the mouse. Uh, and if you have if you ever want to do that with a mouse pancreas, if you can have a mouse pancreas in a pig and work on these conversion, again, just one example of things we may be able to do, and we don't know yet. I guess I would, I would also just like to, 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 to echo the sort of need for the basic biology and just to sort of remember some of the issues that George talked about with what we know about just making interspecies chimeras in the past across different rodent species. And one of the, the things that I noted is that, that a number of the researchers, when you were making chimeras, you were putting them back into the morula versus the blastocyst. And uh, some of the issues where you may be seeing immune rejection could be overcome if you actually went into the blastocyst because you really do need to match the trophoblast to the uterus, and that's going to help protect uh, the, in the cells that are inside the inner cell mass. So that's a kind of practical issue. Um, and uh, some, it, you know, it's, it's easy, it seems like a good idea to put them with the morula, but these cells really should probably be put in the, in the blastocyst. Now, if you're lucky, when you put them with the morula, they'll, they'll go inside anyway. Um, but that's another sort of one of the, the contribution, one of the issues to, to bear in mind. Um, but, you know, when you look across uh, interspecies chimeras that have been made to date, you really can't go very far and get very even contributions. So it's not surprising that we don't get the even contributions when you go further afield between the human and whatever species you want to, to look at. And so I guess I, I would just like to uh, challenge people then a little bit to say, given that, and given that probably is a fundamental um, what are the things that you would try to do to make your human cells be able to contribute in a more competitive manner in a chimera? So what, what, what tricks are you thinking about as you move forward to get from the low contributions today to the kind of contributions that you might hope to see if you want to go, first of all, to test the, the functionality of the cells, but also to make tissues and organs. Any good ideas, good tricks? Mm. I go back to the idea of cell competition. It is known in flies. You can endow a cell with certain characteristics, like overexpression of meat, and then that cell will be able to colonize better the surrounding field. I would like to stress the point of Rudolf matching it is in our experiences if the, the the matching stage of the host and donor are not right probably this will never work and then having other species and i would like to stress for instance the chick because it's a relatively easy host that you can use technically you mentioned the technical problems you are having with the mouse where you can deal with these issues of matching a little bit better than, than in the mouse. And there are technologies like gene editing as well in the chip as in the mouse. So three, three ideas there. Yeah. I also agree with that, you know, uh, the, uh, for making chimeras, I think there's a window for both the host side and also the 
I don't have pretty potent stem cell size. So the window could be narrow, and the window could be different uh, depending on the species. So by manipulating, well, somehow by, you know, increasing the window size, we may be able to make uh, chimeras uh, between, uh, you know, uh, xenogenic interspecific uh, different species. Also, of course, you know, the open niche is one approach, of course. Uh, we have data that uh, even very low uh, chimerism, but if the niche is open, then we can generate that organ. So that helps. So that's one uh, approach. And uh, of course, the, you know, this is a new area, so new field. So we need to get more data by generating more, in, you know, interspecies chimeras. Then we should have a little bit of idea why. What is the xenogenic barriers are, and then we may find a way to get over this barrier, hopefully. Um, I just uh, want to point, uh, although you said uh, there's discussions about naive and what is naive, and, and definitely uh, naive cells do have some properties for enhanced chimerism, but I'm always very cautious of two things, just saying that uh, you know, the, the, typically the, it's not like, it could, I wouldn't say naive cells make chimeras because they have more developmental potential. We don't know that. It could be just a technical thing based on e-cadherin, and so we should be very careful. And, and one other thing that we see, uh, you know, a lot of when we talk about naive cells, for example, you look at uh, some conditions that are very good to give uh, a very nice gene expression profile, but the cells are proliferating so slow that actually, and their apoptosis is so high, once you inject them, um, they just do not survive. So that there's just definitely there's a technical aspect uh, and, and a lot of what we do, and it's a, a trial and error a little bit, and just thinking. Uh, and the other thing, which is something we learn from you, is you know if we want the cells to survive, for example, we use a rock inhibitor. But if we keep rock inhibitor too long, it um, disturbs the trophoblast. And <laughs> for me, so there are games there, and uh, and, and we keep learning. I can address that from the sort of classic chimera studies, and they can address it from the current uh, stem cell in the interspecies. But, but it's worth going back to the classic chimeras on this because we know there that uh, you start off, you can start off with you know even numbers yeah. of cells, but you can end up with a, a mouse that has quite variable contributions, and the contributions may vary tissue to tissue because there can be different uh, levels of competition between, uh, t between cells in different tissues. And if you cross strains, then you have certain strains that are better at contributing to, to one tissue okay. versus another. So the, the element of competition is there even when you're within, within a species. So, now so it's really not well understood. No, but there is increasing uh, focus, scientific focus on it, as uh, Ancolo said. So people are beginning to look at what uh, pathways are involved in cell competition. Uh, and that is relevant, I think, to making better chimeras. Uh, I just say that the, we don't have data. That's exactly the, the experiment we're trying to go. And definitely we see, you know, without competition, that the more we go, um, the, 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 the lower the integration is. And the, other, the opposite, actually, we see many times GFP high levels of embryos that are absorbed. Um, but and the notion of competition, as I said, it's just been rediscovered in mammalians, but we should keep in mind that also it seems to be tissue restricted. For example, it's at the post-implantation epiplast in the blood and maybe the heart, but not in the neuroprogenitors and so on. So it might be cell-specific, it might be... So, it's a, and so we don't even know it in, 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 in mice. It's definitely interesting and on the radar, um, early days, very early days. So I think the rationale for trying to make organs, human organs for transplantation has been made by, by everyone. But it seems like we're a long way away from that. And then we've come to the conclusion that there are 
basic questions that need to be addressed before we're going to get there that are some of which we don't really even understand what the questions are yet. How important is it to be doing this with human cells now? And can the basic questions that are being addressed be addressed using other species? Or, or, is it really, or do we really need to do the human cells in order to understand how to get there? So I think that's part of the question on the table right now is, what, is this a requirement and what is the case for that to use the human cells? Do you want to add on to that? I'd yeah. yeah, I want to expand on this because I think that's a really important point. So when we want to study human diseases, and I'm talking about basic research, then we want to understand the, the, the initiation of the disease, the progression, and the manifestation. So how can we do that? We can do this in transgenic mice, and it works perfect, except it doesn't work for many diseases. HPRT, knockout was the very first one where there was no phenotype in the, in the mouse. So we can do this, not in, in many, many, particularly these neurodegenerative diseases, we, the most models are not satisfying often. And we don't know the genes, particularly for sporadic disease, we don't know them. So we have to work with human cells. So people do, of course, xenotransplantation. <clears throat> but in those cases, you always have end stage cells. For cancer, you, can't, you can only look at the end stage. So you can't look at the <clears throat> beginning and the progression, all these things you want to understand. So I believe this is, for me, is the most important justification to make human, animal, human mouse chimeras. If you can do it, and even if the contribution is low, you could, if it's particularly with a cell autonomous disease, you could look at an IPS, patient-derived IPS cell in the brain, in the, wherever, in the pancreas, or even in diabetes one, where you have interaction between T cells and and beta cells, you could set up these systems and study you now disease with the relevant cells in a in vivo environment, still the most environment, but you can, you can adjust the most environment. You can use mutations to make it more um, relevant. And I can go into this. For cell, for cell non-autonomous diseases, you can generate this environment. So I believe, to me at least, this is one of the most important justifications is is really research and understanding human diseases with the right and relevant cells. Yeah. I since we're not addressing the panel, <laughs> we're addressing each other. <laughs> but my, my question was not that. My question was for making organs for transplantation not for using human cells to model disease. I was asking the panel. <laughs> so, let's, so let's take... Isn't it different? I think it's a different yes, question. Let's take them separately. So, so first of all, uh, if we want to go down the path of really generating organs, if that's the, the long-term goal, or uh, are we, do we need to use human cells, or could we presumably use non-human primate cells? Is that what you're thinking about, or...? It's not a criticism. I'm just a, no, I want to hear question. the argument. I want yeah, to hear yeah. the argument so, for so it. I'm going to pass that one over to, to yeah. you. To maybe, I can start. <laughs> maybe I can start from Rusty's uh, questions. Because I understand well your question. I, I totally agree with you. It's still a long way to go. That, but uh, in my opinion, um, you, maybe you already know, I never made the experiment to introduce human stem cell into any other species, except for the cell therapy preclinical trial in the animal model. But we de did a lot of work with uh, monkey cell. It's a fundamental question. It's a challenging. We can use monkey stem cell as a, as a good cellular model instead of human, I think. Even we create, such as uh, create a monkey pancreas in, in knockout pig, we have to test it for the function. We need to trans back to monkey. We still have, a, we already have the team can perform very good surgery in monkey. That's why I, I think it's the last question of this panel. Is it possible, which one is the best model to be used? 
can instead of human stem cell. I, at present, I think that human primate is very important. I mean, I, at least for me, my opinion, I needn't use human stem cell. You know I have a very huge human stem cell bank, but we never perform the experiment because of I can use monkey stem cell to answer the question. But combined with the root of the question, I, I think it's very important. Why we need primate work in this uh, research, such kind of camera research? We all have a very good expertise between mouse or right, but it means not means uh, we can really solve the problem between the primate and the, and the rodents. Because one, one thing, we, we publish the paper, but uh, the monkey, we create a double knockout monkey P53. Now the monkey already two years old. It's uh, the phenotype the function is totally different from the knockout P50, P53 mouse. So we are still waiting for the monkey is it possible to see some phenotype? It means between the, the berry, between primate and the rodent, like mouse and the, and the right, it's <coughs> different. We have to use primate as a model to explore what we are interested in. So if we go back to the question of this panel, I think we, at present, maybe, one of the choice is to use monkey cell instead of human cell into another species, create, not ma no matter it's a tissue or organ. It's easier to test for fundamental question and very, very practical questions, xenotransplantation. And another reason we have to use monkeys, we, we have all the data it's, uh, for the same gene in mouse, in right, in monkey and human. The important gene related pre implantation <coughs> development. The gene expression, the level is totally different. Maybe two times, maybe 10 times difference. And the, even talking about the gene involved in such activities, the number of genes and the, the variation is huge. From monkey to human, to from monkey to mouse, the variation of gene expression is, is huge. That's why we are with you. It's a long way to go. We have to answer the fundamental question first. What is important for such kind of chimeric development? It's, uh, at the beginning, we think it's quite easier for us to create some monkey organ or tissue in pig or in other species. And we can trans bike, make a general transplantation very early, very easier. But, uh, Finally, up to now, we, we got nothing to transplant. Yeah. So, what, so what I'm hearing you, on, on you saying there is that, that if you're going for the organ route, despite the, the blockages that we have to date, you're thinking that the primate cells into a pig would allow you then, if you made the organ, you'd be able to test the, the transplantability into a pig, uh, into a monkey, sorry. Uh, and I think that's an important issue. But if we can go back to Rudolf's uh, point, then what he, he's really addressing a different issue, a different possibility by using the uh, human iPS cells, patient-derived, disease-derived, putting those into a chimera, whether it's a, a mouse, which is certainly the easiest. And I'm not sure we saw any better or worse contributions in the, in the mouse than we saw in other, other systems, um, that whether you, that would in itself be a very useful tool to, to complement what we can do now with human ES cells, iPS cells in culture to study disease, but be able to also study the, the consequences of that disease in the developing organ. Um, and does anybody want to comment on that? I think, yeah. I Totally agree. I'd like to add also the idea of screening, toxicity. This is very important. We are thinking, yes, organ for transplantation, but these technologies allow us perhaps to have some cells in another animal in an in vivo situation where you can test uh, specific compounds, test, test them for toxicity, something that perhaps in the in vitro is not reliable as we think it is. So combined with 
with these two points as well. I just want to combine uh, the, the, for the two questions. Uh, definitely, I would have a complementary approach. We're using the primates uh, for many interesting questions. It's just as a model also with the P53, why it's not having an effect. Recently, elephants have many P53 and so on. But uh, and and there might be some advantage when with uh, with using primates and and for transplantation. But I would very much caution against building a systematic model where you would force researchers force first go to primate and then do your human experiment. Because for many cases, the answer is uh, if you get a negative result with the primate, it still doesn't tell you anything because you have, still have to do it with the human. So for many cases, I would very much advocate for going straightly exactly with the human cells because they're relevant. Uh, and, and, and what we get with primate doesn't guarantee that it's the same in humans because there are also not, other primates are not the same. So definitely humans should be very highly prioritized. Because, uh, you know, use of human uh, cells is prohibited in Japan, uh, we, you know, searched for the possibility of using monkey cells instead. But, you know, we worked on marmosets and also uh, macaque cells. But we found out they're quite different, the prepotent stem cells. Uh, they don't look like humans. So there, there are differences. So we are moving toward uh, chimp and bonobos, more closer species of non-human primates. So I think we can do many of the studies using those primates. But, you know, we have an advantage uh, with human cells because we have many, many iPS cells and also reagents and information in the genome. So unless there's a very strong contraindication to use human cells, I think uh, we, you know, also the Rudy's uh, comment, you know, we ultimate goal is to understand human diseases, to treat human uh, diseases. So, uh, again, if there's a very strong contraindication to use human cells, I think we should be able to, you know, study, work on, uh, you know, hu human uh, animal chimeras as well. Can I just ask uh, Jakob to comment a little bit? Uh, you talked about post-implantation uh, cultures as a system. I think that's probably one of these things. I can't see the questions anymore. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, technical barriers, no, it's not there. But the issue of, uh, and we're going to hear obviously later today, we're going to hear particularly in the nervous system that you, know, you can introduce cells later into the embryo than into the pre-implantation stages and get more directed contribution to the tissues that you're interested in. Um, and uh, it, there are lots of opportunities to do that. Um, we talked about potentially introducing cells into, in, into the embryo and the uterus. We're going to hear, I think, from Rudolph on, uh, hope, on that on the neural crest this afternoon. So the, the opportunity to grow embryos in culture, study their contributions, the opportunity to introduce cells directly into the mouse fetus or indeed a pig or any other species and get more restricted contribution to the tissue you're interested in. Uh, how do we compare and contrast the ability potentially in the early embryo to, to contribute to all tissues versus the ability to sort of focus in in more directed manners? Do, do you want to comment on your culture system? Um. I mean, technically, it's not just the idea. I mean, we're trying in the mouse, trying and others, you know, try to cover as much as possible parts because we want suddenly to have more accessible look what the cells are doing rather than just put in the uterus and they have, you know, five-day black window. But, but I don't view this, it's hard for me to view this as a replacement for, uh, for uh, you know, where, where you inject and let the embryo develop because a lot of these cases, the injections are localized. You cannot put the embryo... Um, the embryo back to the uterus. And also the, these ex vivo embryos are, are also not, uh, they're limited. Uh, for example, you have heart edema at E11. So th they're definitely not, again, not a replacement. I think they are complementary, they're, they're useful, and they have benefits even you know, generally in developmental biology without uh, But uh, I caution would say that I don't think they replace. Um, uh, the, I would more, I think more of restriction is if, if one has to, and I actually, based on what I see in the mouse, I do not think so. I would think more of a genetic mean, if, if one has. Well, I, 
remember, remember very well my first paper on developmental biology was to put mouse cells that were predetermined to become a limb into a chick embryo at the particular matching stage of that. And from those, those experiments, and I think comparing it to Hero's experiment, basically, if you want to get an organ, you will never be able to get a full organ. But if you want to get a beta cell, this experiment could be very useful as well, because we were seeing a clear a chimericing between the two animals in the case of the limb where we could get a specific cell types just coming from the mouse and not the chick. So I think it depends on the final goal. I think both, both uh, strategies are very valid. Certainly we want to get the entire organ from the donor that will not work, but I will not discard it. That will be very useful for particular cell types. One, one more thing I'd actually mention is, you know, the people at Harvard, they're trying to make humanize pigs. So those pigs with many hu humanized uh, molecules, they may be a good uh, host for the process complementation to, uh, you know, to make tissues, cells, organs. That's humanized uh, pigs, uh, they're trying to replace uh, antigenic uh, molecules when they are transplanted into human uh, or replace it to human uh, equivalent counterpart. So those uh, pigs may be uh, you know, a good uh, host to make human uh, pig chimeras because part of the molecules are human. <laughs> Any other issues from the floor? Steve. Back to the um, technical barriers issues. So, so I'm trying to operationalize it uh, from the standpoint of uh, the competition and matching and what, what, what does that mean in practice. So, so everything I've heard, uh, all these models are fundamentally, in terms of very early commerism, are fundamentally heterochronic in, in that even if it's a pluripotential cell into whether it's Murilla or, or Blastula in, in the setting of Blastula complementation, fundamentally what, what matters is what happens after that in terms of the differential, everything from cell cycle kinetics to, to, to tissue specific integration that's occurring as, as that now chimeric organism is, is developing. And so of course many of the species that have been discussed uh, are, are so mismatched in terms of gestational age and uh, differentiation uh, rate and acceleration on an organ-specific basis. That, that, and uh, and, and I'm, uh, I'm curious, I haven't heard anything about either gestational age matching, you know, to grafting from, to like gestational uh, ages and, and species that, that have similar gestational periods. Um, and also I haven't heard anything about the, the uh, what must be fundamental, the dose dependence in ter terms of the donor cells into host and how that might be limiting. Uh, so, so, comments? I would just point out that when you make the rat mouse chimeras, they are very similar in gestational age and you do get chimerism, but it still has restrictions. So there are still, you know, even small timing differences can make, can make a big difference in the final outcome. Um, others? Just what we were commenting in on the bus, we see that depending on the number of cells, of human cells, and it goes to your point that you put into the blastocyst of the pig, the pregnancy will be very different, the pregnancy outcome. So to test, just to testify the importance of your comments, which is you put two cells and the embryo will develop, you put eight cells and the embryo or 10 cells will not develop. And that just says about the heterochrony and the dose of the cells you are putting in there. So this is basic question, and I go back to, to my point that we really don't know and we need to dig further before we can even think how this will develop. And so I totally agree with you. It's un unknown that they need to work on them. 
So, so, so that's a very good point because I think we have injected, as I mentioned in our talk, 10 cells into, into the blasts. And, and our, our litters are actually quite good. We get about, you know, uh, with our chimeras, maybe uh, the iPS cells, you know, five. Uh, uh, you know, fetuses with a um, cord blood stem cells, about eight. But we put in about 70, we transfer 70 blastocysts in order to get about eight to, to 10. And so, uh, and so we were wondering, you know, why do we have this difference between 10 cells and, and, and three cells for you where that seemed to be optimal? And when you go up to 10, it, it's, it's not, you know, quite as good as this three cells. So, Again, there's a lot that needs to be, you know, understood about, you know, these these differences. I, guess I would also just point out that uh, even in the mouse, so some of that can be quality of the cell lines, because even in the mouse, uh, if you try to make chimeras or tetraploid complementations and your cell lines are not in the you know, ideal, you will get resolving embryos. As you start to increase the contribution, the, the embryo cannot deal with it. So. So again, I think still a, 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 an important issue here is the quality of the starting cell lines uh, and you know, the, the naivety, the properties of those cell lines, which is still very variable across different systems. And so there's some fundamental work still, I believe, in, in making sure that we have the appropriate stem cell lines to do these experiments. In fact, you know, to follow up on the point, some of our initial studies with the human IPS cells, the, the cells were quite blebby, and, uh, and so we finally, you know, had to figure out a, a more gentle way to sort of lift these cells off, and then, and then our selection process, we, we chose those that, you know, that, that looked healthier without the blebs, and that, and that resulted in a, a much greater uh, you know, success rate. Just to add uh, on some other compatibility that is perhaps underappreciated is also differences in extra embryonic tissue development, definitely in the case of the mouse and the human. And, and, and they're talking about tricks uh, of, of, for example, one of the things we're trying to compensate for that is to try to make uh, something in, in mouse called diapose, where you actually can give dexamethasone one of the protocols and the blastocyst that the mouse will stop developing for up to a week and can implant. So by injecting the human cells, we're giving them a bit more time. So we're interested, seeing interesting results, and we think maybe that's having to do with some extra embryonic contribution as well. Again, we ideas and then follow up. So I'm trying to under, make sure that I've understood correctly something. Um, I hope something. If I am concerned in putting human stem cells into a non-human animal that they may differentiate and integrate into a particular organ that I don't want them to, such as, for example, brains or gonads, it sounds to me as if I've heard two possible approaches to that. One is to have the host animal be deficit in a particular organ which the stem cells will then disproportionately move into, the, the apancreatic pig, for example. And another is to try to genetically manipulate the human stem cells so that they cannot become part of the organ you're concerned about. Is that fair? Is, am I right about those two, and is there something else that I didn't hear? I think uh, you need to know that even if there's a pancreatic organ niche, uh, if you inject pluripotent stem cells into the blast cyst, uh, the cells, not just pancreas, but the entire tissues and organs from these pluripotent stem cell derived cells. So uh, that doesn't uh, prevent the differentiation of human cells into gonads or brain. So the, the one other uh, possibility is to inject progenitor cells, committed progenitor cells, so that they can only you know, differentiate toward certain organs or tissues. Okay. But, you know, usually uh, injection of those progenitor cells in blood cyst uh, do not do anything. They cannot make chimeras. So uh, we have to inject those progenitors into the, uh, the embryos in the right place, right time, which is technically difficult. But it's a theoretical possibility. So use of... Uh, committed progenitors instead of pluripotent stem cells and inject them, those progenitors, to the, the, the uh, 
uh, embryos. Can I just extend on that question that Hank asked? I mean, how much have you evaluated the chimerism of the two tissues that we have identified through these structures of oversight as being sensitive? I mean, how much germ lineage chimerism is there? How much CNS chimerism is there? Is there so much biological implausibility of significant chimerism that we should, we should stop worrying about it? Or tell me otherwise. Yeah, th that was uh, what I just about to say exactly. That uh, well, does, for, we're not seeing any germline contribution, uh, but so far. But you could say what's going to happen in larger animals. So I want to raise two points. I think in the germ cell, um, I think the concern, and if one wants to run a hypothetical scenario and so on, you could just simply, if you have a contribution, not allow mating these animals, and that puts an end. Which, is part of, which puts an end to it. And the second part, perhaps less relevant, I think as uh, we were taught in medical school, until the mid-90s, human sperm was being used to fertilize, to check for fertility on bovine eggs and hamster eggs. And it could just fertilize and dispose the embryos. It just penetrates. It's, it's not going to work. It doesn't going to make an embryo. There's no fertile. But it's, it's not a, I don't think it's such a big issue. So we've thought about this for, for the brain and contribution to, to neural structures. And although you know, we try to be informed by what we find in, in the development of, of the mouse in terms of you know, whether if we knock out a, a gene and whether that affects brain and whether if we knock that out in our compensation studies, whether that will allow result in contribution to the brain. I think there are many genes that, that are still unknown. And so the the approach that we are taking at Minnesota is that uh, whenever we're doing these, these complementation studies and knocking out uh, a gene to target a particular organ, we will, we will not let these, these uh, fetuses grow uh, to term, and that we will study their brains first to see whether there's any uh, contribution by human stem cells to, to the neural structure. So that's one way to kind of, you know, uh, at least uh, uh, in, interrogate, you know, what these cells do. I just wanted to add to your question that in addition to these two points you said to control the randomness of the chimerism, it's the timing and localization of where you put the cells. And this afternoon there will be other examples where you can, instead of going that early, you go a little bit later, and that will somehow help avoiding cells going somewhere else. That's what is in this afternoon session. I guess my comment back on that, though, is that while we're focused on pre-implantation chimeras, you are not controlling the, the ability to localize those cells. If they were pluripotent, they would contribute everywhere, in, including uh, the brain. Uh, I think the plausibility of germline contribution is probably the, the lowest. Because again, even in the mouse system, you know, getting good cells that make germline is the is the toughest thing to do. So it's probably not pretty implausible that you'll get germline contribution. But the the neural contribution is something that that should occur if you have truly pluripotent cells. And indeed, you're trying to achieve uh, neural contribution in those cells. So that's uh, an area to think about. Uh, I like the concept of of pushing cells towards a particular germ layer that uh, Hero described. So there's two ways of going at it, right? You, do, you take your cells that are pluripotent, get them integrated, and then you, you induce the, at the right time a gene that will push them into the appropriate lineage, and that's a good way. And I like that because it's positive, because the negative way is to say, let's make a knockout or a diphtheria toxin um, a gene expression system that would pr knock out the cells as they begin to go down a pathway. And I think that, that, I mean, that's basically what you're doing when you're making a niche, but now you're trying to make another niche um, that you don't want to fill. So it's doable, um, but I actually like the, germ, the idea of trying to restrict the cells in a, in a progressive manner through development. So I think all of those are, are technically uh, feasible um, and you know, can be brought, uh, built into the systems as people start to move them forward into better chimeras. Uh, okay. Other issues, questions from the audience? Are there things we have not covered that we should have covered? 
I think we've done a pretty good job at uh, exploring the status of where things are today. We have had excellent contributions from the, the, the panel members who between them do represent not all the activity in this area by any means, but certainly a pretty broad range. Um, in terms of other kinds of experiments that I know are going on, people are introducing uh, human ES cells into early post-implantation embryos and studying their contributions. Um, and certainly in that case, you can also demonstrate pluripotency. So I think this question of using chimeras to address are stem cells pluripotent is not the issue anymore. The issue is, is this assay a useful one to understand fundamental properties of the stem cells, to use them to, st to develop, develop better disease models, and to really move forward to generating humanized uh, models and humanized tissues and organs. Uh, and I think, although it's very early days, you've heard enough to suggest that this is not out of the question and that by understanding the fundamental um, behavior and the properties of the stem cells, of their interactions with the embryo, of what drives cell competition, what, what causes cells to, uh, to compete and, and take over tissues, we are seeing uh, some fundamental biology that's going to help inform how we can use this system to make useful, useful chimeras in the future. So if we look at these questions, scientific questions I think we've discussed, uh, advances we've heard, uh, they're, they're small advances when we go human to uh, spe interspecies chimeras, but we've heard some very large advances and clear proof of principle when we look at uh, interspecies chimeras between rat and mouse and even in the pig and beginning in, in the monkey. Um, technical barriers, we've heard a lot of the technical barriers. And the question is, can they be overcome, or are some of them fundamental barriers that will remain? And to a degree, I think that remains to be seen. Use of uh, cells from non-human primates. Uh, instead of, or prior to, uh, the general consensus I'm hearing is in parallel with, uh, is because there are advantages for the primate system, but the primate is not human. Uh, if anything, we've learned from all this interspecies discussion uh, is that you know, every species has similarities, but there are differences. And in the end, if we're moving to human disease models or human therapy, we are going to be wanting to see uh, how the human cells behave, and the comparisons are, are really very important and informative. So that's it, and it's 11.30. Okay. On behalf of the um, workshop panelists, thank you to all of you who presented this morning and um, provide a very lively discussion. We are right on time, so I think we'll take a short break, about a half hour for lunch. So if we can start to begin our second session, which will be chaired by um, Dr. Fred slash Rusty Gage, um, who's the Adler Professor in the Laboratory of Genetics at the Salk Institute for Biological <laughs> Studies. He's also the former president of the Society for Neuroscience. Thank you very much. Um, this session two is, is entitled Introducing Human Neural Stem Cells or Progenitor Cells into Non-Human Vertebrate uh, Animal Embryos or Fetuses, but I've modified it to include adult animals because some of this work will be also introducing it into adult animals as well. I have a few introductory slides and, and like to point out that reinforce what George said about uh, chimerism. There is the chimerism that we were talking about earlier today, which is animal <coughs> chimeras are produced by a merger of uh, multiple uh, fertilized eggs. Another way that chimerism can occur in animals is by organ or cell transplantation, giving one individual tissues that develop in, from two genomes, for example, bone marrow transplant or uh, cell transplantation that, that you'll hear about uh, today. Uh, these human cells are essential in many ways for, the, for a variety of questions that need to be addressed, and uh, fundamental questions about genetic compatibility, issues related to development, uh, certainly studying the causes of human disease, and then as was stated also, issues or using these uh, processes and uh, animals for safety and toxicity testing, as well as testing out human uh, treatments for disease are all uh, 
applications of, of human chimera research, including organ tissue research. The special case of the brain, um, the, and the reason it's uh, highlighted here, I think, in the second uh, session, is that in vivo brain uh, invasive investigation is very difficult and rare. Uh, some cases of studying the human brain under, uh, during surgical operations gives access to the brain, but in most cases it's difficult to study directly uh, cellular tissues. And also another important feature about the brain is the connectivity and the importance of it, its function is dependent upon the interconnections between uh, neurons. I think another key issue that is brought up around the brain is, it, is an organ that we use for cognition. It's thought to uh, embody our uniqueness and that which gives us humanness. <clears throat> and of course, uh, one of the questions that uh, arises in studying these, uh, make, doing these studies is how many human cells in a non-human brain would make an animal behave like a human or have some human properties. And might as well put these on the table as the kinds of issues that we need to think about. So these will be some of the issues that our speakers will address. <clears throat> and the first speaker today is uh, uh, Dr. Rudolf Yenish from MIT and the Whitehead Institute. Okay, so um, I would like to talk about uh, following up to the first discussion um, in this morning to um, later stages. And um, so I think we can make, obviously, um, chimeras at two stages, either what we talked this morning about at the pre stage or at the later stage, when we can induce committed stem cells into the embryo at a given state and generate then chimeras where the chimerism would be in, some, in a restricted number of tissues. So just briefly coming back to the ES cell, IPS cell chimeras, clearly we talked about this. It's a, key issues which we have to resolve, and I want to go into this, but I want to just say in our hands, it is extremely inefficient. So we use three types of donor cells, naive cells made in my lab, we used modified cells which grow a little bit better, and we used also the one from HANA lab, and using a DNA assay on 1,500 embryos, which detects easily, it's on, based on mitochondrial, human mitochondrial DNA, we find one to maybe 1.5% of the embryos have in general one cell per 10,000, um, uh, 10 and most cells, maybe up to five cells in some. So it's, in our hands, extremely inefficient. So I want to talk about um, this stage um, to do it with committed cells. And so, of course, we have various um, precedents for this, bone marrow chimeras, and what we hear later in this session, um, neural glia precursors into the prenatal or postnatal mouse brain. So I want to talk about neural crest cells. So neural crest cells are a particularly, um, um, a particularly interesting um, um, uh, um, population of cells. They arise at the, um, 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 at the um, edge between the neural, um, the, the epidermis and the um, uh, neural plate, and they migrate over long distances. They migrate in a dorsolateral way and give rise to all pigment cells of the body and in a ventral way where they give rise to the sensory and autonomic nervous system, to adrenal cells on the face, to um, bones and cartilage. So the key issue, I think, is for generating, particularly if you want to study neural crest chimeras, to introduce them at the time, your donor cells, when the endogenous cells leave. I think it's pretty critical here. The timing is critical and probably the type of cell is critical. And of course, um, uh, George mentioned this in the morning, these are the classical neural crest chimeras from the Durin in quite a while ago, between chicken and quail. So the experiments I'm talking about really are based on an, the first experiment I did when I joined the Whitehead Institute, where I was interested in making neural crest chimeras. And I have to go through this experiment briefly, because it's a basis for what I'm going to talk with you. So what I did was I explanted neural tubes, and whatever grew out, I declared as neural crest because there was no marker 30 years ago. And then they would be injected in utero into the embryo, so up of the placenta, so the blind injection, you have to know where the embryo is. 
And the result was you get animals which have cold color. I only looked at cold color contribution, which had contribution to the head area and to the trunk area, actually never to the, to the front limb, limbs. And let me just, there were two conclusions from these experiments. One is, it's a very narrow window when it works, 12 hours. It doesn't work before, it doesn't work after. 12 hours. That's the only time it works, so it's a narrow window of the recipient age. And the second one was, there was never any contribution to the anterior trunk in the forelimbs, but to either both, to both ends, or to one or the other. So the restricted contribution of donor cells to head and lower trunk, but never to the forelimbs. Why would this be? So the embryo which gets injected at exactly between the 6 and 10 somite stage is the embryo before it turns. And this is the amnion cavity, and that's where the cells are deposited because it's the biggest cavity, and if it works, that's where they get in. So these cells have to get through the epithelium and um, into, um, into, to make pigment, and the neural pores are still open at this point. So the hypothesis was maybe these donor cells can get to the open, open pores and then contribute to the head and the tail region, but since they're endogenous melanoblasts filling the niches, they couldn't spread to any wells. So that was the hypothesis. So we tested that by emptying the niches using, a, as a host, a W mutant, which all the melanoblasts die. And when you do that, you get, indeed, chimeras which are very extensive, very high-grade chimeras, in there, as you can see here. Looks like these cells have a lot of potential to, to, to proliferate. And to test this more closely, we did an experiment. We mixed brown and black donors. We generated these triple-colored mice. We can see, apparently, they're almost clonal, all these derived. There's a subclone here on, the, on this brown area. So the conclusion, I think, from this is these primary neural crest cells have a very high proliferation migration capacity in, in the, under these circumstances. So could we use human cells to do that experiment? So that's what really what I want to talk about. And this is work by two postdocs in the laboratory, Katie Wirt and Hockey Cohen. So the first experiment was repeating the experiment I did 30 years before, and I had to teach these people. And to my really big satisfaction, we could generate these chimeras again. And now we had GFP, and we can see these donor cells migrate under the skin, um, either by GFP or by staining. And when you section, you can see GFP um, really contributing to nerve sheets and other structures. So the conclusion would be these primary neural crest donor cells contribute to pigmentation and to some neural derivatives. So then the question was, can we use yes cell-derived neural crest to do that experiment? So this case was just using a labeled uh, mouse yes cell generating um, and, and neural crest cells from those and injecting those the same route. And when you do that, now you have GFP, you can see there contribute to dorsal root ganglia, there's tomato red, and to sheets to peripheral neuron, neuronal fibers in these embryos. So donor cells contribute to DRGs and to peripheral nerve fibers. But we have, of course, mostly interest in postnatal contribution. And you do find animals, and I'll show you later how many, where there's limited localized contribution of black hair. You can see this group of black hair here, or here at the, at the end, at the tail end, donor-derived cells. And this was put into a strain, host strain, which had the niche emptied. It was a, w, a WC kid mutant strain. So the pigment contribution is only at anterior and or posterior trunk region. And this is in W mutant um, host as well as in wild type albino host. So it was very different from the primary cells. That's, what I, that's why I'm going to make this point here. We'll come, back, we'll come back to this later. So the extent of chimeras when you compare primary versus yes cell derived one, primaries are much higher when you look at code color contribution. The location of the donor cells in the W host, primary cells spread anterior posteriorly, the yes cell derived do not. So one of the conclusions from this will be the in vitro differentiated neural crest cells may have a lower capacity for proliferation and or migration than the primary ones. Clearly we don't get these cells at this point. Okay, now coming to the human. 
So the human used, again, labeled um, and, and, and GFP or tomato labeled uh, ES cells, IPS cells, differentiated those to um, using protocols, um, which has been established particularly in the, in the Schluter laboratory, um, and then injected them into W hosts or into wild type hosts and looked for, for contribution. So just the undifferentiated yes, uh, neural, uh, neural um, and crest cells express the right markers. I don't want to go into this. They differentiate into the melanocyte lineage with the right markers into the uh, peripheral nervous cell lineage as well as they give rise to mesenchymal cells. So by all these, I don't want to go into any details here, the conclusion would be these cells are multipotent. So the injection would be then, and just we reiterate, they go into the amnion cavity um, it this 12 hour window. If you do it later, the cells end up in the allantois. That's the biggest copy. So the embryo turns later, and it's basically we never saw any contribution. I think that certainly is one of the parameters here. So when you look now, several days after, um, after um, injection, you find uh, labeled cells at two days, three days, or uh, five days after injection, apparently moving under the epidermis um, uh, along probably the dorsolateral route. You can section these embryos, and you find some cells get into the interior, which looks like dorsal root ganglia. Or here would be a contribution to a trigeminal ganglion. You see here the GFP, and you can stain it, confirm it by staining for GFP. So the conclusion would be these humanal crest donor cells migrate under the epidermis probably the dorsolateral way, as well as contribute probably the ventral way to neural um, derivatives in the embryo. Negative controls, I think that's really all important. That's as any cells do, so we use ES cells, and here you see they form this, the same route. They form here a blob of cells. We use human neural precursors. They seem to be also stuck more at the surface, and fibroblasts are here. You can see here the embryo there. So the, Clearly, difference to the neural crest cells, these negative controls really do not disperse and do not migrate after injection, but seem to remain at the surface and form something like a, like a tumor structure as well. So, of course, we're interested in postnasal contribution. And that's, of course, is a high bar, so I give you two examples. And you may or may not be able to see this. In this pub, you see here um, um, black hair. It's a dispersed hair, and you see this in a more um, adult animal, you see here dispersed um, human um, pigmented, well, pigmented hair. So this is pigmentation in single dispersed hairs, and this would be in a W host. Of course, well, you want to confirm that. So we used a very sensitive assay using human mitochondrial DNA as a PCR assay, and you can use the dilution here. In this assay, we used also for these cameras I mentioned before, we reliably can detect one cell in 10,000 cells because human mitochondria is 100, 100 copies per cell, so we can do this. And when you do this, you never see any contribution above this uh, threshold when you plug white hair, none out of 80 plugged or so. But when you plug the, the, the pigmented hair, you do find in about 60%, and I can ask, you, I can ask why it's only 60%, about 60% there are cells which are clearly of human origin. And we can section those, and you can see sometimes you hit a hair follicle with a pigment. That in this case, it's clearly um, the whole hair follicle is composed of human, presumably melanoblasts. And here you see a hair follicle with a negative one, which is only partially um, yeah, probably colonized. So I think this tells us indeed that we can, these, these human derived, um, human ES cell derived, or IPS cell derived, um, cells can contribute to two neural crest-derived structures. So what is the efficiency? We look at embryos, we're comparing the mouse neural crest and human neural crest cells. The donor contribution is better, is more extensive with the, with the mouse than with the human, but the frequency of chimeras is rather similar. It's about between 30 and 40%. And when you look at postnatal ones, we're comparing now primary, most neural crest cells, most uh, yes cell derived neural crest cells, and human neural crest cells. The primary 
it's about 30% or so. We get chimeras. It's very extensive code color contribution. The most, as a human, we only find single dispersed <laughs> pigmented hairs. It never was a patch like we see with the, with the, um, with the primary neural crest cells. So I think the conclusion from this would be the overall efficiency of chimera formation is very similar for most human donor cells. It probably depends just on your injection um, technique, how you hit probably the, the, the amnion cavity. But the proliferate potential of yes cell-derived neural crest cells is much lower than that of primary. So clearly there's something we have to learn and, um, um, and make these cells more proliferative. Okay, so these are all data. So let me summarize this. So human neural crest cells can integrate into the developing mouse embryo and generate functional cells in postnatal mice. The contribution of mouse and human ES cell derives is, uh, ES cells uh, and neural crest cells much lower than that of primary ones, of course, only compared in the mouse. Why is that? So I believe, as I said before, the in vitro differentiated cells may be more mature. They have maybe lower proliferative potential. So we might have to fix that by whatever uh, means. I think an important issue, which we didn't talk this morning about, is the species differences might be really, the niche factors might be just really secreted factors, which are just not optimal for human cells. And we know this from bone marrow transplants, from bone marrow, from hematopoietic differentiation. You have to humanize the mobs. I think that will be a very important part to figure out how can you not only make niches, but also humanize um, the, the niches or the factors which these which human cells would need. Immune to rejection. I think that's a big uh, issue. And coming back to my mouse experiments, when we made these triple colored mice, the brown black, uh, and, and, and the brown black donor cells mixed, what we noticed was the mice stayed black, the black pigment stayed all the time there. The brown faded away within six weeks. And when you look at this, the black one was H2 matched, there was B6 donor but the, um, the, the brown ones with DBA was not matched. So I think clearly well, this would argue certainly that there is an immune reaction and you, you have to deal with that. So um, uh, neural, crest uh, neural crest cells apparently do not contribute to the thymus epithelium to, to give you an, an tolerance and that has been observed before also in, in, in chick quail cameras by, by Littoral. But I think I would say even if you have a low contribution in the adult, if you want to use it for studying something like a cancer, melanoma, or neurofibromatosis, where you look at clonal outgrowth, you can manipulate the cells, of course, that might be useful to study indeed what, what I raised in the, in the morning, to study the initiation, let's say, melanoma, the proliferation and the, and the um, and the um, uh, manifestation, and then use that as a system, an in vivo system, for um, testing therapies and understanding more of the pathogen path pathology of the disease. Clearly, neural crest has many, many diseases. It's very rich in it. Um, um, many, many diseases due to um, impaired migration, megacolon, cleft lip, and what have you. To study those, you need very efficient cameras. I think we are not there. But for those type of things, I think that could be done by now. So let me come to my final slide sort of comparing really, if you want to make models for human diseases as one of the goals, let me compare somatic versus pluripotent donor cells. Um, we talked about the pluripotent cells this morning. So committed stem cells, progenitor cells. What are the... the Highlights, so let's put this up. So is it possible that these cells compete better with the limited, within a lineage, within a, let's say, mouse lineage, um, and the human cells compete better because maybe their, their proliferation is similar, um, and maybe other parameters which we don't quite understand. Of course, a high contribution to a single lineage might be much better tolerated by the embryo than contributions to many tissues. I think that's much of the lethality we heard before um, about chimeras, um, um, monkey chimeras in, in pigs or so. Um, this might be much better tolerated. You might get easier, um, higher contribution. Now, I think that's an important point, which we discussed this morning. 
I think for these type of experiments, you really have to time the state of the donor cells with the time when the endogenous equivalent cells develop and leave, in this case, leave the tube. So this for null crest, clearly that's absolutely essential. You couldn't make null crest cells with a postnatal animal. It wouldn't make sense. But as we will hear in the next talks, for the brain, that might be different. So clearly you can um, um, uh, integrate cells into the postnatal brain. Okay, so these are a few points I wanted to make. And this, then we finish with the two people who did this work, and Malky Cohen and Kelly West. Thank you. Compare the ES derived neural crests from mouse and human and the primary uh, from mouse. Did you try accessing primary neural crests from human? human and do a <laughs> chimeras in there? I don't know how to get those. <laughs> they, I, I uh, wonder how you, you would have to. I mean, primary neural crests, you have to explant. I mean, why I did it. Explant the tube and let something grow out. I'm not sure how easy you get in human um, neural tube at the right age to do that. So I think that would be. Tough one. It would be a really great experiment. I would love to do that. Right. It's key. Our next speaker is Rick Lefsey from Cambridge. Welcome, Trust. Oops, Rick? sorry. Cambridge. Trust, yeah. It feels like the sprint to the airport now. I'll try, I'll try and speak even more quickly than normal, which isn't pretty. I'll warn you. Um, okay, so, so, so what I'm going to talk about um, in the sort of 14 to 15 minutes is um, where we're at in terms of um, sort of chimerizing in the cerebral cortex. So the cerebral cortex for the non-neuro people here is the ridge structure in the back of the forebrain that you see on all the MRI scans. It's the bit that's the executive and integrative center of the human central nervous system. So, so, speak 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 speak. so when we're, when we're um, talking about some of the concerns and risks, I'll stand closer to people, um, uh, about humanization of the nervous system, a lot of that concern comes back to the cerebral cortex for, 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 for obvious reasons. Um, so some of the work we've done previously in the lab has been using um, developmental biology principles to replay development of the cerebral cortex in vitro. And there's, and there's some important biology here, which is that it's the progenitor cells that make your neurons of your cerebral cortex are multipotent. So it's not like the hemopoietic system where you get lineage restriction. You get very long, complex lineages generating lots of different cell types over time. And you need all those components. And that will become important in a moment when we talk about about um, generating um, circuits and so on. So, so, so you can replay all this in vitro from pluripotent stem cells, and you end up with um, nice um, two-dimensional, three-dimensional um, neural circuits. They're not properly organized in three dimensions, depending on, on how one does it. One can do it with organized amygdalas that be more um, uh, better laminated than, than they are in this sort of pseudo 3D, 2D type system. Okay, so, 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 so like I said, what I'm going to talk about is, is, is humanizing the, the mouse cerebral cortex. And a little bit about grafting, and then um, what we're learning from studying human and non-human primates in vitro about what, where, what about sort of the, what George referred to earlier about the biological plausibility of actually humanizing the, 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 the mouse. Um, and a lot of this will deal with some of the topics that have been raised on um, 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 heterochronic. So first of all, just to do with grafting. So Lawrence, I suspect, will talk a lot about grafting. Um, in general, I'm just going to mention briefly grafting into the adult cerebral cortex. It actually speaks to some of, of what Rudy was mentioning, which is, which is, so this is work we've done. Uh, it's a very close collaboration with Vincenzo De Paolo, who's an electrophysiologist in Imperial, who does the, 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 the grafting and imaging. And this is into adult rodents. So this is not perinatal. These are actually six months old. They're, they're immunocompromised, not skid mice. And what Vincenzo's lab do is, is, is they cut windows in, in, in the skull and then do live two-photon imaging over time. And we basically then generate mixed populations of very early um, progenitor cells with some neurons within them. And so we're really only talking 40,000 cells. And these neurons express um, genetically encoded calcium sensors so we can monitor neuronal activity over time. And we can, we can look through this window using the confocal over six months and look at what these neurons are doing, where they're integrating, and, 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 and so on. And what you find, actually, is because we put in a mixture of progenitors and neurons, and this is the same area within the cortex over, you can see here, 94 days, is the cells both proliferate and differentiate extensively. And the reason for raising this for the non sort of developmental people is the rodent-to-rodent -rodent equivalent of this is, is, is incredibly inefficient. So, so if I take a mature adult mouse and inject in 
fetal mouse progenitors or neurons in, they simply will just sit there. They might generate a few neurons, but it's not going to be very pretty. You typically have to lesion, create a space, essentially create a niche for them. The human progenitor cells are completely ignoring this and are just running uh, pretty much amok, actually. And what we'll find is that these guys um, will generate neurons which can migrate centimeters across this cortex and actually out of the cortex into non-cortical tissues as well. So, so they're actually totally ignoring the cues, which at this stage in an adult rodent are actually saying, stop dividing. In fact, don't even grow axons and dendrites. This is meant to be a non-permissive environment. But so they make the, 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 the rather lovely neurons. You can't actually, you can get a sense of this in, in this movie. There's a lot more going on here, but the contrast won't show you. These are just different panels of neurons, of the human neurons, which are all firing and are electrically active. Um, um, and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So the point of this was to say that this is a very useful system, and, and, and uh, I did have a very long slide of uses for this, but Rusty very helpfully listed what you want. You can use this first, so I don't need to do that now. So, so, so you can imagine that there's all sorts of practical research uses for this. We work a lot with Alzheimer's disease, so it's extremely useful for us for grafting in Alzheimer's disease cell autonomous models and actually looking at, for example, spreading of the disease through the nervous system. So that's fine, but what, what then about this question about could one actually in principle, chimerize the, 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 say the, the, the rodent cerebral cortex. Well, there's some very important developmental biology and anatomical differences. We, everyone sort of needs to bear in mind at this point. So, 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 so this is the scale. This is the human forebrain, the cerebellum, this is front, this is the back, and this is the mouse. So, so the trivial differences are the human is just flat out bigger. Well, that's not terribly interesting. So if you cut across the cortex, it, it, we classically describe it having six layers of neurons. They're actually classes of neurons. From this would be the skin, this would be going in, into the center of the brain. He, all mammals have these six layers, but actually when you get to primates, these outer layers get diversified and become much more complex, by which we mean that there's more types of neurons that are doing different things. So the actual complexity of the system is, is far higher within humans. So, so straight away you're trying to kind of make this in this background, but in, in addition, as I was saying, so, so this kind of makes some sense when you're thinking about, 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 about humans, say, versus chimp. The other issue, which was briefly raised this morning, which is extremely important, there's size, but there's also gestation, which is actually a measure of developmental time. So, so this is the human cerebral cortex. This is good old Charles. Um, so this is how many neurons are in the human cerebral cortex, and this is, this is gestation. Chimp is about a third as many neurons, not far off the gestation. Macaque is, is, is tenfold fewer, much, fewer, much shorter gestation. And this, this is mouse. So it's 21 days gestation, which is pretty quick, as we all know if you ever had them running around your garage. And the, in terms of, of neurons, this is actually a very generous estimate of how many neurons there are in the mouse cerebral cortex. There's, there's at least 1,000, if not 10 to the 4, fewer, fewer neurons, as I mentioned. So, you, so, so again, you're trying to kind of ram something like this into something like that in total. But, but actually, the, 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 so there's a scaling problem, but there's also a developmental biology problem. So I mentioned you've got these six layers of neurons. Um, the thing I didn't mention is developmentally you generate them in a fixed order over time. So you go, this is six, five, four, three, two, one. And so progenitor cells sail through time and they'll make the first cell type and they make the second type and so on. In, in mice will do this and generate this complete lineage in six days. So in that 21 days, they spend six days doing this. Humans will do this over about 100 days. And it'll take them, they're, they're much slower cell division. So they'll take somewhere between 50 and 100 rounds of cell division. <laughs> So you get, you get some idea of, of sort of the scale of the problem here if you're just thinking about most to human. So, so, so one of the things we've been doing is, is saying, well, well, we understand some of the descriptive biology of this, but, but, but to what extent is it species-specific and controlled? But actually, comparing human and mouse at some point is rather trivial. They're so different, you're not going to learn a hell of a lot. So what we've been doing in collaboration with actually with Rusty's lab is saying, well, how does this differ between human and non-human primates, and, and, and how is this controlled? And what that's involved doing is making um, the neuroprogenitors, cortical progenitor cells, from human, for those of you who don't know, this is John Gurdon, by the way, it usually raises a snigger, um, and from chimpanzees, and th these are chimp iPS cells that we got from Carol Marchetto in, in, in Rusty's lab, and macaque ES cells. These are two different species of, of, of macaque. Macaque are, are, are a long way from humans in terms of evolutionary distance. We're talking 30 million years plus, at least. They're, they're a hell of a long way away. And, and what that's allowed us to do is start, is start addressing to what extent, you know, what can, is this whole generation of complexity controlled in a, in a cell autonomous manner? And, and, and just a couple of little bits of data, because, you know, it's probably not the best forum for it. What we find is even looking at observational stuff is the order in which you make the different class of neurons, these are waves of neurons appearing, 
is, is very similar in humans and chimps. This is these red guys appearing and is much faster in macaque. And the short, what, what that means in short is that developmental timing is preserved when one does this in vitro. So, so, so each species will do what would normally do in, in, in normal in utero development, but they'll, they'll do it at the same rate in, in the dish. And that's at the level of making neurons. It extends all the way up, and I'm running across all two things, to, to, the, to, to the rate at which the neurons actually become functionally mature. So, so there's a whole piece of biology which we have very little understanding of, which is when a stem cell makes a neuron, so neurons are electrically active, which everybody understands, but they go through an extended period during which they, they achieve what we call mature firing properties, which would be this kind of thing here. So if you poke them, they'll essentially fire off lots and lots of action potential. Um, again, what you can see here is that, is that human, and this is how long it takes, this is days, 30 to 70. Humans take forever to achieve those mature firing properties and can't do it much, much more quickly. So, so all these different aspects of development, the point at which you, 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 you start making neurons, when you make neurons, right up to how quickly the neurons achieve this functional maturity. They, they do it on a species-specific time scale, um, and they preserve this in vitro. So the obvious question whether this is some sort of community effect, it's all driven by a niche, or, or, or is this cell autonomous? And, 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 and so we've, we've done a lot of work on this, but just, just to show you the system. So this, this is our version of a chimera. This is an in vitro chimera, where we essentially label the progenitor cells from one species with various fluorophores, and then we mix them at least 100 to 200 to 1 with the other species. So you're essentially taking, say, a macaque neural progenitor cell and mixing it 1 to 100 with all the humans. And now you're at our human into macaque. And now you're asking, of all these different things I've been banging on about, do they behave more like the species they've moved into or do they move like the species they've, 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 they've come from? And th this is just one example here in developmental timing. And, and all you need to see is those pie charts look like those pie charts. This is when they make different classes of neurons. Essentially, they do everything according to the species they're from. So to summarize, essentially, there are lots of differences among primates in these different features of cortical development. They range from the timing of generation of different class of neurons through to the, 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 a control of brain growth. You don't need to worry about it today. And this time scale over which neurons become functionally mature. And um, as I say, these differences are, are, are extreme if you compare mouse and, uh, and human, for example. But what the chimeric cultures show is that all these species-specific features are cell autonomous. We can't shift them by moving them between species. And what it says is there is essentially some sort of, at some level, genetic control of this, which is, which is species specific. The reason for laboring this for a good sort of five or seven minutes is that um, clearly, you know, if one wants to then go into human and try and make a, a piece of, of uh, into mouse, excuse me, and make a piece of human cortex, you have to find some way of shoehorning all of that human development into this little bit of mouse development. And, and you know, we in a number of labs you know, are doing the obvious experiments, putting the human progenitor cells into the developing mouse cortex. They'll go in, they'll make neurons, but there's no way they're going to replay 100 days of development for you. And that's what the adult grafting show you as well. What's happening with the adult grafting is actually the human progenitor cells are going into an adult mouse, and they're, they're ignoring the fact they're an adult mouse and are actually replaying development over 100 days. They, they just don't care anymore. And they're not doing it in a good way. They're not making a clear, laminated, connected structure that will have sort of human biological properties that will encode things that people may be concerned about. They're, they're, they're essentially neurons, but they're not, they're not capturing some essence of humanity. Just the last point I want to raise, though, was, was that there's a middle ground, which, which I, I don't think there are particularly um, worrisome ethical concerns, but it's probably more practical in the short term, which is this idea of, of using the 3D organoid system as, as a form of, of cortical implants. So many people will be aware that, that organoid technology is, is, is around a lot at the moment. This is this idea that essentially make three-dimensional structures starting from embryonic stem cells or iPS cells. Yoshiki Sasai pioneered a lot of this work, including work within the, within the nervous system. Um, and more latterly, Jürgen Knoblich's lab in, in Vienna has done some beautiful work with, with, with the mini-brain stuff. So, so, so for example, we've been making these. You can, the, the, these are essentially three-dimensional structures. When you slice across them, what you get are these lovely laminated cerebral cortices. This is one. Is, is one from chimp, we've made them from, from, from macaque and, and, and so on. But, but what, what we and others are now exploring is that actually now you have this nice laminated structure with layers within it. In principle, um, this is something which, as a small little millimeter cube, essentially what you've got now is, is, is an implant, which if you put into somewhere like visual cortex here at the back, the big research questions are, can this entity now, which, which internally captures normal human biology, because it's, it's laminated properly, the structures are there, it's electrically active, Will it then actually essentially get input from the mouse and will it actually put output back to the mouse? In which point then 
This is the kind of thing, and this is all stuff that people are actively working on. I don't have straight answers for you. Is, is, will it then respond to sensory stimuli, for example, visual stimuli, and in return, will you actually get behavioral stimuli from this? And, and obviously, with, with, with optogenetics, we, we have channel redoption in these guys. So you can actually drive them with, um, with, with electrical activity. But again, the, these would be of a scale of, of a millimeter cubed. So they're not going to be a huge contribution to, 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 to the human cortex. But I thought they were an important uh, technology to, to, to raise. So, 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 so I'll just stop there and just to say, obviously, there's a lot of people in our lab who, who, who do all this. And, and the primary stuff I mentioned was all a collaboration with Rusty's lab. And the grafting is a collaboration with Vincenzo at Imperial. So thank you. I think this, uh, this point of uh, cell autonomy is one that uh, should be reinforced forced, and I hope we can uh, explore that further because uh, early, early uh, reports have been that there was some element of recognition of mouse cortex, but I, th I think the more recent views are, are consistent with your data that there really is not any recognition of the local cues in the host with human transplants. <clears throat> While Lawrence is getting ready. Small, small technical problem. Okay. So what I'm gonna do uh, here hopefully the next 15 minutes or so is to give you kind of a cross section of how we use basic xenografting routinely in the lab, very widely for addressing many important questions. For us, that's really, in many ways, a routine tool. And it's a routine tool for the questions right here. So we are very interested in actually developing cell-based therapies. And I'll show you the example for Parkinson's disease, where we routinely, again, need to use uh, such models to test all those factors. We also, and it was mentioned in the morning, we really want to use in vivo systems to have human disease models that would be relevant. And then there are many basic questions, as outlined here, to study the plasticity of the human cells, and the question of timing. Now, the reason why that's so important is because we are getting better and better in vitro to make many cell types that are potential therapeutic relevance. And again, I'll show you a little bit of the example of Parkinson's, but there are many other cell types that can now be routinely generated at scale under defined conditions. And for all those cells, we need to have readouts that are gonna be relevant for studying the disease or for using those cells as a tool for cell therapy. And so, again, it's an essential tool uh, to have. Just kind of to jump to the end goal, really what we try to do in Parkinson's is that we have basically support to really develop that into natural cell therapy, where we have to put together already a multidisciplinary team that should be able to do that, and where we are now at the stage, again, in the middle of the preparations for actually doing that clinically, where we are having to discuss all those stages from production of cells all the way to the surgery, and again, just to give you a flavor here, we're actually trying to use an intraoperative MRI to do that, where you can very precisely deliver the cells in the brain, and you can actually watch when the cells get injected at that time. These are not those cells, but this is a fluid, basically, that is basically used with the exact same device that we're going to put our cells in. So clearly, again, putting uh, human cells into animals is a routine procedure in that case. And we have shown that Again, we can make those cells at very large scales, so we can make banks of those cells. We can show that they improve behavioral deficits that are relevant to Parkinson's disease. And these are some of those cells, just to give you a flavor morphologically, they look basically indistinguishable from endogenous dopamine cells after they are implanted into a monkey. These are human cells into a rhesus monkey. And you don't just get two or three cells, you get routine in average about 1,000 cells per tract that you inject or per side of, of the monkey. And to give you a flavor of what that means is you have about 500,000 of those cells in your brain on each side. So that's only about 20% of what you would have in a human of those dopamine neurons you can routinely have to survive uh, in a monkey brain. And this is about the therapeutic dose that we would like to achieve in, in human patients to really move that forward. And again, xenografting assays are absolutely essential to now do the, the final step before we actually can do that in patients. So we have to make large-scale safety and biodistribution studies in mice. We redo efficacy studies in rats. 
with the final product, exact same product that's going to go into the patient, and we're actually also going to, go, going to do another set of primate studies due to the scaling issue. We want to make sure that the final product scales, that, we can com that it's compatible with the same device we're going to use in the patient, and also to use the exact same immunosuppressive regimen that at least in the patients we're going to use uh, temporarily. So again, that's the state in Parkinson's disease. And again, when we hear the discussions about whether human cells can influence the mouse brain, in this case, they definitely do. And it, you can actually prove that. So for example, what we did is we put in our human cells, the same ones we're going to use clinically, a switch. You can think of it like a light switch using optogenetics, where you can now make your grafts, but you can now switch off the cells at different time points and ask what basically cells contribute. And you can do that in a freely moving animal that basically you can then do behavioral assays. And again, one of those assays is the assay here, where you have a mouse basically walking along this corridor. The mouse is hungry and wants to eat the sugar pellets on each side of the corridor. And the healthy mouse, because it's hungry, it's going to clearly eat them on both sides. So 50% on each side. If you have a mouse that has Parkinson's or Parkinson-like uh, symptoms on one side of the brain, you see there's a huge asymmetry. And depending on which drug you use, you can basically flip the symmetry. But basically, you see that this mouse is now no longer picking those pellets normally. And when we take our cells, gratifyingly, that's yet another behavior that, we, that the human cells can fix. So you can see they go from down here, maybe 15%, back to 50%. But the really cool experiment is now what happens this process takes about five months before the cells are mature enough to achieve this rescue. What happens now if you shut off just the human cells? And with optogenetics, you can do that. You switch on the light. All the mouse cells ignore the light. But the human cells, the graft, they're going to shut off. And what happens is they go back to where they were five months ago. So they're again fully Parkinsonian. So meaning all the behavioral benefit is now driven by the human neurons in the mouse brain. And again, I'm not going to go into too great detail, but we can actually even test electrophysiologically by recording which synapse they connect. And it seems to be the exact same synapse that gets modulated, that has a certain strength, basically from the cortex to the striatal output system. Whenever we shine light, the human contribution to that strength goes away. And then when you switch off the light, it comes back. So you see basically in real time what these cells do in a functional circuit. So there's no doubt that human cells can influence mouse cells, and they influence them in this case to rescue uh, a deficit. Now just to switch gear a tiny bit, again, another way we like to use cells, again in the model of Parkinson's, is to just simply graft cells in vivo to see how cells behave in a pathological, uh, is a pathological context when you have cells, not wild type, but those that have a mutation in a gene that uh, can cause genetic forms of Parkinson's disease. And on top of that, we like sometimes to use tricks to speed up the aging process in those cells. And so we had in the past done that in vitro, and we see certain changes that are related to whether you have basically PD versus a control line, and whether you put this aging trigger in or not. But what I really want to focus on here is what we did then in vivo. So you can transplant these cells in vivo to a graft, and now study the cells for many months. And what we find is that indeed those cells survive after one month, in fact, you don't see an obvious difference. But by three months, you start seeing that basically, the, particularly when they have both the age stimulus, in this case, exposing them to progerin, and the Parkinson's stimulus, the aftergenetic Parkinson's susceptibility, you see that after three months, the dopamine markets get downregulated, and after six months, actually, the cells are gone. They degenerate. And you can then take it even further to then study in this context, in an in vivo context, study age-related factors, such as, for example, pigmentation, which we never can see in a dish, but it's, again, an age-related marker. And we can even then see certain inclusions that, again, were only seen if you combine our aging stimulus with a genetic stimulus of being Parkinson's susceptible. And so that just gives you a flavor, again, that is a very important assay, that you can now study the disease for much longer time and in an in vivo tissue context. But again, that's obviously not a new idea. There are many examples from us and many other labs where you can use cells in a xenografting paradigm. I'll show you here one of those studies, where in this case we actually made neural stem or precursor cells, and we asked, can human cells not only make neurons, but can they integrate into a host niche? 
And one of the most famous niches in the subventricular zone, where basically there is a, in the mouse at least, a stem cell population that gives rise to cells that micro, migrate along the Ross migratory stream to the olfactory bulb. And what he found is using human genetic markers and human specific antigens, that human cells in fact can take up shop in the SVC. They migrate along the Ross migratory stream, and you get at least a small contribution of human cells to olfactory interneurons. You can even then study the dynamics of this process comparing it to the mouse. And so again, to give you a flavor that this is again a very nice assay to study, in this case, niche formation. And again, a lot is discussed about doing that not only postnatally, but also prenatally. And so we're interested in testing that too with the same cells. And that's then again to see, can we get more full spread integration? And this is just some early unpublished data where we actually use ultrasound guided injections in very early stage of the embryo. In this case, first for sensory neurons, trying to put them into the DRG, the dorsal root ganglion, or for dopamine neurons, putting the cells into the midbrain at E12.5. And you can appreciate some of those fibers that now project towards the striatum, suggesting at least the subset of those cells can now basically follow that path in vivo. Now, the reason why we think that's particularly important or interesting to study in a prenatal stage is, again, this timing question. You're very interested if you now match them. The human cells that you make correspond to about E10, E11, E12 of development. Can, if you now match them, put them isochronically in a mouse brain, they're already neurons, young neurons. Can they now uh, basically mature at a more accelerated uh, uh, speed? And unfortunately, I cannot give you the answer. These are still uh, on, uh, ongoing studies. Now, in some of the studies, we also choose, instead of going into early mouse embryo, we use the chick embryo. And again, there are kind of classic studies you can do where you make young motor neuron precursors and inject them into the chick embryo about the two and a half days of development. And you can see that human cells can survive in the chick embryo. And one of the neat things, I don't know whether you can see this light, is you see these fibers coming out of the spinal cord going into the periphery. And that's a very unique feature because it turns out that the only nerve cell in the CNS that really leaves the CNS or the fibers that leave the CNS is the motor neuron. And so for us, that was a very important biological proof that these motor neurons know what to do and they can actually project into the periphery. And sometimes they have these very long fibers where they go presumably to muscle groups along the trunk of the chick embryo. And yet, yet another example, we talked about neurocrest is, is the fact that you can see very subtle differences, actually. For example, we can now make in the lab different subpopulations of neurocrest cells, and the chick embryo seems to be particularly suitable to basically study migration. And so we were very interested because there were no good conditions available for making what's called the enteric neurocrest. These are the cells that innovate your gut. And there are actually hundreds of millions of those in the human, in the human gut. And we injected them into basically a developing embryo. And again, the light is a little bit low, but what you hopefully can see is that some of them, in fact, make it, make it to the gut. And they have a very different migration pattern than, for example, what we call cranial neurocrest that makes your skull structures, or melanocyte bias neurocrest that, similar to what Rudy showed, actually migrate basically uh, along, along the surface of the embryo. Now, this was for us, again, often the first assay to see the potential in an embryonic system. And then we challenge the system and see, so what if we go to later and later and later stages? Can these cells still migrate? And in this case, actually, what was exciting and, again, then clinically relevant is that this has actually can do that even postnatally and even adult. So these are now enteric neurocrest precursors injected here at the proximal part of, your, of the colon, which is called the cecum. You inject them into the wall of the cecum, and you see after one hour there is a bolus of cells there. But after two weeks, or even after four weeks, the cells can spread up to basically 10 centimeters or four inches and basically repopulate the whole colon within one month. And so I think that's obviously a, a very powerful feature because that could be now harnessed for diseases such as Hirschsprung disease. These are children where this migration doesn't properly work during development and try to reinduce those cells into the cecum. And we did that in a mouse model of Hirschsprung disease and showed that the cells repopulate the same way they do in a wild type, but actually can now rescue the viability of those animals. 
And again, so the trick was for us kind of the first screening assay to see how good these cells can migrate. But in this case, it actually translated into being, do, being able to do that even in an in a adult uh, organism. And for the very last part, just a uh, flavor again coming back to, to the brain or to the cortex. So one thing we are very interested in, and again, Rick gave a very nice introduction on that, is really timing issues. And we are getting better at basically speeding up timing of differentiation in a human system, but only so far for making the neurons. So these are now neurons which have cortical marker expression. They are already born within about 10 days, a pretty high efficiency. Normally, it takes about at least one or two months. So you can do that from wild type cells. We also have a collaboration where we do that with uh, neurons from iPS cells that have genetic forms of schizophrenia. And so these cells are also matured pretty quickly. So after two weeks, they were uh, basically iPS cells two weeks ago. After two weeks, they can already show repetitive firing, even some spontaneous repetitive firing. So the question was now, we sped them up to become neurons. What happens if you put them in vivo? Are they now also going to go faster and are they going to integrate very quickly? And so the assay we used is actually we inject them into a neonatal brain and we use the technique which is called iDisco where you can clear the brain after transplantation and you can do light sheet microscopy to follow basically all the cells in one shot. And let's just show you one, one movie that was work we did together with the lab of Mark Desilavin where you see here the grafts of those cells at one month you can appreciate that they basically project very far into the brain, but you might also see that actually the, the fibers, they're still nearly straight, so they don't have much terminal arborization. By three months, you see this fine grains uh, ending, which is the terminal arborization that starts. And if you go all the way to six months and look at that picture, you can actually get quite remarkable human-specific fibers and presumably synaptic inputs in those brains. And so that shows that on the one hand, these cells clearly can survive, but on the other hand, it also shows you that they actually seem to have no longer sped up their development because it took them nearly six months before they stopped projecting their axons and terminally arborized. And that suggests, again, that the maturation process is probably a different challenge than just simply making the neuron. And again, what that reminds me to is coming back just for the very end for the Parkinson's, is there were very classic studies done where we try to rescue a rat model of Parkinson's disease. And this is just an example with primary cells. It's the same with ES-derived cells. You can make primary dopamine neurons from the mouse, from the pig, and from the human. You each of them engraft them into a rat. They are in the same host environment. But the time it takes them to rescue the rat is completely species dependent. So meaning even once they are born and young neurons, the maturation rate is really what seems to be still something we cannot uh, control at this time point at all, which has a number of consequences, obviously. It's going to make it much more difficult to ever imagine that you're going to have a cognitively enhanced animal that has now is driven by a human cortex, because the human cortex would mature at the human speed. And even by two years of age, human cells would be presumably still not at a very high cognitive level. On the other hand, again, it's also a challenge for, for Parkinson's, for example, because we need to tell the patient these neurons are actually going to take one to three years because they are fully functional. So that's, I think, a big mystery in the field that really controls that maturation rate. And so this, oops, these are uh, just some of the conclusions. So that I think we are now at the stage where we absolutely need to have these in vivo systems to assess the potential of the many cell types we can generate in the lab. And the key issue is obviously functionality and safety. And it's very well justified because we are on the verge, and other groups as well, to now testing that in humans. We need to know how these cells work, and we need to know how they work in vivo. Steve. Clearly, our data indicate that we can engraft these cells both pre- and postnatally with quite good survival. But there are a lot of basic important questions, obviously. We mentioned matching the graft with the host in time that need to be explored. So I think both systems are very, very valuable. And then I think the big challenge, I think, for us is still the maturation rate. Even once the neuron is born, how long does it take them to actually uh, mature? And I think that's still a mystery, really, what's mechanistically behind that, but also, in a way, if you want to say, reassuring that this is not suddenly going to have driven by, by very complex uh, human properties. And so I think I'm going to stop here and just here. These are some of the peoples that contributed uh, to this work. Okay, thank you very much, Lawrence. We're running a little behind.
But uh, we have one more speaker. Uh, while he's hooking up, Steve Goldman, University of Copenhagen now, and Ro University of Rochester. Uh, are there any points of clarification? I'll, I'll, while you're talking about us, Lawrence, uh, in the experiment where you looked uh, six months after and saw a much more arborized innervation, what day were the animals, how old were the host animals? So the host that was grafted was postnatal, so P2. They P2. were grafted P2. And where were they grafted? They were just grafted into the cortex. The cortex. And did you get innovation into other areas other than cortex? No, no, I mean, I, I didn't show those data. We actually have mapped all the different regions, and most they were cortical to cortical okay. innovation. They were colossal projections, so that was quite wide. But we wouldn't say that they are all perfectly matching the normal distribution, so there might also be some abnormal innovation. This is still what you're looking at, but it's quite widespread. Yep, this will be, I think, part of the discussion we'll have later. So we're going to switch uh, cell types now. I'm going to be speaking about uh, chimerization, uh, th at least with regards to the uh, to the definition of chimerization used in this uh, in the second uh, workshop. Um, meaning an admixture of cells, uh, transpecific. But uh, looking at the, the glial cell populations of the brain as opposed to the neuronal. As many of you know, I worked on uh, and still do. Uh, neurons and neurogenesis, neuronal production for many, many years. Uh, but in the process of isolating different uh, progenitor populations from human brain, some years back, uh, I realized that the glial progenitor cell population was so much more abundant uh, than the neuronal progenitors and the neural stem cell populations of the human that, uh, from the clinical standpoint, I became much more interested in the glial progenitor population. So, of course, glial progenitors are derived like neuronal progenitors from neural stem cells. Glial progenitors go on to generate astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, the two major supporting cell phenotypes of the brain. And as I we'll see a little bit here, that we believe they do a bit more than just support now. They really are an integral part of, uh, of nervous system function. So I'm starting out with a slide I usually conclude with, but really to, to, to cut to the chase on, uh, uh, on a number of the issues here. So we, we can obtain glial progenitors from a number of different sources, from fetal tissue, of course, uh, but also from embryonic stem cells, from iPS cells, even by direct induction. Now, lots of ways to get these cells. We can then sort them on the basis of a variety of markers that will play out different stages of glial progenitors, but basically, we're looking at a bipotential phenotype, a glial, a human glial progenitors, unlike those of, of rodents, unlike those of most lower species that have been looked at. And in the apes and humans, glial progenitors are uh, bipotential for astrocytes or oligodendrocytes up until their last division. And so the terms in the literature, oligodendrocyte progenitor and glial progenitor, are really synonymous, and I'll, I'll use both, but uh, they are synonymous. So we, we've worked out the methods over the years for obtaining highly enriched populations, purified, if you will, of glial progenitors from these various sources. Uh, for fetal tissue, uh, actually we have a, a, a trial now funded uh, at a similar stage as, as Lawrence is also funded by, by NYSTEM uh, for using fetal tissue-derived glial progenitors uh, for, for remyelination in uh, progressive multiple sclerosis. Uh, but that, that, that's just by way of one example of the many disease targets that we're looking at as potential recipients of glial progenitor cell-based transplants for purposes of remyelination. So our focus was initially on oligodendrocytes, for generating oligodendrocytes from glial progenitors and using those as transplantable cells for inducing remyelination. And it's a long list of diseases, both, both pediatric and adult, and we're actually op very optimistic about this, this whole class of disease, the white matter diseases, as potential recipients of the strategy. So it's really more of a platform for, for treating a broad variety of neurologic disease than it is looking at a single disease. But it was in the context of that work that we, of course, had to come up with uh, good animal models for, for doing so, and for looking at these various uh, uh, diseases at, at, in the preclinical stages. And realized that um, uh, many of the uh, models that had existed um, uh, were limiting in terms of looking at uh, demyelinating injuries in, in adult uh, rodent brains. So we went to 
uh, to congenital models of hypermyelination and specifically focused on one that was mentioned briefly before, the shiver or mouse, which is a hypermyelinated mutant. Shivers don't make any myelin basic protein. They die young, they're like clockwork by 20 weeks of age. As they get older and their axons get longer, the conduction failure becomes more and more profound, and finally they die typically, again, in 20 weeks. And so they never make myelin basic protein, and so any myelin that one sees in a shiver of brain has to be donor-derived, and so it's become a very uh, useful model from that standpoint. We developed a, uh, an injection strategy, basically five injections turned out to be enough to cover all the contiguous white matter tracts of the CNS, and so that allows complete CNS penetration of the cells, because as we'll see, they're highly migratory. These are the doses. We have a number of different hosts depending upon what we're trying to do, but, but most of what I'll talk about here, we're putting the cells into uh, shiver mice that have been crossed to an immunodeficient strain, so these, these are myelin deficient and immune deficient. We give the cells neonatally, and basically this, this allows chimerization with astrocytes and oligodendrocytes as produced by the glial progenitors. Really cutting to the chase, the, the migration is widespread and then slowly over time the myelination proceeds and all these cells uh, mature. Well, not all, but many stay as progenitors, but uh, the, the uh, vast majority become either astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes go ahead and myelinate, and th this is what one sees at the end of the day. The end of this mouse's day was 13 months after uh, injection. I mentioned before that they all die by 20 weeks otherwise. So this is a rescue strategy. The animals that are, that are appropriately transplanted are rescued. They recover a normal neurologic phenotype. There are various neurologic impairments that uh, had, had evolved over time, but essentially abate. And they go on to have normal lifespans. We can take these animals out to the normal couple-year lifespan of a mouse just fine. This is an animal that we killed at 13 months. The myelination pattern is indistinguishable from that of a normal mouse. But it, it takes a lot of cells to give that much myelin. And so here's the, of course, the myelin basic protein. This is all human pattern in the mouse. But these are the matched sections. And every red dot, of course, these are very low power images, but every single red dot is a human cell. And you get the feeling that uh, there are a lot of human cells in these brains. And that became really the topic of, of interest, to, especially insofar as today's session is concerned. Because we realized that uh, there were so many human cells, and this is a single 14 micron section here by way of example, that was it's simply montaged in the XY plane. There are so many human cells that uh, you start to wonder where the mouse cells are. And it turns out that, uh, at least for the glial progenitor population, over time there are no mouse cells. So they're the, it's, it's actually more of a replacement than it's a chimerization at a certain point in time. So here we're looking, uh, by, by way of example, at four months, eight months, 12 months. These are cortical strips uh, that we take from the ventricular surface out to the peel surface. And you can see at four months after neonatal graft, the human cells, which are in green, and here I should mention we, we stained for a, a, a protein that's um, chondroitin sulfate proteoglycan type 4. It's recognized by the NG2 antibody. There are human and mouse specific epitopes of this antibody, uh, of this uh, protein, I should mention, uh, so that um, we, we then target with the two antibodies. And so we can separate uh, human versus mouse progenitors on that basis, or at least distinguish them accordingly. So the uh, human progenitor population is largely restricted to the white matter tract still because that's where it's expanding up until about four months of age. And most of the progenitors are still mouse. By the time we get out to eight months, the mouse cells have really been kicked out to the cortical surface, at least those that still survive. By 12 months, there aren't any mouse progenitors left. That turns out to be the case across the entire brain and subsequently the entire nervous system of these animals. So that they lose all the mouse progenitors. The human progenitors outcompete the mouse. There's a process of, of death of the uh, mouse oligoprogenitors that, that is occurring in situ as the, as the human cells uh, advance. And some of the uh, mouse cells actually appear to uh, pull up their processes and uh, are repulsed and actually will migrate out to the uh, cortical surface. We don't know what the differences are between those populations that just die in situ and those that actually uh, flee the scene, but, but, uh, but both of those events appear to occur. But we end up with brains where all the glial progenitors are mouse. The mouse progenitors, or, or, or human I should say, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, the, the human progenitors uh, you have a very, very distinct uh, structure and architecture. Uh, we, we often think of progenitors as little bipolar cells that, that are under, otherwise indistinguished. That's not at all the, the form that they take as resident progenitors in, in the nervous system. They're highly complex cells. They, they speak to one another and, uh, vis-a-vis uh, calcium transients and the calcium waves. 
Um, they receive synapses. It's, it's a very uh, active cell population. That, that it's, it's almost uh, too simplistic for us to call them progenitors. That just happens to be one of their functions. So th these mouse brains are completely replaced by these human progenitors, and then that has certain implications otherwise because astrocytes in the normal adult brain are turning over. They're replaced both by d division of other astrocytes, depending upon the condition, whether it's an injury or whether it's normal turnover, but they're also replaced by new production of astrocytes from endogenous progenitors. In this case, all the progenitors are human. So as the, as the um, uh, cycling astrocytes are lost, uh, slowly but surely, the uh, astrocytes that are added to the system are human. And so over time, these brains become more and more human astrocytic as well as human glial progenitor infiltrated. And so here we're looking at uh, seven months, so all the green cells here are human astrocytes. Basically, the white matter is now completely replaced in terms of its astrocytic composition by human cells. And now the, uh, the uh, underlying, uh, or overlying, I should say, cortex is largely becoming infiltrated by protoplasmic astrocytes as well of human origin. And so by the time you're at it about a year, in these animals, all the glial progenitors are human. Most of the, uh, all, all the fibrous astrocytes are human, and most of the protoplasmic astrocytes of the forebrain are human as well. If you do this in the shiver mouse, and uh, this I should mention is in a, in a wild type, uh, uh, myelin wild type. If you do it in a shiver, then of course all the oligodendrocytes are human as well. And so a one-year-old shiver that's been transplanted at birth, all the oligodendrocytes, all the progenitors, most of the astrocytes are human. So it's a largely humanized brain from the standpoint of its glial composition. So that in itself has other implications because uh, human astrocytes and mouse astrocytes are really different. Um, and one can argue about the differences from species to species where neurons are concerned, but the astrocytic lineage is one that clearly has undergone really significant uh, evolution. So, so with uh, and with phylogeny, there's a progressive increase in size of, of human astrocytes and complexity. This is a typical mouse protoplasmic astrocyte, a couple of fibers. Uh, th these are the same magnification. Human astrocytes, uh, much, much larger, many, many more fibers. Of course, they've got the one or more infeed out to blood vessels, but most of the fibers coming out of astrocytes uh, are directed at synapses and will envelop and ensheath individual synapses. And so whereas a mouse astrocyte may cover, oh, depending upon the region of, uh, of brain, layer of cortex, may, may cover an average of 1,000 synapses, a, uh, a human protoplasmic astrocyte, anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000, depending upon estimate and how it's been calculated. So th these, these have much more, uh, much larger, I should say, domains in terms of the number of synapses that they are controlling, and, and uh, make no uh, mistake about astrocytes do control neurons in terms of establishing the gain for synaptic plasticity, the, uh, the, the levels at which uh, um, uh, given neurons will fire. Those are determined by the, uh, the intrasynaptic glutamate and potassium levels that, that are established in large part by astrocytic uptake of, of those molecules. Um, the result is that uh, all the synapses within a given astrocytic domain or to some extent being coordinated. We don't really understand how that plays out computationally yet, but, but uh, we did wonder what would happen to these brains by virtue of now being replaced with human astrocytes that are so, so different from the mouse. And uh, in order to uh, ask that question, we had to know that the human cells were remaining cell autonomous, uh, the, the human glia were, in the mouse environment, turns out that is the case. And so here we're looking at a year after we've transplanted GFP tagged human glial progenitors, and they clearly have adopted the, the very complex and large morphologies of human protoplasmic astrocytes. That allowed uh, um, us to, this is largely Mike and Niedergaard's work, uh, um, looking at the, uh, essentially the electrophysiology of the neurons in, uh, in, in various regions of the brains of these animals. Here we're looking at the hippocampus, and you see greatly facilitated long-term potentiation in the chimeric versus uh, the non-chimeric control mouse. And that suggested that there may be behavioral differences. Long-term potentiation, of course, is, uh, is one of the tests we use to, to look at synaptic plasticity, and that, in turn, uh, predicts, to some extent, learning potential. The, the, the next question became, are, are, the more, are the mice any smarter for, the, for this? And uh, you know, one can be glib in terms of how you, you define smarter, but, but they, they certainly have uh, very different behavioral characteristics. This is just one test where uh, it's a fear conditioning, auditory fear conditioning. The animal is exposed to a, a uh, sound after being shocked. They, they don't like to be shocked. 
Um, and basically, they, they freeze whenever they hear a sound after that because they will associate that sound with the shock. And the, the question is, how quickly do they make that association? And the chimeric animals, the human transplanted, make that association much more rapidly. This is, uh, these are daily tests uh, every day after a, a single day where they've received the sound after uh, the shock after the sound. And so basically, these animals learn very quickly and uh, reinforce that learning more quickly. This is just one test of many novel object and place recognition, Barnes maze testing. Across a broad variety of tests, these animals proved, uh, proved well, if you will, smarter, but, but they were able to uh, make those associations more quickly. Uh, so we look, then looked at this as, the poss as, as a, uh, a possible way to ask what the glial contributions were since we, we became really at this point fascinated with, with the role of glia in, in neural network activity and uh, th therefore p p the potential for uh, astrocytic um, uh, contributions to neural network pathology in, in m many of the uh, neuronal diseases. And so uh, we established the methods for making glial progenitors from ES and IPS cells. This was done largely from the therapeutic standpoint, frankly, for having more expandable sources for, for some of our parallel work in trying to use these cells as myelinogenic vectors. Uh, but in the meantime, it gave us the means to to take uh, um, disease-specific, patient-specific cells, make glia from them, gliaprogenitors, and then to set up um, base, basically disease models where we have chimeric animals that are engrafted uh, with the glia that are patient-specific or disease-specific to ask what are the specific contributions of glia to that disease pathology. You know, there are lots of neurodegenerative and neuropsychiatric disorders where we've just assumed that the disorders are largely neuronal, but because there's no, never been any way to specifically access the, uh, the role or contribution of uh, gliopathology. So we've done this now with a number of diseases. For today's purpose, I'm just going to, uh, to bring up one. We still haven't published this, but, but it, in many ways it's the most interesting, which is the schizophrenia. And so we took uh, patients with uh, juvenile onset schizophrenia, uh, there are a number of different genes involved in that, uh, and this was more of a discovery effort up front because we took cases where we had very, very strong family histories and knew that these were her hereditary cases, but we didn't know the genes up front. And this is work done with Paul Teaser at, uh, at Cleveland Clinic. And so uh, we, we took these uh, uh, patients, who oh, gee whiz, we're probably up at about 15 of them now, and made uh, uh, IPS cells from the uh, donated fibroblasts, and then glial progenitors from those IPS cells, and then set up the glial chimeras with the schizophrenic, or if you will, schizophrenia patient-derived glia. And that gives us uh, single animals, where each animal, of course, is patient-specific and, and is bearing either uh, normal uh, age and gender-matched glia or schizophrenic. And here we're looking uh, at uh, a typical control versus a, a schizophrenic. Um, and you already see, and this is one of the, the first ones, but it turned out to be, be the case across all these lines, uh, the, the, the normal pattern of distribution early on of the infiltration of the glial progenitors and glia into the white matter tracts initially and subsequently out into, into cortical gray uh, of these uh, recipient mice. And when you look at the schizophrenic uh, IPS-derived glial progenitors, you see there's much more rapid dispersal out into the in the overlying cortex, not as much resonance within the white matter. Now, of course, if there's not as much glial progenitor resonance in the, in the white matter of a shiver mouse, uh, you know, what's the substrate for myelination? Well, it turns out there's not as much substrate for myelination because there's not as many progenitors. And so those animals, you know, the schizophrenic versus control, control up above, schizophrenic below, you see the much sparser white matter that's developed in this uh, shiver mouse from the schizophrenic glial progenitors than the wild type, uh, than the control derived uh, uh, counterpart. And so that, that actually matches the uh, phenotype of, of uh, juvenile onset schizophrenics who are notably uh, 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 quite hypermyelinated. That's actually become a, a, a pre manifest uh, means of diagnosis of these cases. And it turns out that uh, by the same token, the glial progenitor differentiation along the oligodendrocyte lineage is, is perturbed. Uh, that it is along the astrocytic uh, as well. So here we're looking at a control patient versus a schizophrenic patient below. We're looking at gliofibrillary acidic protein five months after neonatal graft, a normal pattern of astrocytic production from the human glial progenitors above, and it's very delayed. Here you hardly see any, all the little yellow dots here, those are all human cells, very, very dense engraftment. Very few have matured as astrocytes by this point. They eventually do catch up, but it's a slow process. 
And so that has behavioral um, implications because if you don't have uh, astrocytes uh, that are mature and controlling the synapses of, of these animals, then uh, one might anticipate some, some behavioral effects. And in fact, I'll close with these couple of slides here just to make the point, these animals are behaviorally abnormal. And here we're looking at um, pre-pulse inhibition, which, which is a standard test of sensory motor gating. It's uh, typically perturbed in schizophrenia, human schizophrenics as well as schizophrenic models. And in fact, it was quite perturbed and uh, it's quite deficient in these uh, schizophrenic uh, glial engrafted animals. Uh, so something that would be anticipated in a normal disorder it was quite a surprise uh, in, in these animals where, again, only the glia are changed. And, and then uh, here we're looking at a number of different behavioral tests. The bottom line is that the schizophrenics in, in each of these cases uh, showed either increased anxiety, depending upon the output measure one is looking at, or decreased uh, socialization behavior. That turned out to be a really common set of defects across all the lines that we looked at. And by all the lines, I mean these are all different uh, schizophrenic patients that uh, we, we generated these lines from. And uh, uh, so it turns out to be a common set of behavioral sequelae to glial uh, chimerization uh, from, uh, uh, from th these uh, schizophrenic, uh, juvenile onset schizophrenic cases. And so th it's clear that um, uh, there's a behavioral um, output to the glial humanization, if you will, of, of these brains. Um, and that uh, you know, it, it's always hard to make a direct leap from a given especially psychiatric pathology, to, uh, to its mouse counterpart. And so, so I don't want to uh, uh, trivialize it by making the direct uh, um, uh, correlation in terms of, say, anxiety testing or socialization testing in, in a mouse and, and trying to, to uh, infer that that necessarily corresponds to those disorders in, in, in humans. But, uh, but what is clear is that uh, the schizophrenic glial cell is very different from a normal glial cell and has significant effects on the processing of the neural networks, and that in turn results in, in a pathologic uh, phenotype. So that, that's the kind of analysis one can do in terms of using these chimeras uh, for, um, you know, for, for essentially assessing the role of a given cell type in, in disease, and uh, it becomes particularly useful when one's talking about uh, uh, cell types where the contribution of that, uh, of that cellular phenotype uh, has never really been understood. So we can use it as a discovery tool at the same time that we can use these chimeras essentially to, uh, to, to establish not only disease models but means of new, uh, of, of new therapeutics. Um, and I'll close with that. All the panelists could move up to the front, and we will um, have a discussion session um, until about 2.15. I think I'd like to start by giving the speakers an opportunity to reflect on the, the other speakers' talks and see if there's anything they'd like to add to um, either what they contributed. Udo? Sonia? To, to Steve, just a question. Do you think that you, you said that glial cells could be useful for therapy in humans? Is there any reason to think that they would have such a potential to spread into the human brain as they do in the interspecies chimeras? Yeah, so the question is uh, xenograft versus allograft. What will, their, uh, what will their performance be? So we, we've done the allograft experiments in terms of t just the uh, standpoint of transplantation. Uh, what, what kind of um, infiltration uh, do we get? And of course, we don't expect uh, competitive advantage in, in that setting. And so the glial progenitor, you know, it's, it's fundamentally early uh, medial ganglionic eminence uh, derived. These are highly migratory. 
Uh, we, we've done this in adult uh, brains, uh, rats and monkeys, as well as, as mice, and, and the cells remain highly migratory in, in all those settings and will infiltrate uh, essentially the entire brain of each of these uh, recipient species. What they won't do is, is preferentially expand in the allograft setting re relative to um, uh, th their clear relative expansion in the um, uh, xenograft setting. Now, in, in the xenograft setting, of course, we're dealing with human outcompeting mouse, whatever that means, right? or whatever it's based upon. What, uh, what, what we are banking on in the setting of at least some of the disease targets that we're looking at is a relative uh, competitive advantage of the healthy cell over the sick cell, the healthy cell over the disease cell, or the healthy cell over a non-existent cell. So many of the hypomyelinating disorders that we're looking at, uh, you know, we're replacing phenotypes that are extremely deficient or simply aren't there or have already died off from storage disorders. In the uh, progressive multiple sclerosis cases that, uh, that we hope to soon take clinical, those, um, uh, those are cases where the uh, uh, oligodendrocytes are long since gone, and there are large areas that are, that are denuded but relatively stable in terms of inflammatory disease and relatively stable in terms of persistent axonal complement. And we have modeled that in multi, uh, um, uh, multiple lesion, uh, lysolecithin lesion, adult rat brain, and the cells will migrate throughout um, where they find an area that's demyelinated, where there's naked axons, basically, which, which we suspect are the signal, there's preferential expansion at those sites, and then they go ahead, become oligodendrocytes, and myelinate. And so, at least for, for disease targets where we're dealing with um, relatively uh, deficient host cells, th that's what we're banking on in ter terms of that, uh, hoping to see that competitive advantage revealed. Uh, where we, where we uh, uh, would be going into disease targets where the, uh, the underlying cell population that we're trying to replace might not be so overtly um, disadvantaged, that, that might be more problematic. And that's, that's something we're going to have to sort out on a disease by disease basis. So one of the things that seems to be apparent even within the small sampling of investigators is that the amount of engraftment is quite different. And the uh, homing and the targeting of the cells is really quite different. Maybe we could discuss that a little bit. Is it, do you think the answer is, let's put the cell type uh, on, on, on the side for a moment and talk about neurons first, because it seems like there's a, a clear difference in the astrocytes. But in terms of timing um, and targeting, uh, whereas Lawrence is suggesting that transplanting the substantia nigra to the striatum gives uh, a targeted, would you say, uh, innervation, or uh, it does not seem to be the case so much in the cortical transplants? I mean, I think the main targeting aspect of it is really the, the target of the fibers. So, I mean, they are obviously an ectopic graft. They make a mini substantia nigra in the stratum, but the fibers are exquisitely specific, so they never go into the cortex, they never go into the wrong region, and that's very similar to what has been described as fetal tissue before. And so even in this cortical so as I tried to show in the, in the end of my presentation, that was also, we think, quite similar, that they basically follow passes that correspond to their identity. So as I, I think the, the targeting seems to occur at the reasonable level, even in a mismatched, age-mismatched setting, which again was not necessarily completely clear, but that seems to be yep. the case. Even though the timing is still mismatched, yep. they kind of go to the right direction. And yet, in the cortex? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'd agree with everything Lauren is saying. I think the, the one variable we've seen is the progenitor migration. And that, that so, because we deliberately, it's quite, because of their therapeutic interest, we tended to put in more developmental material when it's mm -hmm. a mixture of progenitors. And those progenitors we can find migrating huge distances into striatum. And then they'll do neurogenesis when they get to those sites, but make ectopic cortical neurons. So, so it's a slightly different experiment in that respect. The ones which are cortical, I agree, project appropriately. No, I think there are actually at least three stages in the, in the process. So if you graft very early neuroepithelial cells, and if done that side by side with those last studies, they actually symmetrically expand for a long time, presumably. They are destined to try to make a human-like brain, and they actually make a tumor. Even if they're not transformed, they can kill the animal. They just expand. If you go to the intermediate stage, then you get these cells, these progenitors that migrate all over the 
the brain quite long distances. And if you go to a stage when they just become neurons, then they usually, most neurons sit where you put them, but the fibers are specific. <laughs> there are a few neurons, like cortical interneurons, that actually still can migrate even at the neuronal stage. So it's, one needs to understand the very specific stage. There's no like one ruler that fits all, but there is a, a very clear logic behind it and that, that can be understood. How about the neural crest? I mean, it seems like it, these, these uh, ES cells are not, even when put in at the right time point, they don't seem to be surviving. Yeah, so I think, we are, I think our differentiation protocols clearly, I would think, uh, makes uh, more mature cells than these primary cells are. I mean, they clearly can make all lineages so in, in culture. So they can do that. So from that point of view, they're multipotent. But I think just the comparison between the mouse primaries and the mouse ES cell derived ones says they're just really limited what they can do. They stay, even if the niches are empty in the W mm -hmm. host, they stay where the, they probably get into the, through the neural pore, into the, through the epithelium, into the um, epidermal space. Um, in dermal space. So I guess we have to learn to make these um, cells, manipulate them, to express genes in those which gives them a more immature, um, immature phenotype. Right. right. So let's open it up to some questions from the audience. Yes, Walt. So I want to get to the, the issue of endowing human behavior by introducing these, these human neural cells in, into animals. So in, in our studies in our lab where we inject, where we transplant human uh, nigro dopamine neurons into uh, rodent models of uh, Parkinson's disease, we've, we've never seen, you know, a change in their, you know, we've never seen a, a behavior that, that looked like it was human. We did, we've never seen a, a, a rat walk on its hind limbs, for example, um, or, you know, for any sustained period of time. And so I, I'm wondering, uh, I'd like to sort of get you know, the response from each of the panel members, of whether they think that if, if um, human uh, nigro dopamine neurons were transplanted into a, uh, a porcine model of Parkinson's disease, do you think that you would see a, a human motor behavior? And, and whether if we created those human nigro neurons by blastus complementation, whether you think that we would see human locomotor behavior? I guess Lawrence could take a shot at that. Yes, I think that's very difficult to answer, obviously. I don't think we, we know enough how those cells would be different and how the regulation is different. I mean, as long as I think as they find the right target, they know how to distinguish D1, D2 receptor, target neurons, and they're in the right numbers, I think there's not much evidence that they would behave in any way that you could distinguish that differently because that motor function is relatively simple. You modulate a specific circuit with dopamine, so I would be surprised if you would see anything very human-specific in motor behavior. I think that would be controlled more from your motor cortex, maybe changed in cerebellum. But I don't think it would be the, the dopamine component that would be enough to give you a human-like behavior that you could easily distinguish. And again, I mean, there were experiments done with even pig cells into humans. That was actually done with fetal cells. They didn't survive very well. But there were all kind of cross-species experiments done. And basically, the species seem to work as long as they produce enough dopamine at the right site and if they are of the right subtype of dopamine neuron. So, I guess so, so the question goes a bit to Steve, uh, Dr. Goldman, about the enhanced behavior that he's seeing. Is that, I, I suspect that's part of your, your question. What is the nature of that, or how do you explain that? So... Okay, so, so let's take a step back from motor behavior, which, which in a way is a bit more restricted and one wouldn't necessarily expect to see a, a, a new competency revealed in a relatively hardwired network. Um, when one's uh, discussing cognition or intellectual processing, um, basically uh, higher cognition, however defined, then of course there, there's more room, if you will, you know, in, in terms of uh, manifestation of new phenotype. Um, I, I would not uh, ever go so far as to say that anything that, uh, uh, that we've seen is endowing the animals with any human-like traits or behavior. What we are seeing 
or differences in the level of performance of those animals relative to untransplanted controls. Um, one way to look at it is that we're not changing the neuronal, uh, at least the growth structure of the neuronal network. We think we actually are changing significantly the microstructure in terms of dendritic structure, architecture, spine density, this kind of thing. But, but the growth architecture is not changing. And so effectively we're, we're maximizing the potential, if you will, of that neural system. Uh, we're, not, we're not endowing it with new new capabilities that it didn't have before, we're maximizing what that system is, is capable of outputting. Now that's in the normal setting, if you will. Then in the setting of disease, you know, effectively we're, we're asking the question of whether or not there is a significant contribution of glia, whether astrocytes or progenitors or oligodendrocytes or combinations of the three, uh, whether whether those glia have a significant contribution to a neurologic phenotype that has otherwise by default been considered neuronal. And one of the output variables we look at there is behavior, and if we see that there are significant uh, changes and differences in behavior, then we can say, yes, there are effects of glia on that behavioral output, which has significance in terms of understanding the disease process and significance in, in some settings in, as potential treatment modalities. I don't know that we're actually uh, conferring any new capabilities on the animal um, uh, or, or any behaviors that they were not otherwise uh, on some level innately capable of. Yes? Just following up on that, and, and forgive me, you may have said this, but you said your controls were non-transplanted controls. Did you have non-human transplanted controls as well? Did you see the same performance increase if the transplants were, were from another species, non-human? Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's there's multiple experiments mixed up there. So, uh, uh, or combined, I guess. Um, in looking at the effects of glial transplantation on, or glial uh, chimerization on um, cognitive functioning, we had controls that were mouse allografted, okay, so same species controls and untransplanted. Also uh, you know, saline sham. Uh, the mouse allograft saline sham controls in the untouched animals were all the same. There's no, no differences. I think one of the graphs had showed that. Okay, so that was in the, in the context of looking at the effects of glial normal cognition. In the disease chimeras, in all those cases, we were taking to the extent possible age and sex matched patients and making glial progenitors identically from those and putting, putting those in. So one of the issues that we're supposed to be addressing here are, uh, are there any technical barriers to uh, what's been going on? And I, I think un, uh, differentiating this session from the earlier sessions, are the goals here were not to make tissues for transplantation, but rather using the cells either to model human disease or as potential therapeutics. So the chimera experiments were done as a precursor for transplantation into humans. In the case of modeling, however, the chimera itself is the, is the goal. And I guess for the panels, do you, where, do, where are we within our objectives of those two? Yeah. You no, know, maybe more technically for to, to Lawrence. Is there an advantage? in putting your neural precursors into an E12 embryo as opposed to the much easier way to do it in a newborn? I mean, I think it's very important for, for each cell you're interested, for each stage you're interested to find the optimum, mm -hmm. optimal stage. And for some cells, it seems to not matter so much. They can survive and to some extent at least uh, hook up at all those stages. But there are good examples again where this hasn't been properly addressed. When we are very interested in cortical interneurons, and the many examples, again, again, this has to do with the timing issue. When can they properly integrate? Do they need to migrate before they properly connect up? And I think those studies you obviously would have to do at the moment when they are born so that they have the right adhesion, that they basically interact properly from the early stage, go through the whole process. But then you get nearly back to the chimera system, though you might be able to hit that early window and then it's again out of sync. And so I think it will be very interesting to see clearly in the 
the chimeras we discussed in the morning, there's a huge gap because the differences are just getting very quickly go out of hand. So the question is now in, from the nervous system, like where do these differences get smaller and smaller and where can they catch up? And so in the adult, they can to some extent do it at a late stage. And I think there are beautiful examples for them in the eye for photoreceptors where people have tried to get them to integrate and they tried every stage from embryonic stages to very late stages. And it was particularly Robin Hood and they found, I think it's exactly P5 where they can do it. And so, so there is a very specific stage where the environment is such that they can integrate. And so I think it's, you cannot easily say, you know, that's, you need to do one or the other. I think for each cell, you might have to find the optimal stage for integration. And in some, it might not matter as much. But for, the, for your purposes of what you're trying to achieve, for all of you, do you feel that the sort of models that you've developed so far are adequate for their purposes? Or are you, you know, living with the shortcomings that you have of the model and you're happy with that, or are there things that you're planning to do or ways that you could improve what's going on in your model system? So, Rick, if you want to... Yeah, um, I think we've been a little surprised in that, like I was mentioning earlier, we, historically, if you just want to try and you know, graft neurons into a healthy adult rodent, it's not terribly good, as you know well. Um, so we sort of came from a position where we thought it was going to be rather challenging. And it's turned out to be the other, we had to go back now and that's analogous to what Lawrence was saying was was put in neurons of a defined type at a defined age and remove the proliferation side of it. This the more developmental aspect. But it doesn't remove the other point which I think Lawrence made very nicely um, even from the the the, um, the grafting studies, which is the maturation problem. You know, and I think I think the, we we're, certainly we're bumping up this time and again that, that the, the species difference from mouse to human is so enormous. It's useful for small reductionist questions that can become quite challenging for doing more complex things. Think about neurons, not so much astrocytes. In your case, Rudolf, in terms of the neural crest, how, how, are you, how is that going so, to, in, in, how are we going to increase that, or is that your I think, goal? Well, I think one, one technical way would be you know genes which are important for proliferation. I mean, there are so many there, and which are important for certain uh, proliferative diseases of the neural crest. So you can put these genes into the cells, make them doxycycline usable, and see whether that improves. Same way you can um, humanize your mice by whatever means to, to make this more easy to, you know, I think, um, do these stem cell factors work all optimally or not. You can make these mice. So I believe there's a lot of, um, lot of room for improvement and make this more efficient. Ultimately, all of this is artificial because we're dealing with single cell types or single categories of cells, and you can't reproduce the system until they're all there. And, and so then it becomes a question of, of chimerizing across phenotypes to try to generate structure that is very much homologous to human. And, you know, of course, that probably is a good segue into the third session. Uh, in terms of what the limitations might be on those types of, uh, of experiments conceptually and otherwise. But uh, ultimately what we're trying to model, of course, is the human brain. And in, until we can um, uh, essentially take all these reductionist strategies and put them together into a more coherent whole that include uh, multiple phenotypes acting together, uh, you know, all of the models are inherently deficient but by virtue of, uh, of, of not including all phenotypes. Maybe one more point again also about this idea of getting kind of a, a more complex structure and grafted, including many neurons. I mean, I think one challenge which is not always clear to many people is that you can not just simply take a simple neural stem cell with current techniques, inject it, and it's going to make all the neurons in the brain. It looks like actually that the neural cells, like Rick has cortical progenies, they're already limited to that region. And so one big question or challenge is, again, we try to do that technically, it's still too difficult to do is, it's nearly again back to the chimera. So what if you make really truly neural plate cells? So we think at the very early neural plate cells, there might be a very short window, maybe as short as for those stages that Rudy mentioned, where cells actually do respond to the cues and can respond. So if you could graph them at E8 or something like that, or would then actually, would you be able to replace whole regions of the brain with human cells? And I think that technically, currently has not been possible because the roller tube culture from Jakobson and I said they obviously stopped at that stage. 
and other techniques. It's too early for the ultrasound guide injections reliably. But that would be at least a conceptually interesting thing if you can do that, if you can replace whole pieces there, what would happen at that stage? Other, so, I mean, to that extent, to what extent are we uh, considering whole tissue or whole organ or regions of brain transplantation? So, it, an experiment, obviously, I don't know that you've done yet, is have you humanized the glial population and then grafted neuro, human neurons to that population with the idea that is coming up from the, from the, from the speakers that the, the niche is important. This came up in the morning discussion. So if you change the niche, the glial niche of the rodent, would these cells then integrate better and survive or migrate further? Have you, have you gone there yet? <coughs> All I can do is smile, because that's what we're doing now. We're trying to get there. You know, specifically, we're doing it in the striatum um, with uh, medium spiny neuron progenitor grafts concurrent with the, uh, uh, with the glial chimerization. Uh, but one could, uh, you know, depending upon, and that's because of a specific interest in, in that case in Huntington's disease and the role of glia in that disorder. But the fact of it is that one could look at any uh, especially subcortical structures, but but any defined compartment or structure of the brain, and think in those terms of of, of uh, swapping out, if you will, um, both healthy for diseased and diseased for healthy, both uh, phenotypes, and, um, and and to do so in the setting of replacement or, um, with uh, with human phenotypes of otherwise uninvolved cells to uh, to, to fully model the system. Uh, the Huntington's example I'll bring up here because it's, it's an interesting one from my standpoint. We um, wanted to see what the contribution of glia were in Huntington's. This is all, all unpublished, but it's, you know, it's a reasonably solid story now. And we see a, uh, a, the development of a motor phenotype uh, in, in animals that uh, are chimerized only in the striatum with Huntington glia. And these are Huntington ES derived glial progenitors. And so then. Uh, if one can see the development of a disease phenotype just on the basis of the glial replacement, then the flip side of that would be that well, perhaps one could rescue normal phenotype from a Huntington animal with normal glia. And that, that's turned out to be the case as well. And so, so, so there's the, the, the distinction between the modeling and the therapeutic side of things is not that hard and fast, but one really leads to the, to the to the other, and can do so in, in, in really unexpected fashion. We, we certainly didn't expect to conclude that glial transplants would be beneficial in Huntington's disease. We were simply trying to uh, model what, what the effects of glia were, or what the role of glia were in, 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 the, in the striatal pathology. Um, but but in, in fact, it can be relatively fluid as one learns f about the role of one phenotype in a disease process what that might mean in terms of potential treatment of that disease. And, and if anything, from my own perspective, as far as the, how these chimerization studies across groups have played out over the years, that's, that's been the lesson for me, how, how, how readily some of this translates to, to new therapeutic strategies. So a, a, a related, if I keep on track here with the questions that were... See, Janet keeps, keeps waving. I'm sorry, Janet. <laughs> Are you having a nice conversation up there? <laughs> um, very impressive. We focused mostly uh, in this session on uh, the mouse as the sort of recipient for the, for the human cells. And obviously it's remarkable how much you can model disease and how far you can go. But we heard particularly uh, um, from, from Rick, if you're looking to reconstruct the complexity of, of the uh, cortex and look at cognition, the mouse is not going to be the right partner. So. How important is it to think about uh, doing some of these experiments also in um, uh, non-human primates? And again, I think, Lawrence, you talked about this as a necessary step to the therapy, but are, knowing it's expensive, knowing it's difficult, et cetera, et cetera, what, is, what, what are people doing in that direction? So, I mean, right now, in terms of, of cortical stuff, rather than, say, than therapeutics, a lot of what people are doing is, is comparative work. So there's an awful lot of work being done 
looking across different non-human primates, trying to work out, you know, are the same elements there? What do the circuits look like? Because there's really, a, there's a lot of very basic biology that's missing. So it's not quite clear yet that you even need to go to the point where you'd start doing a human, pick another primate chimera within a cortex to understand human cortical function and where the line will be drawn then between what's possible in vitro in terms of circuit assembly, because there's sort of an extreme reductionism breaking out now, sort of along the lines of Steve mentioned about sort of modular models, that there's much more sort of neuroengineering happening now with the elements trying to build circuits, take an engineering approach from the ground up and understand those. So, so because that's in motion and the sort of comparative biology is in motion, I don't think there's been a huge drive yet to do any um, chimeras in non-human primates. I guess the related question to Janet's and one that was posed to the earlier group was, uh, would the use of cells from non-human primates instead of humans be informative, or do you think you could have or should have gone that direction before using human cells? I mean, for us, that's, I think, the same model as the same answer we heard in the morning, so I think you should probably use both. And it depends, again, on the question you want to ask, particularly with primates, non-human primate cells. that allows you to do allografting allo experiments, which are very interesting immunologically in the brain, and the many other examples, I think, where you would get the insights you need to have. Again, I have a very translational uh, experience, and when we talk to the FDA and we show them all this nice primate data, primate, they actually don't really care much. <laughs> they care really that you show them the final product, which is your human cells, because again, there's so much variability even within the human product that they will not at the end still see the human data, so there's no way you, you get around with just doing it in the non-human primate. But clearly there are many questions that can be addressed, and then it's a matter of which one is addressed better with which tool, which tools are available for human, for example, disease modeling and so on. And often actually, at least in our hands, the human tools are nearly more easily accessible or more broadly available than, than the primate. Yeah, if I could add to that also, but it is to, also just to uh, reiterate Lawrence's last point, the human cells uh, and, and models in many ways are more accessible. You know, sometimes the emphasis on non-human primate work just slows things up unnecessarily, frankly. But, but setting that aside, for the specific phenotype that... Um, that, that uh, I'm looking at here. The astrocyte, uh, the, the answer to, to Janet's question would be a resounding no, because there's a tremendous leap in astrocytic evolution that occurs as one goes from infraprimate mammals to primates to, to new world monkeys, old world monkeys, the great apes, and then humans. At each of those steps, there, there are, those, each of those evolutionary steps, there are morphologic changes in, in astrocytes, a, a greater a quantal leaps in their complexity, their size. So human astrocytes really are different. Um, you know, we've compared, and this is uh, Mike and Niedergaard's work, uh, the comparative study looking at, uh, at chimpanzees, and um, I think there was an orangutan in there, and uh, you know, the great apes versus the old and new world monkeys uh, versus uh, rodents. and. Um, uh, the only species that's close to human uh, are, are the are the chimps uh, in, in terms of astrocytic architecture, and even they don't have the uh, anything like the numbers or densities of these extremely complex uh, astrocytes that, that we have in our in, cort in our cortices. Uh, there are these long interlaminar um, uh, astrocytes with with fibers that traverse the entire cortex and seem to integrate the cortex in terms of calcium signals that uh, lower species don't have. And so, uh, in, in fact, modeling with, uh, uh, certainly with anything below the level of the great apes would be uh, counterproductive. So I, I, one point I'd like to add, because if we are thinking about, you know, we haven't quite got to, but, but ethical issues here, that if, if, you know, is there something by the time we use human cells, that there's some ethical issues we need to think about. Um, it might be a mistake, you know, to, to assume that all of a sudden those don't extend to primates or that there aren't other ethical issues on primates would be, I think, a mistake. And we would potentially be just be kicking a problem down the road. You know, I mean, we all know there's a movement around, you know, the sort of rights of primates, particularly ones that are closer to humans, whatever the rights and wrongs of it. But, you know, before one even thinks of the more general sort of animal health issues with, with, with every species. So, so I'm, I'm not sure a lot of the issues go away just by moving to another organism, actually. Finally to this, oh, sorry. 
We'll come back finally to the, um, the cognitive changes. This is the, the specific issue of the central nervous system. Um, so what are the types of cognitive and behavioral? We, we've had some, uh, we had clear evidence that the human cells can have an effect on the behavior of, of other species that are transplanted into. The Parkinson's is, example is probably the most striking uh, example. Uh, but we also now have uh, glial cells having a, some impact. Um, I guess it's the, it is, are there unique behaviors, unique human behaviors that one could monitor that are different from the host that emerge as a function of the cells that could be assessed in order to address this question of whether or not human, human type behaviors can occur. This is the, I don't know if I no, made no, the question I, 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 clear. I, I, I think it's something we, we, I th we, everybody thinks about, certainly, and discuss in their labs. And, and I think uh, probably the one word which none of us, I think we've all been tried to stay away from today, is sentience. And, and uh, you know, I don't think it's any great secret that the biology of that is not great. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, 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 so you know, and, and I think Steve put it very well, but it's a huge amount of headroom in terms of general neurological performance. And I think even the cognition word is tricky, actually, from mice. I mean, anyone who's done work with, say, mice versus rats knows that rats are actually far more, as it were, clever. You know, they perform far better on these tasks than, 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 than mice do. And I, I just think, in, in, in certainly the way we see it, and, and I think the view in the UK is that, that in the absence of having robust measures, as you say, human-specific behaviors are some measures of some, some, something involving sentience. Uniqueness. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's almost impossible to, to, to grasp. But the science simply isn't there, I think, is our feeling. Yeah, I mean, I'm also extremely skeptical that this is going to be a, a problem in any immediate future, no, just simply due to the biology. And there's a number of factors, just simply the differences in brain size and structure. No, I think you showed very nicely the difference there is. I mean, if there is anything close to a human functioning brain in a mouse, you would see it way before that, because the human, human brain is three pounds in size. No? So do, and even then, once it develops to that structure, it needs a long time to really properly form and to learn. And I think for us, the, the problem, again, the main challenge we see is this maturation problem, and that will further compound that. So by the time the mouse is already dead in, within the lifespan of the mouse, the brain wouldn't have enough time to even develop, to really develop human-like cognitive function, at least in the sense I understand. And again, I agree there are going to be certain changes and then this question how to interpret them is definitely very interesting, important in modeling diseases. But again, in the context of the fears in the public, I think they are not well-founded in biology, in my opinion. Yes. There you are. I guess one of the questions is, um, Would, the, would, would specific primate experiments be that much more informative uh, and, and yet because of concerns about these unknowables, these issues, they're not being done? I just want to understand if, if there's a space that we're not really entering because of the concerns and yet would there be a way to enter gently into that space using very, very strong scientific rationale? Or is it just not an issue? So, so I'll give you an example. Um, I mean, I, axiomatically, I'd say yes. Right? The, 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 there, are, there are instances and grounds. Sure, of course, of course. Um, but, but, but here's an example to, to be provocative, but it's one we've, we've thought about. Uh, so we have um, uh, mice with schizophrenic uh, glia who uh, on tests that are, are typically used to measure levels of anxiety are highly anxious. On other tests that are uh, typically used to uh, assess degree of socialization, they're highly antisocial. There are other cognitive defects that, that come up in this testing, but, but these two axes, anxiety and, and uh, antisocial behavior, uh, have, have turned out to be uh, consistent across all, all the patients we've looked at and all the mice generated from those patients. Now, does that tell me that we are seeing a, if you will, schizophrenic phenotype? And 
or glia, therefore, involved in those specific axes of human schizophrenia. One way to test that would be to take an old world monkey, chimerize it with human schizophrenic glia, and see whether we see the type of really higher level anxiety and paranoia, et cetera, that, that um, uh, aggression, et cetera, that, that one might uh, see, expect to see in a schizophrenic human, a schizophrenic patient. If that were the case, then the mice could actually be wonderful models for testing pharmacotherapeutics directed against those, those, uh, those types of behaviors. We would have much more to go on in terms of, of, of having a justification for, for doing a significant analysis of that gliopathology to see whether that should be a, a specific uh, drug and disease target. And we would have much more insight into the disease process in, uh, in humans. And of course, the, uh, the nature of that experiment, though, is that it would be controversial, and it's not something that uh, you know, I would necessarily send to NIH tomorrow. Um, hi, yes, uh, Dr. Clark from the Office of Animal Care and Use here as part of the Intramural Research Program. And I think the other question that's important to put out there, and while y'all are saying this, and, and perhaps it would be nice to have it emphatically said, which is sort of the flip side of all this, which is something I get as a veterinarian supporting biomedical research, is just because we can't completely replicate or we're not close to replicating the human brain by humanizing these mice, there still is benefit from doing this, whether it's through the biological understanding of the diseases or a, at least a, a helping us to understand the ther therapeutics that can come from that. So I would just ask that you comment to that as well. Um, I don't disagree at all. <laughs> So, so none of this is to none of what I just said was was to uh, um, minimize the value of the of the mouse models, uh, and, and of course I recognize as we all do the the issues that come up vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the animal welfare assurance uh, when when one talks about uh, chimerizing uh, old world monkeys to uh, uh, to induce a behavioral pathology. You know, there are significant issues there. And so the, the question, uh, the larger question becomes whether the societal benefit to doing so and therefore having an additional increment in both knowledge and, and modeling for, for the development of new therapeutics, wh whether or not that, that benefit that potentially could accrue to much larger numbers of patients uh, justifies the, the use of uh, relatively small numbers of uh, uh, of, of higher level animals. Anybody else want to take that on? No, I mean, I, I definitely would agree with what Steve said, and I guess the other, the other typical disease that's thought about in this context is autism, and that's again an example I think, which is very difficult to model in, in lower species, and where we had at least discussions on projects and trying to do that in non human primates in various ways. And we're in very specific regions trying to get chimerism, but we didn't really go ahead at that time because, again, of various complications, financial and, and also maybe regulatory. But I think there would be examples where, where this would be very valuable to consider. Yeah. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the elephant in the room is that there are experiments that I think scientifically many of us consider would be justifiable and yet we're reluctant to, to enter into because we do fear that there will be a lot of backlash. And, um, you know, I just, I wonder whether, you know, those, those discussions can really be had. I think you made the point, Steve, and I think it's a good one. Um, you know, in a small number of animals, to perform a really, really high value experiment, let's say in a, in a, in a rhesus or, or even in a, a, I mean, I think it's hard to, no one's using chimps anymore, but fundamentally, uh, you're otherwise, um, you might be doing that experiment in patients, and then you're, you're weighing the, the, the concerns and risks in that, in that context. I mean, and if you can point, justify George. that, 
even in a short term, as a way of validating perhaps the mouse model. It could be a, a very highly valuable experiment. I, I mean, I, I, I sort of, maybe it's time we dragged in the ethicists here. I actually think the numbers are, the numbers are kind of irrelevant. I mean, I think we either, it's either, we can either come up with an ethical or moral justification for doing it, or we don't. And then the numbers need to be proven because, as we all know, the worst thing to do is then underpower it. You know, so so I, I think, no, no, I think the power you know, the, has to be there. Yeah. It, yeah. But I, I mean, I understand the, the sort of the need the need to reassure people. Certainly, um, certainly in the Parkinson field, there's been a, a fair amount of primate work, uh, and that has provided additional information that would, was not available. In the in the human, I'm sorry, in the mouse. Do you want to speak to that sure. at all? I mean, it's it's actually seen in different ways depending on, on who yeah. you talk to. In yeah. the U.S., there is a very strong feeling, and actually even a need that the FDA tells us we need to have primate data to show mm -hmm. we can scale it up. We can do it with the same device we use in humans, and again, just simply to be able to show that it's possible and with a Parkinson's model that's reasonable in, in non-human primates. So I think. We definitely would like to include that, but there were actually studies done in Parkinson's grafting without any non-human primate data right. initially. And so it's still kind of a little bit of a controversy in the field how, how important it is. I think, again, it has clear, clear benefit to, in my opinion, but I don't think it's, again, a completely black and white issue either. It, it, it's interesting that we're talking about the use of human cells. We're not talking about the use of human cells. We're talking about the use of the host that's different in this case. Uh, and not really questioning whether or not you should use human cells as the, as the donor, S slightly turning things around a little bit. I think we've, uh, if there aren't any other questions, we're, we're, we're uh, eager to move on to the next session and, and bring the uh, other speakers to, to, to the meeting. Absolutely. So let's take um, a short break until 2.15, which puts us a little bit, 15 minutes ahead of time, and we can try to move forward. Thank Great. you. We will begin our third and final session of the day, which will be moderated by Hank Greeley, who's the Dean F. and Kate Edelman Johnson Professor of Law at Stanford University, where he also directs the Stanford Center for Law and Bioscience, uh, and the Bioscience and the Stanford Program in Neuroscience and Society. It's been a long day, Hank. I'm going to turn it's it over okay. to you. <laughs> it's a longer introduction than I needed, and it's a longer introduction than I'm going to give any of the speakers. Uh, my introduction for the speakers is their biographical materials are in your handouts, and we will move directly to them because we really want to leave as much time as possible for discussion after this, as I think the discussion after this is or should be the culmination of the day. I've asked the speakers to hold to a fairly tight timetable, and all speakers, I'm going to be holding these up. The taser comes out 30 seconds after the stop sign. Jonathan, you're first. Great. Thanks for the introduction, Hank. Gave your first name. So um, this is a little bit uh, outside my normal bailiwick, but uh, just bear with me. I'm going to get through this. So I'm here mainly to uh, represent the uh, perspective of uh, uh, the uh, International Society of Stem Cell Research, as probably almost everyone here hopefully knows. The ISSCR issued a series of guidelines in 2006 and 2008 covering human embryonic stem cell research as well as uh, clinical translation. We are in the midst of a process of revising these guidelines. The revisions will consist of a merger so that they actually are captured under one coherent uh, set, of, uh, set of guidelines. Now, in what I'm going to say about animal-human chimera research, there are a couple of contextual factors that uh, need to be considered with the ISSCR language. The first being that this is an international society. And that matters uh, in two key uh, respects. First of all, the guidelines are really aimed at establishing a core set of uh, consensus positions in ethics that establish a global baseline. So there may be very important political and uh, moral differences from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, the guidelines need to be relevant for all jurisdictions. The other issue is that the guidelines need to work in different uh, political or institutional contexts. And that means that the guidelines take a fairly light touch when it comes to actually recommending particular institutional mechanisms. Now, in this iteration of the guidelines, uh, they are preceded by a set of core principles. And these principles, I think, also matter for understanding what we say about animal-human chimeras. 
The preamble of the principles make a statement uh, along these lines that uh, we see the goal of ethics principles, at least a core goal, as helping to secure uh, uh, a core set of trust among the various stakeholders uh, who are uh, critical to the development of cutting edge science and clinical translation. So I think this is sort of goes along with what uh, Kathy Hudson said at the beginning, that part of what ethics is doing is stabilizing a set of relationships uh, among various stakeholders, the public, scientists, funders, et cetera. Now, we articulate five core principles, and there are two that I think really matter in this realm. The first is the integrity of the research enterprise, and the second is transparency. Uh, with respect to the former, the research needs to be performed in a way that's sustainable, so that's going to bring along a sense of uh, public trust. And the mechanisms for accomplishing that include mechanisms like peer review, transparency, and continued monitoring. And transparency rears its head again as a principle uh, in that uh, we emphasize the need for timely exchange of accurate <coughs> scientific information. I'm going to come back to that at the end of my presentation. Now, like pr practically every guideline out there on human animal chimera research, uh, we divide research into three broad categories, uh, green lighted, yellow lighted, and red lighted uh, activities. Uh, with the current iteration of the guidelines, which are still in draft form, they have not yet been finalized, um, there are certain activities that involve animal-human chimeras that are green-lighted. Uh, so, for example, certain routine research uh, assays like uh, teratoma formation assays uh, involving human embryonic stem cells, those are considered uh, uh, not to need uh, uh, basically review or at least heavy review. Certain activities are red-lighted or forbidden under the guidelines, namely uh, research in which human embryos or any products of research involving human totipotent or pluripotent cells are implanted in the human or non-human primate uterus. So this involves many kinds of uh, chimeric uh, 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 human embryonic stem cell animal studies. Uh, and the other broad category are research in which uh, animal chimeras incorporating human cells with the potential to form human gametes are bred to each other. So, this is reflecting a consensus that in broad brush uh, is, has been articulated in many other documents as well. Now, the statement about uh, yellow-lighted activity is, uh, takes the following form. So forms of research that generate chimeric animals using human cells that have the potential for high degrees of functional integration into animals' central nervous systems or to generate human gametes. And this is the category of research that uh, would then uh, come for come in for critical uh, scrutiny or oversight in, under the uh, jurisdiction of the uh, uh, Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee, uh, for example. Now, how exactly are those uh, committees supposed to review uh, these uh, proposals? Well, here we delegate uh, the, uh, in the guidelines uh, the elaboration of that review, uh, the review principles to a document that was published a few years back in Cell Stem Cell. Uh, that is an appendix in the guidelines. And there, the um, sort of foundational moral principles governing this realm are articulated. So the motivating concerns uh, that ought to drive review are, of course, consideration of a 14-day rule. And secondly, the issue of animal suffering. Uh, and there are different components of animal suffering that are uh, raised in that document. First of all, the need uh, to identify species typical functioning so that uh, enriched housing contexts, for example, can be uh, provided to animals. The prospect of emergence of sentience, which gives rise to different demands uh, for animals in terms of humane housing. And uh, the uh, appendix uh, of the guidelines also uh, notes the uh, concern of the prospect of the emergence of humanized mental attributes, which need to be approached extremely, extremely cautiously, according to uh, the, uh, uh, the appendix and the guidelines. Now, how do we sort of actually operationalize these motivating concerns? Uh, basically, by drawing on guidelines that are already actually pretty well established in the context of transgenic research. Good. So that's a pretty good overview there of what the ISSER guidelines say. Now, there are some points where there is daylight between what the guidelines in IHA, ISSER articulate and what other influential documents state as well, although there's a lot of consensus. And it took me a long time to, uh, to write this. The language is actually very subtle among these different guidelines. But um, I think this pretty well captures where there is overlap and where there, is, uh, there are differences between various influential documents that are out there on animal-human chimera research. I'll just highlight the four areas where there's some difference. So the ISSCR is more permissive with respect to routine uh, 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 assays, uh, for example, teratoma formation assays involving human embryonic stem cells, more permissive than the National Academy of Sciences guidelines, as I understand it. Tell me if I'm wrong. I've misread that. 
Um, there is a difference with respect to the UK position on humanizing the appearance or behavior of animals. So the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK put out a report that uh, uh, issues some cautions about that kind of activity. ISSCR and National Academy of Sciences are actually silent on the issue of humanized appearances or behaviors, per se. Uh, the addition of human, uh, plurip uh, human embryonic stem cells, pluripotent cells, to non-human primates, the NAS is uh, uh, very restrictive, uh, is restrictive about that. ISSCR has a somewhat more of a sort of cautionary uh, uh, view on that issue, a little bit more permissive. Um, and there's also some difference in, with respect to the issue of substantial functional integration of human cells into the non-human primate brain. I'd say the NAS and the ISSCR are a little bit more permissive than the UK uh, report, at least. Now, here are a couple other subtle differences. The National Academy of Sciences clearly blocks uh, any kind of mingling of human embryonic stem cells with non-human primate blastocyst, as I understand it. The ISSCR doesn't actually block that. What it blocks is the implantation into the uterus or uh, 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 support uh, beyond the 14 day. Um, actually, ISSCR, uh, for cells that are lacking human organismal uh, potential, actually potentially allows beyond 15 days. These are non-human embryos, after all, so it's really not that inconsistent with what we allow in animal research, but it's a subtle difference nonetheless. Uh, also, uh, in the reverse, the National Academy of Sciences, again, is sort of, uh, would, would block any mingling of uh, non-human primate embryonic stem cells with human blastocyst. ISSCR, again, is articulating this requirement that uh, these not be implanted into uh, the, uh, the uterus of a non-human primate or a human being. And I, I think George alluded to this earlier, uh, the NAS guidelines are very, very restrictive about activities where non-human, or where human embryonic stem cells are introduced into the non-human uh, blastocyst, so this is uh, uh, described as being uh, acceptable only where there's no other experiment that can provide the information needed. ISSCR doesn't actually uh, state anything uh, along those lines. We're, we're silent on that issue. Now, what's also different, again, is that ISSCR guidelines about Chimera are embedded in a larger document. So again, uh, we are articulating a set of best practices in the appendix for research uh, in this area, as well the interpretation of the, line, of the language on Chimera it needs to be informed by both the principles as well as the rest of the document. And we're going to come back to the issue of transparency. Uh, I mentioned earlier that one of the key issues in best practice is the need for vigorous behavioral data collection, monitoring and reporting to oversight committees, pilot studies, establishing baseline. All that is information rich in terms of what we're supporting. And the call for transparency, uh, I think, uh, would, would uh, get to this issue of making sure that uh, the findings from this research are communicated with various publics uh, and that there's prompt sharing of ideas, uh, data, et cetera. And with that, I end exactly one minute early. <laughs> Very good, Jonathan. Uh, Nancy Lee, you're next. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nancy Lee from the Wellcome Trust. So I'm here to give you um, a policy perspective from a funder and also representing um, the views from the National Academy of Science, um, sorry, the Academy of Medical Sciences report that was undertaken in 2011. So just by way of background, the Wellcome Trust funded an early report in 2011 which covered interspecies embryos, which really did um, lead to this next report in 2011. Um, so, some of you might be aware back in 2007, um, the Academy Working Group um, produced a report on ad human um, interspecies embryos, which led to a change in UK legislation uh, legalising what we then called human admixed embryos. And at the time, the government recognised that um, where we had, we covered the concepts of human admixed embryos. Um, conversations would then arise and questions would arise with regard <coughs> to the other side of the coin and um, human materials into animals. And hence the uh, fellowship of the academy, which was very much, much based around academics and research scientists and also those from industry, um, asked the academy to undertake um, a study and an in-depth report around um, animals containing human material. So uh, 
expert group was um, brought together with Martin Bobra was its chair. It brought together ethicists, um, scientists, theologians, and then um, in preparing its report, uh, called for oral and written evidence from a range of experts. Also key in uh, putting together this report was gaining the views of the public. So um, socialising concepts around uh, animals containing human materials by using quite a deep dive in a, a public dialogue. Um, and some of the key issues which were covered in this dialogue were um, people's understanding um, of techniques, but also what their views were, and I guess covering things like what we'd otherwise call the yuck factor. Um, it focused very much on areas of research involving the brain, the reproductive systems, and human appearance and behavioural traits. And maybe that's why there is a bit of difference in what's come out from the AMS study versus what's in the current guidelines here in the US. So the conclusions of the report, um, it found that animal containing human material research has a long history and it does provide important knowledge and insights uh, which will benefit human health in the long run. With specific respect to welfare, it found that in general, the context of animal research didn't um, bring specific issues which would bring potential for um, animal suffering. And in fact, it might offer ways and means of advancing the principles of the three R's. There might be specific issues and situations which might cause um, animal distress via social rejection, for example. With regard to safety, it found that there are risk levels that are low, but not zero. And again, there are issues which um, are the res proper responsibilities of investigators, research institutes, and regulators. In terms of the recommendations, it considered three cate broad categories of animals containing human materials. Um, first, that um, general e experiments fell, fell into the range of, um, a majority of experiments fell into a range which did not present novel ethical issues. Um, there are a limited number of experiments which may raise um, ethical issues around social acceptability. Uh, these cover social humanization of the, substantial humanization of the brain, um, functional human germ cells in animals, significant alteration of animals' appearances, and the addition of human genes or cells into non-human primates. And thirdly, there was a very narrow range which lacked compelling scientific justification and did raise strong ethical concerns. Uh, and they recommended that those not be currently licensed and be kept under review of the national expert body. And those covered development of embryos contained a mixture of non-human primate and human embryonic pluripotent stem cells. Um, the translation of human-derived neural cells into a non-human primate that could engender human-like behavior and the breeding of animals with human-derived germ cells in their gonads. They then recommended that how these could be regulated was by a national expert body. And they specifically recommended that the Home Office, which is the UK's governing uh, regulator for animals in research, would cover that off. Um, and they also recommended that government bodies, including the Home Office, which regulates animals research, and DH, Department of Health, which uh, covers both the use of human tissue in research and also the use of embryos in research, uh, would work together to ensure that the regulatory systems talk to each other and there were, there were no gaps. So government response. This hasn't been published yet, but there are draft guidelines which we anticipate will be published at the end of the year. Uh, I do have a copy of these that I can pass to the NIH after this meeting. But effectively, the Home Horse, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, and the Department of Health all accepted the recommendations um, in this report. They agreed to work together to ensure that there was a smooth regulatory process across all three pieces of relevant um, regulation, which is the Animals and Scientific Procedures Act, um, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, and the Human Tissue Act. So back to the three <coughs> categories of, of, um, of experimentation. The first one would continue to be regulated under the ASPA. The categories two and three would be kept under review by a national expert body, and advice could be sought from both the Home Office and the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. And also the um, UK Stem Cell Network have developed a regulatory route path, route map for uh, work which might involve embryonic stem cells in animals. And this is just a, an indication of what that looks like and can be found on the website. So what has been put in place? So. Um, with the implementation or the amendments to the way that the um, 
the ASPA works. Uh, we now have an Animal Science Committee, which is a change from our Animal, Animals Procedures Committee, and that has been nominate, nominated as the national expert body. So it's an independent, non-departmental body. It reports to um, the Secretary of State for the Home Office, and it's responsible for impartial objective advice. Specifically, it covers societal concerns, uh, but the legitimacy of the science, and also ethics. And then the advice of this committee to the uh, Home Office or to the Secretary of State is not binding, but it's probably worth recognising that should the Home Office and the Secretary of State decide not to follow their advice, then they could be open to judicial review. There's also an institutional body, so each institution has an animal welfare and ethical um, review body. Again, that looks at specifically animal um, welfare issues, but also ethics at an institutional level. It brings together um, ethicists, scientists and lay members. Uh, so again, it specifically covers the eth ethical issues and every license, or every project license using animals has to also um, be approved by that body. So the outstanding steps, the guidance is yet to be published. We're expecting it, as I say, at the end of the year. Um, my understanding from the Home Office is that um, as yet licence applications have been yet to be made in categories two or three. Um, the performance of the Animal Science Committee is yet to, be, yet to be tested in this area and the Academy of Medical Science under, um, will undertake a review of both the guidance and um, the research in this space going forward. And in terms, I guess, of a few um, reflections on what we've been discussing today is I think we're lucky in the UK to have a very permissive uh, regulatory environment where we have um, very clear standards set both in our legislative um, roadmap, in our legislation, the piece, pieces of legislation I've discussed, um, but also through our regulating bodies. Uh, I think what we have in the AMS report is, is very similar to the recommendations that have come out of the National Academies of Sciences here. Uh, and I think from a funder perspective, we, we recognise that it's important that uh, the research that we fund is a bit undertaken both through a facilitative framework, but also one that um, brings the public and brings along public understanding as well. Thank you. Patricia Olson. Not to encourage you, but both of your predecessors have gone under time. <laughs> <laughs> that just gives me extra. Ah. Yeah, OK. Um, Okay, so the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine is authorized under the California Stem Cell Research and Cures Act to support research involving human stem cells. And what I want to talk to you about today is I'll focus on the steps that CIRM has taken to ensure the responsible conduct, conduct of CIRM-funded stem cell research. And at the end, I'd like to give a specific example, actually, in talking to a grantee of the process that they have undertaken that specifically speaks to the kinds of issues that we're talking about here. So um, this is the framework that we have for review and oversight. Um, <laughs> so for every study that we fund, that studies must be in con uh, conducted in accordance with CIRM regulations, which include a system of review and oversight. Um, we, we require that studies that involve human stem cells are either notified or be fully reviewed by a stem cell research, research oversight committee. And again, this is reflective of the type of study. If you're talking about an in vitro study with stem cells, it, it's a notification. If you start talking about in vivo use of pluripotent stem cells, that's a full SCRO committee review. We have implemented programs to evaluate and assess compliance with our regulations and through working with institutions have tried to develop a set of best practices. So we want our institutions to be successful. We want to ensure that they're, they're doing everything that makes them comfortable and makes us comfortable. And finally, CIRM does maintain um, a standing body, our Scientific and Medi Medical Accountability Standards Working Group, which is comprised of external scientific experts, um, ethical experts, as well as a non-scientist, non-institutional associated person and patient advocates to actually recommend to the Institute's governing board 
standards for research oversight. We recognize that as the science evolves, that we may need to revisit our policies, and this is the mechanism through which we do it. Okay, so specifically, the SCRO committee review and written approval is, this is, speaks to what we require for types of studies that would fall under the purview of this group. Um, we require that um, studies that involve the transplantation of human pluripotent stem cells into non-human animals or the introduction of human neural progenitor cells into the brain of non-human animals at any stage of embryonic, fetal, or postnatal development, that those studies undergo full scrow review and written approval. What we will not fund is we do not fund the introduction of human pluripotent stem cells into non-human primate embryos nor will we fund the breeding of any PSC-derived chimeric animals. So those at this point are forbidden um, are by our regulations to be funded. So that's the committee that actually we have requested be put in place to review any protocol that comes forward for fund that is approved by some for funding. Um, to, we also have to make sure that this framework is in place, that all institutions are utilizing it using best practices. We've put in place ongoing efforts to evaluate how grantee institutions are addressing the regulations and to assess compliance. Um, what we found, so we did site visits, um, especially in, say, the years 2008, 9, and 10, when, you know, these were really getting going. And what we did there was we actually included a selection of grants for in-depth review. We checked the documentation associated with specific awards. We ensured that there were SCRO meeting minutes in place, that there were approval letters, letters there was correspondence to verify adherence with CIRM's requirements, and the institution's own internal uh, SCRO procedures and policies. Um, and to ensure that everybody was operating effectively. We've also convened workshops, especially of SCRO committee staff, to address the fact that these, you know, are they doing their job, and to just talk about issues that they see. So we're trying to put in place, as I said, best practices and to ensure everybody's working together. What we found in this is that all major CIRM grantees have a designated SCRO <coughs> committee. They have all established written procedures and policies, and that the composition is as required. The best practices include training and education focused on research ethics, uh, standard SCRO application procedures, written SOPs for operating, and feedback mechanisms designed to do um, periodic updates. I indicated that in preparation for this workshop, CIRM did confer with many of our institutional SCRO officials responsible for research oversight. And one institution shared with us a process that had, they had recently received a blastocyst complementation protocol utilizing human cells. And what we found was that the SCRO committee convened a full protocol review as required by our regulations and by the institutional SOPs that the review included seeking external expert advice by the SCRO, as well as discussion sessions with the investigator focused on current pr practice and ethical issues, and a discussion of options as to how t the protocol could be revised. For example, example limiting the time of gestation, um, but could still address critical research questions. In addition, the SCRO committee consulted with the vice chancellor for research to further address questions of essentially perspective and perceptions. What's the attitude of the community? What are the concerns about public perception? Based on all this input, the SCRO committee actually ended up making a, de a decision to approve a revised protocol with request for periodic uh, status reports. So, I mean, 
What we believe is essentially that the process that we put in place, the framework, the regulations, the SCRO committee, working with the committee to ensure that it's following best practices, giving them the leeway to recognize, you know, when something requires, as in this instance, you know, taking it up to the level of the research chancellor to assume buy-in. We think we put in place a process that it gives us a framework for robust review and oversight to ensure the responsible conduct of research with animals containing human cells. Thanks. A new record. <laughs> Not that I'm obsessed about this. <laughs> Catherine Bain. Thanks for setting that precedent for me. <laughs> Making it shorter and shorter. And I take them more time. <laughs> no, we all have more time. Well, first, thank you for including ALAC International in this very important conference. For those of you who are less familiar with who ALAC is, we are a nonprofit body that accredits any institution that uses animals in research, testing, or teaching. We do this globally. We currently accredit institutions in 41 countries around the world. More than 950 programs are participating in our program. We are the only international accrediting body of animal care and use programs in the world. I was asked to really speak to does research involving animals containing human cells invoke a different type of process by AALAC International? Well, that suggests then that I should explain what our current process is so that we can take that point more clearly and later in my talk. So ALAC looks at all aspects of the animal care and use program, the policies that are in place, uh, written documents, and so forth, the actual housing and environment of the animals, the veterinary care program, the physical plant. Under institutional policies, I should also point out occupational health and safety of the people who are working at the institution. The Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, known by very many different names around the globe, but think of it as the oversight committee uh, that reviews and approves the protocol. That may be its main point, but there are other roles that that committee speaks to, and that includes overall program oversight. So any animal activity, essentially, is under the purview of the IACUC as far as ALAC is concerned. The IACUC looks at the protocol and looks for specific points within that protocol or the proposed work, um, I believe in Europe and the UK it's referred to as a project. Uh, humane endpoints I'm not going to touch on because I know Dr. Brown will be speaking to that in more detail. And I will just say right now that ALAC and OLA share uh, a common sense of philosophy on the inclusion of humane endpoints in the protocol. In addition, uh, we like to see the IACUCs look at the harm-benefit analysis, and that was uh, <coughs> brought to bear in the previous session. Some discussion touched on this briefly, and I think we can maybe deal with this more in the discussion for this session. Uh, but we do want to see that harm-benefit analysis addressed, and I have a, a slide after this one that will show you what ALAC's expectation is. And then we expect the IACUC to apply the tenets of the three R's, replacement, refinement, and reduction, in evaluating the, the way the, pro, the uh, protocol is structured, as well as other ethical considerations. That might be the U.S. government principles here in the United States. It might be the SIOMS international guiding principles around the world. So speaking more directly to harm-benefit analysis, it is our expectation that uh, the b benefit to society, whether that's human and or animal health, is weighed against the cumulative harms that the individual animal will sustain during the uh, procedure. That's not to say that there will not be harm. We, we actually accredit a number of places that do quite serious work. But we want to see that the, ILA, the IACUC has weighed those harms and benefits and determined that the benefits indeed outweigh the harms to the animal. The attending veterinarian at, at the institution has a pivotal role in um, ensuring the welfare of animals used in research. They uh, certainly have a, a position on the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee in which they would bring perhaps even some pre-guidance to the, the investigator before that protocol is taken to the IACUC for further review. Uh, but we also want to see that the, the attending veterinarian has a, a lot of connections within the institution. He or she is 
is in good communication with the husbandry staff, with the IACUC, and perhaps most importantly with the uh, PIs. In terms of husbandry aspects for the animals, there are a number of, of ways that ALAC looks at this. I've just drawn out two that I think are particularly applicable to the type of work we're discussing today. Monitoring and control measures for escaped and uh, wild vermin animals, these are usually mice. Um, there is a frequently asked question on the ALAC International webpage that describes our expectations for how escaped and wild vermin animals should be managed in the facility. And um, I think the escaped piece of this is of more bearing on the discussions today than worrying about the wild rodents you know, getting into the facility. And daily observations of the animals must occur on weekends, holidays. There must be uh, some oversight on a daily basis of the health and behavior and general well-being of those animals. And then I just wanted to draw also one example um, that uh, more speaks to the, um, the recombinant DNA world, uh, not terribly unrelated to the discussion today. Uh, we have a variety of what we call reference resources. These are standards that we expect our institutions will refer to when they are developing their animal care and use programs if they wish to meet ALAC international standards. And Appendix Q1B1 in the NIH guidelines for research involving recombinant DNA molecules talks about the uh, disposition of animals that have recombinant DNA in them and what happens to those carcasses. And just as the, the value added that ALAC brings to a program, uh, we actually did encounter an institution earlier this year that was feeding euthanized rodents that had recombinant DNA to wild animals, snakes in, in, in particular, and obviously in violation of this document that they had no idea this was even in the document. So ALAC brings tremendous value in its oversight, on-site assessments to institutions to help keep them on track. The other piece about ALAC is that we are able to assess the connectivity of different domains of oversight within the institution, whether that's the IACUC, the IRB, the Occupational Health and Safety Program, the Environmental Health and Safety Program. And we don't really view the work that we're talking about today as being different from transgenic research, highly infectious disease research, toxicity testing, you name it. There are a variety of types of work out there that have very serious impact on the well-being of the animals, but that doesn't mean that that work shouldn't be done. And in fact, given harm-benefit analyses, obviously shows that it should be. And I do want to say that 96% of the institutions that we accredit are in a full accreditation status, which I think is evidence of the sincerity of the uh, investigators and veterinarians at the institutions we accredit, as well as the success of our own assessment and training programs. Just briefly, these are the top five mandatory items that must be corrected or that we found problems in around the globe. Um, I did want to point out Oc Health and the IACUC, and then I'm just going to say very briefly that when we talk about mandatory items for correction, these are things that negatively impact the accreditation status of an institution. They are quite minor in percentage compared to just suggestions to improve an already good program. And when we look at occupational health and safety, and I don't know if this actually touches into the type of research we're talking about today, but personnel protection is the number one mandatory item for correction within Oc Health. And within IACUC, um, it is the policies at the institution that is the number one mandatory item for correction, followed by the intensity of protocol review. And these are areas where ALAC is going in and coaching the institutions to make improvements. And then finally, veterinary care, the actual provision of veterinary medica medical care is the number one mandatory within this category, although it's a very small finding. And then I did just want to note, building on the previous speaker's um, presentation, that I took this off your website, uh, Dr. Olson, that um, I had some sense that this was already the case, uh, that in fact just sites where CIRM-funded animal research is conducted must be accredited or seeking accreditation by ALAC International. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Again early. Thank you. The second, Patricia. Patricia Brown. Thank you all for inviting me to be here today. Um, to begin, I want to have you consider that the rules for research with animal subjects 
are different than research with human subjects. The ethical principles for protection of human subjects focus on informed consent and doing no harm. Research with animals, however, may involve unavoidable pain and distress. That must be balanced with the potential benefits to humans and animals. The protection for animals who cannot give consent are provided by institutional animal care and use committees in their oversight of the research proposed and conducted. And that's going to be my focus for today. I'm going to focus to start with on the federal standards here in the United States. The Public Health Service policy on humane care and use of laboratory animals does provide um, the oversight uh, for research with genetically engineered models. It applies to all research involving animals that is conducted or supported by the public health service agencies. Those agencies include the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Food and Drug Administration, and the NIH, with NIH spending the largest amount in support of research involving animals. The PHS policy defines an animal as any live vertebrate animal and includes both warm and cold-blooded vertebrates. Invertebrates are not currently included in the PHS policy. The PHS policy explicitly requires standards that institutional animal care and use committees must use in order for research with animals to proceed. <coughs> the IACUC must confirm that the research is consistent with the Animal Welfare Act and regulations, the guide for the care and use of laboratory animals, that the methods of euthanasia are consistent with the AVMA guidelines for the euthanasia of animals, and are in keeping with the ethical foundation defined by the nine U.S. government principles adopted by all federal agencies conducting research with animals in the United States. Preeminent among these standards is the guide which I will now focus the remainder of my presentation. It highlights some specific guidance on genetically engineered models. I did provide for you in, um, in your um, folders uh, some, those two excerpted pages from the guide uh, that I'm going to be covering this, um, this afternoon. The guide is a product of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, it is not an NIH publication. as although traditionally, uh, many years past, it was an NIH publication. It's authored by a committee of subject matter experts that includes ethicists, veterinarians, researchers, and IACUC chairs. The eighth ed edition, uh, which was published in 2011, has a strong emphasis on performance standards um, supported by published data, expert opinion and experience, and scientific principles. NIH required funded institutions to adopt and implement the eighth edition of the guide in 2012. The guide has a section devoted to what it calls special considerations for IACRIC review that identifies certain animal use protocols with a high potential for unrelieved pain and distress or other animal welfare concerns. Among the topics that the guide requires focused attention by IACUCs are experimental and humane endpoints, unexpected outcomes, multiple survival surgical procedures, food and fluid regulation, and physical restraint. The guide states that the IACUC is obliged to weigh the objectives of the study against potential animal welfare concerns, and that by considering opportunities for refinement, the use of appropriate non-animal alternatives and the use of fewer animals uh, that we also know as the three R's, the institution and the investigator can begin to address their shared obligations for humane animal care and use. And I want to emphasize that idea that this is a shared obligation between the, the researcher and the institution. So I've also excerpted in the next few slides some of the key elements from this section of the guide that um, uh, applies to resources research with genetically engineered models. 
The guide offers cautionary language about the differences between experimental endpoints versus humane endpoints. It states, the experimental endpoint of a study occurs when the scientific aims and objectives have been reached, while the humane endpoint is the point at which pain or distress in an experimental animal is prevented, terminated, or relieved. And for many invasive experiments, the experimental and humane endpoints are closely linked and should be carefully considered during IACUC protocol review. Lastly, the guide says, the use of humane endpoints contributes to refinements by providing an alternative to experimental endpoints that result in unrelieved or severe animal pain or distress. The guide recommends that the determination of humane endpoints is best done through the involvement of the investigator, the veterinarian, and the IACUC, and when possible should be defined before the start of the study. While the guide considers the identification of humane endpoints challenging to IACUCs, it re recommends the following critical information be included in the protocol to assist in the process. Clearly defined assessment criteria for when the humane endpoint is reached. How frequently animals are observed to limit possible unrelieved pain or distress. The training of personnel responsible for assessment and recognition of the humane endpoint and the required response when the endpoint is reached. The guide gives additional guidance for IACUCs when reviewing research with genetically engineered models. And this is what it states <laughs> is because of the inherent potential for unanticipated phenotypes from the introduction of highly novel, novel variables, as we've heard uh, discussed repeatedly today. The guide recommends increased monitoring for unexpected outcomes and diligent and careful observation from the earliest stages of development. If negative well-being is observed, it should be reported to the IACUC and proactive measures determined to circumvent or alleviate the impact on the animal's well-being and refine the endpoints so the study that can then proceed. While the guide cannot anticipate the unexpected outcomes for the science being discussed today, its emphasis on frequency of observation and diligence in observation are clearly useful and worth considering. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, this is in my experience, which is lengthy, a first. Five panelists and everyone came in under time. There being no good deed going unpunished, I actually was asked to, though I'm not on the agenda, to say a little bit about a report from Stanford SCRO. Uh, I will go very brief, although you may ask who is timing the timer, but that will be me. Um, I'm not currently a member of Stanford Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee. I was from about 2004 before it was called a SCRO through 2013 when I finally was let off for good behavior or bad behavior. Uh, but I've gotten an update of what's happened in the last couple of years. So I think I'm the only one talking about actually the experience at the SCRO level of what this has been like. Our SCRO currently has 198 protocols under its observation within its jurisdiction. But 124 of those are just notices. They're things where the SCRO just gets notified, doesn't actually have to do anything. 20 of them are very limited review, review by the SCRO chair and staff, but not by the entire SCRO. And 54 of them are entire SCRO review. Some of those are annual renewals, et cetera. Everything involving putting human iPSCs, human neural progenitor cells, or human HESCs into non-human animals goes to full SCRO review. Our SCRO generally applies the National Academy's guidelines of 2005 as amended. We follow the CIRM regulations to the extent they differ with respect to any work funded by CIRM, and any work not funded by CIRM, we follow California guidelines. Uh, created by or recommended by a committee that I chair. The California guidelines and the CIRM regulations are similar almost perfectly, but there are a few quirks of CIRM's, of CIRM's statute that meant we couldn't make them exactly the same. That sounds really complicated, but in fact, and it was complicated for the first couple of years. The first couple of years on the SCRO, the pre-SCRO, were a lot of fun. 
because we were trying to figure out what made sense to do in various circumstances. Over the years, though, and I think this is good for the science and the researchers, although it's meant it's been much less fun, things got bureaucratized, and there became ways of doing things that were generally accepted and were disseminated. So one of the things we uh, require is the no breeding of any animal that has received human pluripotent cells. Well, at first we had discussions about what no breeding meant, but eventually we came up with several options that were publicized on the website that researchers could put in segregation of the animals using only juvenile animals with sacrifice before puberty, et cetera, that would meet the no breeding requirement. And I don't know that they've had to discuss the no breeding requirement for the last six or seven years because those options are out there. People know they're out there. It's practically on a pull down menu. The other area that has been uh, a little more interesting has been this issue of integration and uh, differentiation and, and integration. Following the National Academy guidelines, as well as the CIRM requirements and the California State guidelines, we do require the SCRO to consider the differentiation and the integration of the human cells into the host animal, where they're going to go and whether they're going to go any place sensitive. That also has become relatively bureaucratized in that there's a pretty much standard answer if you're just putting the cells in a kidney capsule to see if they make a teratoma, you say that and we don't worry about it. If you are doing something unusual, we sometimes asked, at least while I was on the SCRO, we haven't seen this before. Tell us where, the, where you think these brain cells, where these cells are going to go, whether they're going to integrate in the central nervous system, and why you believe what you believe. And occasionally we've said, what kind of monitoring are you planning to do? We want more intensive monitoring of where they've actually gone and to the extent they've actually been integrated. So I say this as somebody who's been on the SCRO, not as somebody who's had to submit protocols to the SCRO. Uh, so my bias, uh, my experience may be biased. I do think the SCRO has been relatively fast and relatively efficient. It does mean there's another set of hoops for researchers to jump through, but they haven't proven to be very difficult hoops, and they've been hoops that I think by and large have allowed us to feel quite comfortable that the National Academy guidelines as well as the CIRM regulations and the California guidelines have been met, and we have minimized the ethical and uh, social concerns. Uh, that come with this kind of research. So that's my report from Stanford SCRO. I hope it's accurate. And now I think all of us should move to the, those of us on this panel should move to the front and begin a more general discussion. I'm going to let the panel uh, talk amongst themselves in a second before we open it up to the general audience's questions. But before we do, I have to say, I feel like I've been transported about eight to ten years back in time, except I don't feel eight to ten years younger. <laughs> that would make it worth, more worthwhile. From about 2004 through about 2007 or so, there was a lot of discussion of these issues in the United States, in Canada, in the international scene. I think the UK specific uh, work started about that time as well in 2007. And consensuses were reached. I love Jonathan's slide about the relatively minor differences between the ISSCR, the National Academies, and the UK. That's one of those slides about difference where the important point isn't that there are differences, but how minor the differences are. These things are clearly um, variants or subspecies. They're not different species of sets of recommendations. We did have some concern. In 2006, President Bush, in his State of the Union address, called for prohibiting the most egregious abuses of biomedical research, 
including the creation of human-animal hybrids. So speechwriters couldn't even get the term right. Then Senator Sam Brownback kept introducing legislation in the Senate that would have made my next door neighbor, Irv Weissman, into a felon. Uh, didn't go anywhere. And then things calmed down. And really, we haven't heard very much about it in the last 10 years, which is kind of why I found the September action by the National uh, Institutes of Health a surprise. Still do, frankly, uh, wonder what actually prompted that. Um, because I think we've come up over the years, to the extent anything has changed in the last eight to 10 years, it's now that we have a better scientific basis for understanding how things integrate and how they don't. We're actually better able to answer some of these questions, not that we can answer them perfectly. So I think there are clearly questions about animal welfare, and I'm very glad that we had two speakers of animal welfare. I think that's something that we can never ignore. I think there's some questions about the nature of the cells being used, the embryonic cells. That war has, not, has tamped down but hasn't gone away. But both the animal use and the embryonic cell issues have been discussed and largely agreed upon. The issues that are unique to chimeras, um, I wrote a book chapter and I wanted to entitle it Balls, Brains, and Beauty. The book editors would not let me, and it wasn't just because the first one was under broad. Uh, but I think what people are, con whether these are ethical arguments or political controversies or visceral reactions, I think it's a little bit of, of all of the above. But people are concerned about non-human animals that have human gametes, eggs and sperm, that have human-like brains or behavior, and that look like humans. I don't think people are concerned if a rodent has, if a pig has a human pancreas or a rodent has a human gallbladder. And so those are the things that are special. Um, and I'm curious to now shut up and uh, see if any of the panelists want to talk about what I just said or what they said or anything else. Uh, I'll start by generally agreeing with things that you did say. I think uh, interesting from the public dialogue space was that the general public weren't so concerned about the amount um, of human material, it was more, as you say, that visceral element of what it might look like, even though it might actually contain very little human material. Um, interestingly, in the UK perspective, people were most concerned about um, human material in reproductive technologies. So uh, less concerned about the brain, more concerned about um, continuation of human germline in animals. Uh, and I think I'll leave it there. In terms of animal welfare, uh, again, I think issues that we haven't necessarily delved into, and I'd be interested to see what the other panelists have to say around um, unintended consequences or what we haven't got the scientific indicators to necessarily understand around um, increasing cognition. So I know there are various um, test batteries that we use both in mice and in non-human primates. Uh, but I think we, we've already mentioned that the science isn't there yet in terms of really understanding um, what we, we might call humanise or, or something becoming more human. And, and I guess on, on animal welfare side as well, an interesting thing that came out of the dialogue was uh, how animal technicians relate to these animals. So uh, it's not just around the research we do, but also around those who are working with these animals. And I think the high level uh, um, takeaway message was that um, I'm interested, I think, in, in George's comment around whether we should ask the question if uh, there are a set of experiments we shouldn't do because we can't go there. Uh, in the UK, I think we've tried to get people to come around to talking about animals in the open as much as possible and getting them to get to the point where we can talk about and explain why we do certain things um, in biomedical research and what the benefits are uh, and address the yuck factors and what the ethical issues might be. So especially around the use of non-human primates, we have come up against that quite significantly in um, the European Commission or European Union trying to, to ban that work coming from, from various countries. So uh, very much encourage an open dialogue with the public around the work that we do in biomedical research and why we do it. 
And just to drop a footnote to what Nancy said, in talking to students and adult groups and so on, I find the one thing that comes up over and over again is their iconic idea of a human, non-human chimera is that almost 20-year-old photograph of a mouse with a human ear, which had actually no human tissue in it at all. But that's what people, that's, that drives a strong visceral response. Anybody else? Point of the unintended consequences. I, I'm hoping that, although I had to speak quickly, that my message came through that I'm not sure that this type of research is all that different from other types of research that ALAC encounters around the globe in terms of sensitivity, political sensitivity, cultural sensitivity, potential impact on welfare to the animals, potential tremendous benefit to society downstream. So unintended consequences, yes, could certainly occur in this type of research, but that's also true of a number of other types of research that we encounter in our travels around the globe. And as long as the IACUC, or whatever it's called in the other countries, uh, has systems in place to detect through monitoring, through daily observations, through good communication channels among all relevant parties, those unintended consequences, A, can be quite informative, and B, could then be ceased uh, and appropriate actions taken in a very prompt and humane manner. But it's, it's not unique to this type of research. It's, it's something I think we have to deal with in a variety of different types of research. And so I think I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to keep saying over and over again, I believe if the right systems are in place at the institutional level, and what I was trying to show in some of my brief slides was that there are, in fact, things that ALAC finds are not going perfectly at every institution around the globe, but if we continue to improve our internal systems of oversight and reporting and communication, then those kinds of problems won't be problems. They will be something that comes up and is addressed in a humane, prompt manner. So I, I, I don't disagree that there is the potential for unintended consequences, but I just don't know that it that it's that different from what we would encounter in other types of sensitive research. Over to the other side of the table. I just wanted to elaborate on, on what you just said, which was, I mean, I guess I believe that, you know, we've had a lot of experience now over the last 10, 15 years in putting, in putting mechanisms in place to monitor and oversee research. But one point you made was the one of communication. I think we've all just seen or witnessed what happened with the parent Planned Parenthood thing and how this can be blown up so effectively. So, you know, methods of communication so that the first thing you see when you Google, you know, human pig car chimeras is not these grotesque things. I mean, the slide that I, one of you showed about the relative size and brain and neural content and putting that in perception in a way that the public can understand. I, I guess, you know, it's almost an, edu it's an education perception issue as much as anything because I think, as I say, I think there are a lot of good mechanisms in place that the institutions and the scientists and the funding agencies have, have you know, that we've, that we've been working with over years that, that help address all that. But it's the response that is, I think, sometimes the problem. Okay, so just responding to uh, the earlier points. So if you look at, there are many examples of novel <coughs> research areas, novel technologies, where at first debate was largely disorganized and pretty quickly issues got binned into stable categories. And I think when Hank talks about feeling like this is a rerun from six years ago, I think what he's capturing is what is often common in debates, which is that uh, amorphous set of concerns get binned into discrete categories. We develop policy mechanisms to uh, address and uh, uh, resolve those issues and uh, those, th those begin to stable. So I think, you know, on the one hand, I, I, I think I agree. We've moved into a fairly stable period with respect to some of the ethical issues here. But, but having said that, I think there are a couple issues that are also worth bearing in mind. Um, there are a couple areas that I think are dynamic in this area that make 
circumstances may be a little bit different now than what they might have been a few years ago. First, I think although we've always, scientific research has always been international, I think there's a kind of a profoundness in which uh, the uh, international dimensions of research now uh, 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 sort of make these challenges in, in some ways uh, greater. So, you know, you have a journal in, operating in one jurisdiction, uh, a funder in another jurisdiction, and the actual researchers in another jurisdiction. So I, I think that really adds a challenge here. Another moving target here is what we are beginning to understand about the mental life of animals. Um, that science is evolving. In recent years, there's been a reclassification of chimpanzees. Uh, in many jurisdictions, chimps sort of get over the line uh, with respect to moral status uh, being human enough like that we forbid any kind of uh, invasive uh, research on them. That, that really has changed, and um, I think that brings, uh, that casts a different light on some uh, areas of research uh, in, in this realm. So I think that needs to be borne in mind. Also, there's a, there is a really interesting uh, sort of following in line with uh, what's being understood about the mental life of animals. There's a lot of interesting developments in the realm of animal welfare, animal rights, et cetera. So, you know, six years, uh, things have changed in some ways. In other ways, things have sort of stabilized. There are a couple other points I want to make. Uh, I actually have spent the last few weeks preparing for this symposium, reading very carefully through the ethics literature. I see a lot of issues not really fully hammered down in the ethics uh, literature uh, with respect to these. So in some ways, the stability that we have uh, may be, uh, it, it, I think it reflects a genuine stability, but I do think that there are issues that really sort of need to be resolved. Uh, uh, and the last point I want to make is um, I leave this workshop with the impression that some of the kinds of extreme <laughs> concerns that um, probably motivate this workshop, the idea of humanizing non-human primates, developing sort of human cognitive uh, um, uh, you know, capacities, uh, it seems that uh, we're very far away scientifically from achieving those kinds of outcomes that would raise profound uh, moral issues. But having said that, um, you know, as you know, one of my other jobs, I do a lot of research, uh, and one of the areas that I do research on is sort of the psychology of science. And one thing that sort of is recurrent in among the way scientists think is the tendency to um, sometimes have overconfidence about um, highly improbable events. And so I think. Uh, I'm not trying to suggest that uh, these scientific uh, barriers are, you know, to evolving higher cognition are surmountable or attainable, but I think that uh, a certain amount of humility is probably uh, uh, a good character trait uh, to have going forward uh, in this realm, even if the kinds of outcomes that we most worry about morally seem fanciful or outlandish. So I strongly agree with uh, what Jonathan said about things staying the same and changing at the same time, which means I think the solution can't be a set of carved in stone rules and guidelines. The solution needs to be a process. I think scrows actually have provided that kind of process that can learn and change as time goes on. It has frankly kind of surprised me that NIH never required scrow or escrow review although it did implement a couple of the, the rules from the national academies. I don't necessarily think if you're an institution that doesn't have a SCRO, I don't know that you need to build a SCRO. I think IACUX, at least with respect to the human, non-human chimera work, IACUX with expert consultants can do the job. But it seems to me that a process that, and I don't know at what point would be best for the NIH, before the grant is submitted, after the grant is approved, but before it's funded, you know, I'll leave that to people who understand the NIH a heck of a lot better than I do, but it seems to me that some kind of scroll-like review for these issues of concern with the scrolls appropriately um, urged to keep their eyes open for changes both in the science and in the moral status and, and in society's views makes a lot of sense. And, and then finally, one last thing on, on Jonathan's comment. Uh, you're right, we can never be confident that amazing things aren't going to burst forward. I think the rise of CRISPR in three years is some evidence for that, but I think it's going to be a long time before we get a very intelligent non-human animal, a, a, a non-human animal whose intelligence approaches ours through chimeras. 
I think the artificial intelligence people are likely to raise these moral issues a lot sooner through silicon than we are going to do through carbon. Other questions, other comments from the panel before we open it up? I'd like to speak to that behavior question because, um, sorry, Pat, I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, just because my training is, is in animal behavior, particularly lab animal behavior, and, and uh, the question about getting an animal to locomote differently. So much of behavior is linked to anatomy. Um, I think the, pub the public doesn't quite grasp that, and they think that our animals are going to become, you know, everybody's going to become bipedal, sort of the Planet of the Apes thing, uh, versus the point made earlier about perhaps cognitive and actual behaviors that drift from species typical. And I, I think that's the point I would leave, is that if we're evaluating the behavior of an animal that has um, that is, is a chimera, then what we should be looking at is the benchmark for that species, not what's been injected in it. Are they changing from species typical behaviors? And we see that in our labs now, uh, given housing conditions or other types of research that's being done, MPTP research, for example. So rather than worrying about a novel set of behaviors being somehow inoculated into a chimeric animal, more importantly, I think, would be the metric of looking at how that animal's, as a species, baseline behavior has changed, if at all. I wanted to get back to the to the uh, what was discussed earlier about the harm benefit, because I really think that is the crux of the of how you look at this from an animal welfare standpoint. This, the investigator needs to do that from the very beginning. Why have they selected this model? Why it is it the best model? What are the alternatives? And we have, NIH has just changed the requirements for what is in the vertebrate animal section of grant applications, effective in January. Um, and, and the description of the justifications has changed so that we will want um, applicants to say why they've selected the model, why is it the best model, and then why they cannot use alternatives. It's a change from what historically had been the justifications that had been in that section for since the 1970s. Um, and we also include as alternatives humans because we recognize that there may be research that could potentially be conducted in humans, but the investigators should have thought through that and justify why it's better to do it in animals. I should note on that, certainly at Stanford, and I suspect in every place where there are SCROs, human, non-human, chimeric research requires approval not only by the SCRO, but also by the IACUC. So the animal review happens, and at least at our place, our shop, independently of the SCRO review. Other comments from the panel? Um, just commenting briefly on the UK process, which most of you probably know quite well anyway, uh, but in terms of a funder, we ask with people whether they have got their Home Office license for the work, um, whether it has been ethically reviewed by the AWERB. Um, so funding is, is usually conditional upon those conditions being met. So you're covered off the harm-benefit analysis, you've covered off the ethics um, and the animal welfare independently through the um, Animal Welfare Ethics Review board, Boards, which are at an institutional level and um, you've covered off the funding and the science question at the um, funding committees. All right, the room. Don't all speak at once. Yes. yes. Well, so, <coughs> so, Hank, you, you mentioned in your presentation of the Stanford Scrow that the contribution of these human stem cells to, to the CNS is taken into consideration. So could you elaborate on, you know, exactly what those guidelines are at Stanford? So it's not guidelines exactly. I suppose the terse answer is no, <laughs> uh, because we don't have guidelines about what level of contribution has to be there, but we ask what do you, where do you expect it to go, why do you expect it to do that, what do you expect the results to be, and that gets weighed with everything else, the potential benefits of the research, uh, in making a determination. While I was on the SCRO, that never actually got to be a close question. Uh, in the two years that I haven't, since I left the SCRO, and since we've acquired some new faculty, that may be becoming a bigger question at this point, but I don't, I don't recall. Well, 
there were some situations where we said, you know, how are you going to check the level of integration? Are you going to sacrifice them feed, some feedly and do a search? Are you going to do it at what ages and so on and push them to do more monitoring to see what the integration was? But I don't, even if I could recall, it's probably confidential and I couldn't tell you, but I don't remember us um, saying no on those grounds. You're not on. If I could elaborate slightly, um, so for CIRM funded research where either pluripotent stem cells or non or um, neural human neural progenitor cells are introduced into animals at any stage, one of the questions that is asked is um, evaluate the probable pattern and effects of differentiation and integration of the human cells into the non-human tissues. So we want you to have thought about that. Um, and then obviously a scientific rationale as to why you would put the into the non-human primate and then also assurances I cook as, as indicated. So, you know, we are asking you to think about what. what. Yeah, and as an example, uh, a counterfactual example, because I find it hard to imagine anyone doing this, of what might lead a scro to say no, because the scro isn't the scros are expected to sometimes uh, turn down protocols that are otherwise legal and meet the rules. If, in the scros' opinion, they go too far. Back in 2005, there was a paper in Science from a group at Johns Hopkins. I was one of about a hundred authors, but Ruth Faden and Daver Sholto and others were on it about putting human brain or human cells into non-human primates and, and it, it had six factors and talked about everything from marmosets to gorillas or chimpanzees. Somebody wanted to put a whole bunch of human brain stem cells in uh, through uh, intrauterine surgery into the skull cavity of a four-week-old chimpanzee embryo or fetus. Uh, I think our scro would probably have trouble with that. Happily, that hasn't arisen, and I don't think it's likely to, but, but we could. So, <clears throat> I guess Go one, ahead, Rusty. one of the reasons we're here is in part because of some new rulings that, is that, that's right, is that part of the reason this is held, is because of some rulings that came about September 13th. And I guess one of the um, questions is what research has been impacted by that ruling uh, directly, and what are the consequences of that for, you know, the risk-benefit ratio of things? So, in particular, in particular, um, I'm not in field, but in the first uh, morning session, we talked about uh, organ transplants, and if you want to grow organs in animals for human transplantation is to replace an organ or something, I don't think you can get funded in, under the current situation for doing that kind of research. So there's a, there's a direct consequence of this. And I wonder what the panel, how, how do you assess that? How, do, how does that uh, how do you yeah. reflect on that? I don't know whether any of us knows about that, but that, if we that, do speak that, up. Is that accurate? We, we want to make sure that... Yeah. Is that accurate? I, I would point out there is a letter today or yesterday in science from 11 of my Stanford colleagues, including, I think, Hiro, um, talking about some of the negative consequences of the funding pause, moratorium, blockage, whatever noun is appropriate, pointing, and I don't... In looking at it carefully, I don't think anyone specifically said his funding had, was chopped off, although I'm not entirely sure about that. But there, there, were, there have been comments about the discouragement to young people going into the field and the other sort of secondary issues that something like that has brought about. But I don't know of anything, anybody who's specifically been stripped of funding or whose funding hasn't come through, but I don't know whether anybody else on the panel or anybody in the room does. <laughs> well, I could, in my own case, I could say that my application is on hold because of the new guidelines. And I would like to go back to your question. What is it that has changed in the last few years? Because we have heard this morning that, at least from a scientific point of view, 
there has not been a major scientific breakthrough that has changed the perception of what we can do or we cannot do with these experiments. And from the panel, I am hearing that we have mechanisms that are working to control this type of research. So I think in order to clarify ourselves, I think it will be important what is the reason of this regulation so that we can address the concerns, the problems, because I don't know here anyone in the audience that really knows where this is coming from, what has happened in the last few years to having these new guidelines, if no major scientific changes have been put in place, and according to what I have heard, the mechanism that we have seems to be working. Well, and I may be stealing a little bit of my own thunder from the uh, wrap-up here, but I, a couple of points. One, um, just the very clear point that's the best of our knowledge, this pause has not affected any currently funded grants. So no one has been stripped of funding. There's been no withdrawal of funding. Um, but I think it's this... Um, the idea of, of taking a moment to take a look at the, the state of the science. Um, you know, in fact, when you look at the science since 2005, there have been significant changes in 2005. Of course, we didn't have the development of induced pluripotent stem cells as an example of, of something that has changed. Um, and, and it's an interesting situation, I can tell you, being the... Um, uh, sitting in the seats of science policy making at NIH because um, it's a little bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation in the sense that on um, one sense I think there's this great desire from the research community that we not remain stuck in place when it comes to policies and guidance and regulation. We don't want to put a regulation in place and, or, a, or a policy or, or issue guidance um, and then leave it there forever with no cognizance of the movement of the science, right? So that's not a good situation. You don't want to say, um, uh, this, is, this is where we are. These are the policies and, and procedures we're putting into place, and they are now set in stone, and they will never change regardless of whether the, the science progresses. Um, so I think there is proactive policymaking benefit to every once in a while revisiting the state of the science and considering whether the... Um, uh, policies and regulations and, and guidance we have in place still make sense um, and whether or not there is need for new policy or guidance, maybe there's need to withdraw um, uh, you know, previous uh, uh, protections that, that are in place or revise um, policy or guidance. I happen to believe and I may have a biased opinion given where I sit um, uh, on this that Sound science policy doesn't inhibit science, it facilitates good science. And I think that there is um, a clear benefit from, from taking a moment to review the state of the science and using that information to inform policy going forward, which is where we are, um, where we are now. Do you take questions from the of crowd? Of course. Okay. Um, this is David Resnick from the NIEHS. Um, one thing that has not been on the table are the human subjects issues. As you may know, the uh, revisions to the common rule will treat all human biological materials as human subjects. So in the future, <coughs> we won't be able to have any human use of any human biological materials um, without some kind of prior consent. So, you know, maybe everything is, the boxes are all checked off and everybody is com consented to having their human biological materials used in animal chimeras, but I know that a lot of the population that I work with down in North Carolina, they would not want their cells or whatever put into an animal, even if it was just their skin cells. So um, that's something I think that does need to be um, addressed, and it will have to be addressed more carefully when the com if and when uh, the common rule is revised. Um, the other thing is, does this raise unique animal welfare and safety issues? Well, I think it does. And the reason being is that when you're talking about the potential to humanize an animal's brain, you are talking about 
a qualitative difference in the kind of suffering that an animal is capable of having. Now, everyone says we're not there yet, and certainly I agree we're not near the island of Dr. Moreau or anything like that, but science moves fast. And, you know, just a somewhat increase in, say, you know, the, the specter of an intelligent mouse being stuck in a laboratory somewhere screaming, I want to get out, would Sounds be very like troubling student. to people. Very troubling indeed. And so I think that is something, is it, it may not ever be coming down the pike, as you say, but I think it is different from the other animal welfare issues that we've considered in the past, which mostly have to do with physical suffering, um, not as much of the psychological suffering you can get when you um, have an animal that is humanized in some ways. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, you seem to think that these issues were all put to bed 10 years ago or something like that, and you're thinking, well, what is NIH doing looking at this? Well, you know what? The public is still out there, okay? And the public, the public can change its mind just like that, as we saw. Uh, the videos uh, the, the, of, um, you know, in the, abor the abortion clinics or whatever, those videos out there can have a tremendous impact on the public. The public could change its mind just like that if some science fiction movie comes out or some really popular novel or, or whatever or television series in, in which they're featuring chimeras. And then all of a sudden the public is now much more viscerally aware of their intuitions about what would be the problems with, you know, human animal chimeras. So I think the moral issues have not gone anywhere. And the fact that the public hasn't said much in the last 10 years just means the public has maybe been thinking about other things. But I can guarantee you that from my part of the country, if people were thinking about this a lot more, they would be very concerned. Thank you. Well, I can speak to your first point, and maybe some of the animal experts can speak to the second point. And I don't know that any of us disagrees with the third point and that public opinion is volatile and can change quickly. On the first point, at least with respect to the National Academy guidelines, and I was not part of that National Academy committee, so I'm not praising myself in saying this, I think they did a good job with the human informed consent as well. They required consent from the humans who provided the embryos or the eggs or the sperm. Uh, and in a, I think it was in the 2010 amendments, but it might have been in the 2008 amendments, they extended that to tissue donors for IPSCs once the IPSCs uh, became an issue. So those guidelines, which our SCRO and other SCROs, I think, around the country enforce, do speak directly to informed consent for, those, for the people who donated the, the embryos, the gametes, or the other tissues that get used in this so that they know what it's being used for. That was an issue that was broadly discussed in 2005. Um, the the uh, suffering, I think it sounds more like uh, metamorphosis in Kafka and K, who turns into a cockroach, than it does Island of Dr. Moreau, but uh, do any of the animal experts want to talk about that? I, I think I, I may have not emphasized enough the importance of humane endpoints that has been in place for many years in the review by IACUCs. So that's the question that every IACUC faces when it looks at invasive research, whether it's uh, mental health research or uh, surgical research or whatever. What, are you, what is the investigator doing to minimize pain and distress? And the second word is distress. It's not just pain. So it's, it's already there. We have a, I think we have a robust framework that has been in place and I think it's, it's having the investigator informing the IACUC of what are potential outcomes. And whenever there is a question of unknown outcomes, having that diligent observation and diligent in interaction between the animal care staff and the investigator. Okay. And, and I would take that even a step further. We have 21 animal care and use committees here at the intramural program at NIH. And it's not just what's on paper. I mean, that's part of why we have post-approval monitoring. Um, and that involves the daily uh, interface of the animal care staff, the daily interface of the investigative staff with these animals. It's not that we put something on paper 
And we expect, we, we hope that, that's our best guess, scientific, very knowledgeable guess at what we expect to see when those experiments started, but that's not where it stops. It's a very interactive process once that protocol gets started. And we very much rely on that because we know this is science. We can't exactly predict what's going to happen with these animals, but we have a very robust framework, as Dr. Brown said, in place and that's where all the pieces really come together as far as the animal care staff, the veterinary staff, the investigators, everyone involved in this to make sure that what's on paper really is what gets translated. And in those cases where it's unexpected, that we recognize that early and then we take steps to make changes to the protocol, to the paperwork part of it, but also that it can inform the science and further inform the endpoints that we put in place going forward. To go back to North Carolina for just a minute, I do think between the NIH funding uh, system, between the IACUX, between the SCROs, um, we don't, ALAC, we don't just approve research because George or Janet or Hero is really interested in an obscure and unimportant issue and they want to kill a lot of animals or make a lot of chimeras to do it. We approve research because it's, we think it has a decent opportunity to relieve human suffering. And I suspect, well, I know that people all over the country care a lot about human suffering. There is a balance, but in order to, to put the possible, you know, weird pictures of pigs, pig-human chimeras into context, we always need to be ready to remind people that the reason for this and the reason that has been that it's gotten through a variety of approval steps is that it's a step toward no guarantees but a step taken in hope of relieving human suffering and maybe even non-human animal suffering as well in the long run. Other comments from the uh, room? George. Can I speak to the issue of the informed consent because uh, there is um, there's an imperative as the science has progressed and is going to be called out with the revision of the common rule to provide more detail, uh, more disclosure, so that individuals who are giving their consent are, are, are meaningfully informed. Um, and it is a part of the revision to the consent documents that um, we would ask donors of, of biomaterials to give explicit consent, recognizing that cells or cell lines um, it might be used in research involving genetic manipulation of the cells and the generation of human animal chimeras, and it goes on to actually specify that. So that will be that will be uh, uh, included. And one of the ways, at least the ISSCR guidelines were most influential the last time around, is that we actually provided template consent documents and invited users to adapt them for their own uh, their own use. And I recently. Uh, was establishing a collaboration with the Chinese laboratory, and we received the consent document in Chinese, and I gave it to one of my postdocs to, um, to to translate, and it came back to me as almost a verbatim translation of the original ISSCR template, which was very reassuring. So as part of the updates, we will once again revise and update those template consent documents, and, and we hope that it will be quite influential in this regard. And by emphasis, by talking about the National Academy guidelines, I didn't mean to understate the importance of the ISSCR guidelines or the British guidelines, and I'm looking forward to seeing your guidelines actually published. And, and in fact, ISSCR in the UK become even more important given that the National Academies Committee that created those guidelines no longer exists. Other comments? Janet? I just think um, that we've heard very good uh, reports and a very strong regulatory environment and guidelines and oversight, and I do believe that that is really in the case. Um, but it is also true, as was said, that the public can change its mind very quickly and does have misperceptions. We're all very aware, as we work in the stem cell field, of how easy it is for the public to get misconceptions. If you go back to embryonic stem cells and the idea you know, that we are 
uh, taking babies and making stem cells, it's still there. And so I do think uh, that we as uh, stem cell scientists, as members of this community, we also have to do, take as a very strong uh, responsibility the continued education and outreach to the public in this area. And uh, when new experiments come down the pipe and we're seeing new chimeras and new, new things coming <coughs> forward, it's really, really important that we develop mechanisms to engage with the public and uh, to really educate them on what is possible and what is not. Because certainly today, we've heard from the science that we are certainly not at the stage of making any of those weird chimeras you saw online. But how do we make sure that the public understands that we are moving forward slowly, that we have strong uh, um, uh, goals in place that, we have, you know, that will help human suffering and that we have a strong regulatory environment. But, you know, unfortunately, if we say we've got IACUX and ALAC and we've got all these acronyms, they go, oh, what the hell is that? So I think we have to make it clear that those are not just uh, bureau bureaucracies. They are really active and engaged partners and that they, those uh, bodies also have to play a part in this education of the public. Like everything, it's not easy. If you, you ed Education of the public is important. On the other hand, we can't go too far on the other side and overhype things because I think the hyperbolome is the largest of all the known ohms, and we don't want to go there. Um, I lived through the 2004 election campaign for Prop uh, 71 in California, and although I think the scientists were careful, there were a lot of people on both sides who weren't so careful about either what um, non-embryonic stem cells could cure, which was everything, or in some cases not coming from the scientists, how soon embryonic stem cells would cure everything and put California back in a budget surplus and cure our drought, which didn't even exist then. <laughs> More questions, comments? I just yes. I, I just, oh, can yeah. I just yeah. add one, one point? Um, I just think it's important to look at public engagement as something that involves uh, reciprocal communications. I think it's not merely about scientists educating the public. I think it's important to recognize that some of the concerns that certain members of publics have represent legitimate and sometimes often sort of thought out set of, you know, moral concerns. And I think it's, uh, you know, not merely about scientists explaining the limits of the science and where the checks and balances are, but also getting a clear read on what those legitimate public views are and uh, regulating uh, scientific conduct in accordance with those uh, very legitimate uh, sets of concerns. I think I'd like to reiterate that and um, we very much talk about dialogue now where it's very much a discussion as opposed to just us talking to or speaking out to the public and very much then at least identifying where there are points of conversion and where there are points of um, misunderstanding or disagreement. Yes. Yeah, I, I, during the break, uh, I talked with uh, Jonathan. It's about uh, the Chinese guideline because it just uh, published uh, in October. So Chinese Society of Stem Cell Research uh, recently organized the people make the translation and we'll try to make the link with ICR and hope every people can understand what's happening in China. And science is, um, of course, it's, uh, the guideline is not uh, well established, such as it's uh, still empty, try to limit it, how to use uh, human pluripotent stem cell in animal, such how to create uh, cameras and how to use it. but. Uh, that's why it's, uh, we really need the feedback from such kind of workshop. We, we hope we can up, update in next version of the guideline how to use it and how to protect not only for human and also for the animals. And uh, the science moved really fast, maybe faster than ICQ problem. So we also need to think about all the new challenging such as when we create so many 
different uh, cameras between human and animal. And even in the future, if it's possible, we can also guide the animal already contained, no, no matter human tissue or human organ, how to, how to deal with. We can kill the animal to take the organ for transplantation, or we have to keep, keep it. So all these new challenges we think we have to face, and we have to get some, we can't call it a conclusion, but we have to get some suggestion which project we should support, mm. and which one should be, at, at present should be limited. And if for the new animal with human <coughs> tissue or organ inside, how to deal with it? They are mixture, they are animal, they are human, what's that? How to define and how to use the future, the sample. Mm -hmm. So it's still open for discussion, but uh, I, I believe China is really want to involve in such dialogue, and uh, it's really appreciate for NIH to organize such workshop. Yeah. Great. You know, one thing that, that I think might spill over on the chimera issue is CRISPR. Uh, particularly the non-human uses of CRISPR, which are not getting nearly as much attention as the human germline uses of CRISPR, but I actually think are going to prove to be much more imminent and important. And when people start using CRISPR to do odd things to animals, uh, you can already, in all states except California, buy glowfish, little tropical fish that have GFP and other things in glow in, in, in black light. I don't have, have any problems with glowfish but people are doing odd things, and to the extent that odd animals appear as a result of CRISPR, even though it's not a chimera, there may be some blowback uh, onto the chimera space. So it's something to keep, your, keep our eyes open for. Other comments or questions? George. Well, my, you know, my last question at the end of my talk this morning was, uh, do the existing review and oversight structures suffice? Um, you know, I, it feels after your session, um, hearing the sort of rigor of the um, IACUC and ALAC reviews, and having gone through right now, I have to say we're in the midst of our three-year reviews for our five animal protocols, it is very rigorous. But the reviews are really only as good as the information that goes into them. <coughs> um, it certainly felt today like the meeting really served that purpose. It really did update us on the science. And, and I do hope that this will allow the NIH to, um, to, to revise their restrictions and, uh, and reassert the, uh, the assurances that come through the existing review processes, which seem to me to be quite, quite robust but can always be improved, which is why Isker is doing a second edition, right? Other comments? I think our panel's done, and ahead of time. <laughs> All right, so I'll ask the panelists to return to their seats, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Wallenitz to wrap up the day and talk about some next steps. So I think I can do that in the interest of time while the panelists are returning to their seats. Um, I, first, I really want to thank everyone in the room for taking the time to participate today. Um, your engagement in this discussion is absolutely critical as we move forward, and uh, we really appreciate it. I also want to extend a thanks to the uh, nameless hundreds who are out there watching our video cast today. Um, uh, we appreciate you tuning in as well. Um, I, you know, to cut to the chase, a, a sort of building off of uh, George's comment of, of what happens next, um, because I think that's what everyone is very interested in. Um, you know, our plan is really to take today's discussion and uh, use it to consider whether or not the funding pause that we have now, and I think it's important to acknowledge that um, the topics discussed in the workshop today went beyond the scope of, of the funding pause, um, which is, is narrow. Uh, but, but we're going to take today's discussion, now that we've got a better feel um, for where the science is, I can certainly say that I personally have learned a, a great deal today, 
Um, and, and look at the question that was just posed. Is our existing framework that we have in place sufficient? Um, or does it need improvements? Do we need revisions? Do we need new policies, new guidance, so that we can move forward and responsibly support this area of research. Again, the, the intent really is to move forward. Um, and, and any of these options that we consider, whether it's a um, reinstatement of our, our existing framework or um, potentially new policy options, uh, I would envision that we would come back to you for your feedback on this through, through public notice. So we're not going to have this conversation with ourselves um, and then make a decision and, and uh, uh, shut the box on that. We are going to um, seek your opinions going forward. Um, I think that, um, uh, to reiterate a, a point I made earlier, um, I think that proactive approaches to policy development, such as we saw today, um, where we're really building on the science, um, where it is in contrast to a lot of the ways that we um, ends up making policy are very reactive. Um, there is a breakthrough, there's a headline, um, there is, um, uh, some impetus to really say, you know, we need we need a policy, we need we need a stop, and we need it now. Um, uh, I, I happen to think that what we saw today was actually a better path forward, where we brought the people who know the science best into the room um, to talk about it, and then we're going to move forward based on on um, that discussion, uh, so that we can provide a prudent path going forward. Uh, that facilitates this research, that supports this research, um, uh, rather than impedes it through through further delay. Um, so stay tuned. Um, thanks again for sharing your time and expertise, and um, uh, I'm sure that uh, in the next iteration of this, uh, we will be talking again. Um, so uh, thanks, and with that, we're going to draw this workshop to a close um, a little bit early, uh, which I'm, I'm sure, I know people are hopping into taxis and taking flights, so I'm sure that's something we all appreciate, um, and uh, we look forward to uh, the next stage of the discussion.